had from reading this is how much this is kind of a, um, at least so far, a series uh, about writing. Yeah, it's it's the perfect like showcase for a writer. And and he's talked about all that stuff, like putting out little seeds here and there, not 100% sure how they were going to develop, but figuring that they developed and just finding a way that he can tell the widest range of stories. If it was just about some like, you know, Avenger kind of character who fights crime, he'd, he'd hit a wall pretty quick. But if he makes it, it's about dreams. It's about stories. It's about, you know, the history of stories. He can go anywhere he wants. There's one sort of storytelling thing that this page fucks up because we have the retrospect of the, the story that's being told. Right. And then you have captions and it's the voice of the, the village elder talking that smack. And then when it cuts to our guys who are actually talking, these are captions when they should be dialogues, word balloons. Uh-huh. Word balloons. That's interesting. Do you put that on Todd Klein? I, you know, I was I was wondering, man, like like uh, who 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 would be because I mean I th- I think it's clear, you know, you yeah, see all these think pieces. Be, yeah, an, an artistic choice, but actually like an oversight. I'm glad right. that you mm-hmm. pointed out that framing device because it is not something I noticed in the first yeah. my, my read through, sure. and it really, uh, it, I mean, it's very consistent and. and I think flattering. I also like these kind of flourishes. Like where can you within six panel layout, you know, pretty straightforward layout, different storytelling than I'm used to with say image comics or the the guys that would form image here around 1990. What do you do? You know, like you got to, you got to find other ways to make these pages interesting and these panels interesting. And I I think architecture is one of those that we see. That, that one reminds me of like a Barry Windsor Smith. There's a few, there, there are a couple of panels in here that reminded me of Barry Windsor Smith and, I don't know. Visually, I think there's a little bit of overlap with some of the Conian mm-hmm. stuff. Maybe it's because it's yeah. it's an ancient setting. This is like a sort of continuation of what we saw in that battle that yeah. Sandman had with that demon, where they're playing the game of story, where it's like, "I'll become this." Well, then I'll become this. They put know? they put that in the uh, in the series, yeah. the Netflix series, the, the the battle, and it's really cool how they illustrate it because they almost take the form of the animal, and you know, it's not just like playing the dozens; like they take the form and they could hit each other, and you see them physically you know, getting a, having tools taken upon themselves as, uh, as the game is played. And, and there, there are some more stakes. What's cool about the Netflix show is that it really is a second opportunity for Neil Gaiman to, to revisit the material and create a, something a little more concise, knowing that, knowing what's out there, then you could start to make other kinds of connections and tighten things up a bit, you know, like, and it's also way more clear to the viewer, you know, like there is a part of it where I wonder, it's like you're giving a lot of grace to your reader to keep up. And of course, on television, they don't do that yeah, in TV right. very much. I love this line. Whenever they actually consummate their love that night, every living thing that could dream dreamt of love. Mm-hmm. I like that. And you see it re- recurring in some ways, yeah. you know, because we're going to see a vortex later in the story where the dreams are now interacting with each other. And you have those moments where something huge happens in the dreaming and it does affect everybody that's, yeah. that's I guess, asleep at that time period. Cool ideas. Yeah. I mean, it does play like that. We're all connected plays out directly into the plot of this whole arc. Yeah. And her city is, uh, is destroyed, which is what the glass artifacts yeah. are. This sort of like Emerald city shard. Almost a biblical kind of story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a fall from grace. Or Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, mm-hmm. like the whole civilization yeah. being wiped out. She's dead, and the art style changes mm-hmm. with yeah. with these sequences. It's, I believe, uh, there's some, some ink wash that yeah. then gets photostatted into black and white line, uh, which is how you achieve... It would be interesting to see the original, because, yeah. you know, it's getting kind of... There's a lot of that throughout this comic, where there are, like like the vortex is in pure color and then there are pasted up panels on top. Yeah. There's a couple of things I was, I was staring at going like, what are we looking at here? Like I, I thought it might've been like a bucket of paint. <laughs> yeah. Up yeah. Because it's just such an unusual effect. I love it because you think it's pre-digital. Like they're trying yeah. to work out these effects, you know, on, on, in real materials. And then even like Klein's lettering, it's gotta be pasted up. I assume you can or, see or it. a black line yeah, or something like on a, top. Yeah. You could see a little halo around the sometimes, man. And, and that would probably be, he he does it in black and then inverts it on photocopier or something like that. I think that was a fun you could yeah. do you could do that on a photocopier. It's been a while. Yeah. Xeroxography. <laughs> yeah. And then uh paste it up onto the artwork. And and back in those days it was real cool because that black is just black, so it shouldn't slip. Uh and the white text should stay white. 
you know, no, no magenta or cyan going underneath the, the letters to fuck it up. The two artists are, um, they're, they're usually credited as like co-artists as opposed to uh, ink or penciler. And I think that's because you do have some back and forth as to who's mm-hmm. doing what, you know, when you get into these washes and some of these effects. And I, I feel like both artists maybe are just like going for various things, trying things, you know, yeah. some experimental qualities. Yeah, for sure. We should we should breeze through this and, ju- and just yeah, say sure. that, you know, this is this is the origin of this is how Nala or Nada gets gets uh, put in hell. And we see that desire is already sowing seeds to try to try yeah. to trip up a brother right. or, or their brother. And then the next chapter. Here's desire. So yeah. we sort of saw the effects of desire. And now we we get introduced to the actual character. Yeah, it's it's this story where you realize like Gaiman is a far hipper kind of kind of city dweller than, than like your average comics writer because he introduced so many concepts to me. Like I was a kid reading this stuff, man, and the idea of gender fluidity is in here. Uh, there's there are gay characters. Like you just didn't see this kind of stuff. Can we just go back real quick, man? Because there are moments when we get into Peter Nagel uh, kind of artwork, like you know that 1980s prints pr- prints yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, the cool thing about the desire character is there are panels where you might get like a more masculine chin and then you know the next panel could be way more feminine with you know like a a a power suit on and the 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 sort of house that desire dwells in that's you know based on desire uh i'm I'm thinking like annie lennox is the reference there yeah yeah, a lot of range. Like you think of this character from even page to page, and uh, uh, Gaiman was like a music critic, you know, prior to this. So he's got a bunch of music references in there, and this sort of like era of like yeah, like Bowie and the Eurythmics and stuff is pretty fresh. He creates his mythology, right? Like here, here are the various sigils yeah. of the various endless. And there's a missing one. The the uh, what did they call him? The destruction. Yeah, but he had like a the, the pariah or the, the absent one or something. the the uh, exile they, they had some name for it. more of your visual uh experimentation too like a photo collage yeah it took a while before because i'm reading some of this in real time sure you know when i was a kid and it's like it took a while like who is that that missing one who it, is he you know? it's 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 cool in the show also because you don't like you see death like once uh maybe two times in in various episodes and you still haven't seen we haven't seen delirium uh-huh uh, you you only get like a quick glimpse at despair. I don't think destiny, destiny showed up. Introduction of Rose. One yes. of the prominent characters here is she's flying to England with her mother to uh, meet her grandmother. Yes, that American barbarian here. Yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> is that is that the, uh, the uh, influence? Yes. Paste up. I mean, not paste up, but uh, certain yeah, light some box. Photograph. Yeah, some some light box looks great. And then you flip it. You flip it. You know what I mean. So that, uh, oh man, <laughs> you can use That's the same such a photo, Wally Woodian yes. kind of thing, right? Flip it, re ink it, and uh, now you got a new drawing. You got a monthly book to make, and sure. and these guys, Neil Gaiman said Mike Dringenberg could have just been the Sandman artist, he just could not make those deadlines. And we, and we have these various issues that have, uh, uh, you know, guest artists playing with form a little yeah, bit. Yeah, layout forces you to turn it sideways, and now you're in the dream world. Exactly, a right. Cockeyed. And it's another. This is a. This is another Alan Moore stroke that I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, we saw last saw this whenever Abby uh, Arcane eats that little tuber off of uh, Sandman, uh, yeah, sure. uh, the back of Swamp, Swamp Thing, and then she starts to have her psychedelic trip, and it eases you yeah. into it just this way. It's when you read this stuff that you you uh realize how silly the um mcfarlane rob liefeld x-men spider-man thing was because like this is <laughs> these guys are easing you into turning the page turn like turning the book and you might not not even completely be conscious that you're doing it mm-hmm. you know like you just end up with the book like this and uh those guys are like you know we want it this way because it's different and it looks cool all yeah. different concerns let me tell you that is not the the first time you realize those those books are silly <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, not the only, uh, not so the only we're still, silly trigger. We're still sideways. We're going to be sideways until we're, you know, jarred out of our dream state. This is some big universe building too, yeah. as we have. Uh, is it Kane or Abel? Is is accounting for that's the a, endless? That's Lucian. Lucian. The the. Uh... It, it, it is tough because he does does have the haircut. Of, right. Of, uh, 
but, but doing an accounting of the endless and, and basically, you know, not rebuilding, but establishing or showing us a little bit of Sandman's world. It's a census. And, and, and these are the dreams that are accounted for 11,000. But guess what? There's four that are missing. And kind of like Preludes and Nocturnes where, where uh, Morpheus had to go on a quest for, you know, three objects. Uh, you are now in a book where he is on a quest to ca- recapture four nightmares. Yeah. Or, dr- or dreams, we'll Cause, say. Because he's still not in his full power yet. Yeah. You know, he's still building up. you got to have, like, a place to go. He eventually gets in his full power and then kind of goes in the background a little bit. Love these giant uh, background elements. And here's your... Brute and Glob. Yeah, and the Kirby characters. They're Kirby. Right? I mean, I learned about them here yeah. first. And then when I found out they were Kirby's and seeing how, like goofy and cheerful and huge smile the kirby version is it's pretty great on the tv show they're the biggest change uh it's a single it's a single entity and the uh sort of um arc of the entity who takes the place of brute and glob is it's it's one of the it's really beautiful uh it's it's a character that um is a nightmare was created to be a nightmare but she when Morpheus wasn't looking, pushed against that yeah. and found that little boy, J- Jed, Jed yeah. uh, found that little boy and like gave him some comfort through dreams. Like, like she's a nightmare. She's supposed to be a nightmare. But when she saw this kid in such dire conditions, she wanted to inspire. Mm-hmm. And then she gets rebuilt as a, uh, as a dream. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a really sweet arc on, on the, on the show. And this is our, this is the layout of what we're going to cover in Doll's House. Yes. The, yeah. the four missing arcana, um, you mentioned the first two, then it's the Corinthian and Fiddler's Green. Fiddler's Green. Yeah. So those are going to be the, the kind of the story that's covered here. Yeah. Yeah. And he gives a little personality to each where it's like, okay, these guys are goofs like the Corinthian. Oh, that could be bad for humanity. Yeah. And then Fiddler's Green. Hey, how, why would he betray me? He's always been, you know, like on the up and up. Uh, when you create a character like this in issue nine of a comic and you have a visual like that, if you had it to do over again, I bet you would introduce that fucker in issue one. Yeah, and that's sure. what they do on a TV show. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a that's a arc for, for the whole season is like we gotta recapture the Corinthian. It's the reason why Morpheus leaves his realm to try and, and, and allows himself to be weakened enough to get captured in like issue one that's like the rethinking and i think it's a very smart approach because that is just too cool a visual to just introduce it's like you know this is like dick tracy comics where you introduce such a cool thing and just kill him off uh, you know a couple months later uh if you had it to do over again put that guy in asap and as a fan of lettering here it is rose wake up honey we've arrived and it's back it only works reading it in this order, right? Yeah. And, it's, and, it's so cool yeah. how the mechanics right. of that page work. It's it's um, like jarring you awake too, because this is kind of supposed to be a drunk where like, wait, is this guy talking to me, the reader? You know? Yeah, I think that works really well. It's pretty pretty interesting, pretty bold too. You know, yeah. we've seen that master class where Gaiman's like blocking stuff out on pages and yeah. stuff, and you can almost see him working out some of those mechanics. It'd be hard to do it if you weren't kind of like looking at a page and thinking in those terms. Unity Kincaid is the one who brought brought the ladies, man, uh, Rose Walker and her mom. And we, we saw Unity Kincaid. She was one of the people who succumbed to the sl- sleeping sickness in issue yeah. one. And uh, like slept through the 20th yeah. century. We, we saw her whole arc uh, where, you know, she, she got raped in her slumber and was pregnant and woke up having maternal feelings and not knowing why. Uh, so then Gaiman is fleshing that out. Like what happens with those kids and 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 the daughter got you know adopted off sent to sent to america wait this isn't kid killer kincaid's mom (laughs) that's so funny because there are those panels right like where it's like eternal waking and it's a bound up chained character we made mention of that in like our our title uh our title piece here the actual doll's house yeah yeah and and there's a couple different doll's houses in this like the uh the dome that the sandman that uh, brute and glob and the sandman live in is kind of like its own doll house too and Rose Walker's the vortex. We're going to see that when she steps into this uh, broom closet here. I, I like the way this panel works, how it does. It kind of like moves you like into here in a really interesting way. And that moment of quiet, like yeah, how long exactly. is she standing there? Yeah, it's a nice motif to go from wallpaper to almost the background of your page yeah. is, is that wallpaper motif that looks really good and carries on with your dollhouse idea. Um I see shades of Watchmen, you know, the, like Sally Jupiter visiting her mom and her mom in, the, yeah. in that uh, like a retired home kind of, you know, this is her room. Uh, some, some parallels there. And 
maybe complete coincidence, but you mentioned Alan Moore in the beginning, so I can't yeah. uh, can't not not see that. Every time I see the three fates, I have to I think of Toth, man, because yeah. in the old DC comics where yeah. those characters show up, it's always Toth drawn uh, these characters, and he of course like he does that blonde chick looks just like a Bruce Timish. Mm -hmm. kind of, you know bruce tim took took, yeah. took a lot from that and uh these characters were established early on uh no gaiman was able to ask i mean no game salmon was able i say that because uh -huh. morphe that guy yeah, that's morpheus in that movie is like yeah he cast a young no gaiman in that role uh you know where's my pouch where's my helmet you could ask one question of each and she wastes her three questions so yeah. quick yeah because you don't know the rules man yeah which is a kind of cool element that like you're that's off he, the map now. That's Hero's, Hero's journey. journey. Yeah, I love this part too of just finding ways to do interesting page layouts and to keep the visuals popping in a totally different vernacular than again that Marvel, you know, Jim Shooter's gone now. Let's go wild. Mm -hmm. Totally different language, but it's still the same challenge of like how do you keep these pages interesting, especially with a good bit of exposition. Yeah. And it was all in a broom closet. Even the broom closet is an interesting panel. And then is, is this death? Is, I thought that was desire making a little um, cameo. You know, it's sort of like the hidden villain of, of this. I mean, that story. hair, like yeah. that, that ain't any Lennox hair. That's, right. that's that's death hair. I don't think yeah. I ever really paid too much attention yeah. to that. But it's and, and this lady does die at the end. Right. So yeah, is so that she's foretelling? Around. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that I totally missed that on my read. I, I read this a million times <laughs> and I just noticed that. Funny how that works. Yeah. But it's you know that's the argument for rereading this stuff and how they have value and greater than there's your there's your close up too to kind of yeah I mean it looks like uh, more dream yeah. yeah maybe it was him the whole time I don't know well, it would have made sense for that to be death yeah but uh, another motif of this series is they get mistaken for each other you know it starts with right death you know dream being mistaken for death I think it's real interesting how they actually draw some of these characters too like trying to make these be I don't want to say realistic but yeah. I do think they're all posed out. Personal, you know, personal qualities and stuff. I think is something you didn't see in a lot of comics. Again, miles from what you're seeing in a Marvel comic at this at this era. And Probably then, in DC. How's this that. for a cliffhanger? Like last page of a of a comic. Yeah, I was reading these in the in, in the essentials, so individual issues, and I would read this and be like, "Oh yeah, man, I can't wait for the next issue." And it's like, wait a minute, where where are we? I want to see this guy with the knife. <laughs> and I would I would say that that first person sequence is another uh, Alan Moore nod. Yeah. Uh, to Swamp Thing because there's a character called the Boogeyman who does get referenced in the serial convention. Yes. Uh, but we saw the Boogeyman gets killed in, in the sand, in the Swamp Thing comics. I'm going to be screwing that up the entire time. Just, sure. just bear with me. Uh, but another, you know, that first person sequence thing, that's that's another, you know, Alan Moore piece. Also good use of color once again. You know, this is through that first person, through the, the, uh, the actual sunglasses. You get the blue. All right. So, so if, as an artist, if you're if you're tasked with like, okay, doll's house, you're gonna have to see this house in a bunch of different angles and stuff. You go, you go to Squirrel Hill, and you go to you know like that area, and you find a cool house, and you find somebody who's rad who will let you take a couple of snaps around around the side because that from this distance right here feels like a photo, like a photo, yeah, like that's that's traced yeah. off. I did not think about that Ed until you said it. But yes, this is such a big character, this house, that yeah. you do need to find the model of it because whatever's in that house is going to be more interesting than what you come up with yeah. sure, on yeah. the fly. Uh, you know, anybody that's been in one of these old 100-year-old yeah. houses, 120-year-old houses, like you, you know what I'm talking about. And that's that's a great use of reference. Yeah. It, it can suggest story. You know, you can get story ideas from looking at it. I think of uh, like uh, Tenenbaums, the Wes Anderson yeah. movie, mm -hmm. and how much that house is a character. And that, yeah. and, and I think it's on the DVD extras, they talk about that, you know, like yeah. like the, the work to find a house like that and then to yeah. do some stuff to make it what they wanted it to be. And of course, now we're going to be introduced to all the borders in yeah. this house. The cast of characters. Where yeah. Rose Ken is staying. Ken and Barbie. And Rose is here to track down her, her brother. Yes. Yeah, Jed. Yeah, Ken, Ken and Barbie. Uh, it's the so, Shining Twins grown up. Yeah, it's so uh -huh. great because of like the datedness, right? Because like, you know, the the TV show of modern day. So like, the guy has a man bun, and and <laughs> and Barbie is basically basically the same. So like back in those days, your modern day man bun guy was just you know Gordon Gecko, yeah, like young yuppie, yeah. young yuppie douchebags. I mean, that that is like a spot on drawing of like the Ken doll, like yeah. of that of that era. The Barbie a little different. The Barbie looks more like Vanna White. Who, who did become a Barbie doll? So. Yeah, that would be that would be right. Late yeah. late eighties, early nineties. Dan a white. Yeah, got, got your <laughs> shining twin. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome. Funny. How yeah. our uh, homeowner, who is kind of the MC of this this sequence, coming through, introducing her to all the other house uh, her housemates. 
And, and another nod to uh, Alan Moore is that the Raven Matthew is is Matthew Cable, the the, yeah, the, I, the the dead Matthew Cable. I didn't know that until I heard Neil Gaiman say that on his Mark Maron interview. Yeah, I, I, I never caught that. He said people have caught on to that, but yeah, somehow that escaped me. Yeah, I had no idea. That's really interesting. Yeah. and it's interesting reading this with that in mind because he's like. Oh yeah, I kind of you know fucked up towards the end of my life. Yeah, yeah. You know. I think he talks about drunken driving, mm-hmm. uh, like all the all the pieces yeah. from from that specific. You know, I mentioned like building that that kind of endless universe, and that's a big piece if you could connect that to Swamp Thing. Now yeah. you've really expanded your mythology to uh, well, yes, a so lot much more history thing. there. Yeah, the Cain and Abel stuff. Uh, obviously, it's the old horror host, but uh, you know, Moore had that in Swamp Thing. He had those guys, that same setup of them like living in this little house and stuff. So yeah, now we're in. Uh, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland. And again, I read this before I knew about Little Nemo in Slumberland. Probably learned about it shortly after this, but it's like, this is cool. I get that they're referencing some kind of old thing. And then the last panel is like the return to reality, you know, falling out of the bed, except he's waking up in, in his own shit. Yeah. Yeah. And talk about a great, like, if, if Nemo were to continue on, like, we uh-huh. don't see a lot of Nemo awake in the yeah. original strips. And to go from this kind of cheery, more or less dreamland into this daytime i i love setting. i love oh. that todd klein is such a good letterer that he could not allow himself <laughs> to not <laughs> use the, the aims guide uh-huh. and stuff like he just could not do it it's, it's like it's like if we were trying to drive a car in in the uk or something like like it's hard to go over those double yellow lines man uh and drive on the other side of the road he you would be what? required to do that here it's, it's surprising that he doesn't do it yeah because i mean obviously like Todd Klein, master letter, historically. Here's here's what he does give you. On some of that, you have some, like, hand-lettered balloons. And it might, maybe if it's not here, like, it'll be in, like, a later one where you see a little bit more wobbly balloons, but he can't even allow himself to yeah. do that that much. The numbers are a big piece. You know, that's, totally. that's a big chunk of uh, Nemo. Yeah, now this, like, sort of sad situation that Jed is in, it's not too far from the Simon and Kirby original. Like, it was a very Dickensian story, and it was, like, this kid Jed, he's living with relatives who don't want him after his grandfather died, and they just treat him like garbage through the holes. It's a really depressing series, you know. And he becomes the Sandman, um, like Billy Batson. He's, or something? he's friends with the Sandman. He I blows see. a whistle, and then the Sandman shows up. It like, you know, Gaiman very smartly. It's like, okay, what comics were called the Sandman before my comic? Finds this one and kind of just gives the narrative a slight twist, brings it into the eighties a little bit, and like here we. That are. might be a fun thing to. Uh add as an addendum to this reading at some point sure because i mean it's like issues. five issues or so. five issues i think kirby worked on like the first one and then like the last couple of them and but there's a couple yeah. like that kirby's not involved in but it was like they were they were like okay new gods bombed this bombed that bombed maybe if we team up simon and kirby yeah. at dc we'll have a hit you know and that was the idea there how dated is this piece right here <laughs> Shit clacking away at, at a goddamn typewriter. I don't know. It's you know, kind of like a hip thing to do is get get, get a typewriter <laughs> out. And, you know. It's not hard to imagine this though as an email or something. You know, yeah. in, in today's a world, blog. But it does give us one more visual in terms of another voice and represent that voice through your yeah. your lettering. Use all those parts that are available to you. How about that for a uh, like your classic yeah. sound effect lettering? I mean, especially to this especially comic. for a writer, this is like the medium he works in is at this time. It's yeah. probably like a typewriter kind of thing. You know. <laughs> how just popping in in his work attire uh railing on somebody at the at the, at the office and it just bounces yeah that just comes in describes this place as the adams family <laughs> it's such a uh, comic book-esque setting yeah she's the, uh, nearly collection of Mar- marilyn munster but then you realize she's the weirdest of them all and there's the picture of jed and his grandfather yeah, and this is this is what we know about Jed or yeah. what she knows about Jed up to this point, like where they lose track of him uh, with the grandfather's death. And your boy Matthew, or yeah. your crow Matthew. Yeah, uh, voiced in the show by Ratatouille, Remy the Rat. Uh, Pat Oswald. Pat Oswald, yeah. Yep. Boy, I bet he loves that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's creating a new nightmare. Yes, I mean, he's got work to do, you know? Yeah, he is very, um, he's got a work ethic, you know. Get the idea of the vortex, you know, like like yeah. they're describing the vortex and, you know, that's going to be something he's got to deal with. Yes, uh, and he's letting the vortex live for a little bit because it's his thesis that the vortex is going to drag those errant dreams that are running around, like, to her 
in some form so that it will just make them easier to capture. When a comic book character goes down the dark alley, you know something's coming on. Yeah. It's hilarious to see that because I always laugh at superheroes where it's like, oh, we're going to go fight crime. Let's go hang out on a building top and stare at these alleys because yeah. something like this is going to happen. So you get to see the Sandman treatment of that. It's like a very standard superhero setup. Yeah. You know? Happens twice per issue of Batman. And then look at the superhero that comes to her rescue. It's kind of like like a, like a twee uh, 90s goth superhero, this uh Fiddler's Green. I, I always think of Wimbledon Green. Yeah, like this guy. <laughs> they yeah. could be the same yeah. character. Exactly. Yeah. This is I just found a new collection of comics. Uh, <laughs> down this alley. <laughs> just uh, yeah, Grover Cleveland. Uh, comes yeah, like, and, of, and of course in the wow, in the, that's that's pretty <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, like who is because it's it's yeah like Grover Cleveland. It's um, Mark Twain. It's Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, like some kind of like molding of all of those. And of course, uh, in in the modern day, and it is Netflix. You can't. You can't have the dude just just uh, take care of the bad guys. The chick is very capable, takes a dude out with a bottle or two. Fiddler's Green shows up, dismantles one or two others, and then walks her home. Well, she is half endless, you know, so she's got her sort of, you know, like half god, like uh, Hercules kind of thing going on. Yeah, and she's looking pretty good there. She's, she's yeah. not... Uh... Not not going quietly before yeah. he shows up. She's got the gift. She would she would get recruited into the X Men. And now we we see our Sandman, our other yeah. Sandman, entering into this little Nemo esque world. Yeah, the what, most recent Sandman. What a tall, what a tall ask, man, to to do the art on a series like this where you have all this visual stimuli that needs to be yeah. communicated. So like you can only get the 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 bare basics when you have twenty something pages. So like. Like, you know, Windsor McKay would not allow this right. would be the most ornate marble structure. Yeah. Uh, but you've seen that by Windsor McKay for sure in a Sandman. I mean, yeah, in a uh, Little Nemo comic. Yeah, this is another one to me where Gaiman's storytelling is really shining. Like, if you're an editor, if you're reading this as it's coming out, and this is like issue, I think, 10 or 11 now. Like, you've got to be blown away reading this in real time because, like, it's such a nightmare, you know, just having yeah. the little Nemo gimmick to end on the waking up yeah. and just one nightmarish wake up panel yeah. after another. They keep getting worse. That, to me, is the twist of these little Nemo strips is this payoff yeah. panel. And yeah. it's like, that's just horrendous. I, I don't know if we talked about this before, but, like, there's that letter that Neil Gaiman wrote to DC saying, look, I know we made this kind of deal, but we're, like, maybe 10 issues in or whatever. And he's like... This thing turned out more special than either of us assumed. Let's renegotiate the deal. I don't know if you've seen that's been circulating lately, and I wonder which issue it ties to. Like if it's around this time or whatever, where it's like, okay, we're we got something special here. And and I'll he even said he was going to leave the series if they didn't. You know, it does feel like he's channeling stuff in a way that some writing is very logical. You know, mm -hmm. you can kind of see, all right, these are the pieces, and you know, it kind of makes sense how they're bouncing off of each other. This feels like some inspirations are, are yeah. entering from issue to issue and story to story that are just coming from very tangential like a, a, a left step into this mm -hmm. um you know from out of left field so to speak he, he said it took it took him about six weeks per issue to, to to write these things and kind of unlike alan moore who was um you know doing swamp thing while he was doing miracle man while he was doing Watchmen, neil gaiman was taking like little powders man he was doing that little bit of mcfarland shit to like make some paychecks and things but his his comic book output wasn't like the way alan moore's was like he was putting a lot of effort into yeah. this and i do think that over time once the trades and stuff started coming up it made closer economic sense for him to do that mm -hmm. uh, when those things became evergreen i i read dubious numbers man that range from three quarters of one million which f seems far low in terms of Sandman pay, uh, book collection circulation, and the top numbers I seen was seven million, which still feels low to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, don't have an accurate set of numbers to give anybody as per like how many copies of this have sold, but certainly that number must change after Netflix. I am very happy to hear that it, it does take effort for this All because right. you know, like if you came up with the pieces of this, just this this book, yes, how to make those pieces fit and tell a coherent narrative it's very it should not be yeah. your brain is is on a different level if that yeah. comes out smoothly like i would think it would take some like okay this is a good idea but now i've got to rework some stuff to make the nemo strips fit in right mm -hmm. 
you know, or, or, or to tie in this vortex idea with the missing pieces from, from the endless, or from the dream. I mean, he says he was doing it kind of a piece at a time. And it kind of, so at that point, you're relying on your subconscious to make everything make sense. And I, you know, that's, that's, I think that's the way to do it. I think one of the things that you do, like you complete an issue and when you get your, your galley copy or your comps or something, give it a read before starting, you know, yeah. the next and, and, or maybe give everything a read yeah, before, before you start on and then see what you left up in the air. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you could conjure cool stories with, with that kind of stuff. Um, we, <laughs> we were looking at like Punisher War Journal one, right. And we were making mention of like Carl Potts, would have these pages that have no business being in that issue. And you just know that it's going to be some future mm -hmm, right. Punisher yeah. story. Like this is far more structured and we're more used to this kind of approach now where it could be, it's the George Lucas approach. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like you spin off a whole story to figure out how Boba Fett got that dent in his helmet. <laughs> yeah. You don't call too much attention to it. You show it. And then you can make that story at another time. Like that's, that's the difference between those kind of comics and something like this. Yeah, I imagine like the serial killer or detective wall of characters in, in Game and Department and just strings going off to like around the corner. That there's mm -hmm. stuff not even over there yet, but like, okay, this is a thread that at some point we can we can pick this one up in the future. I mean, Princess Barbara that gets established in this book, like that's the right. next story. That's yeah. Brief Lives, I think. I think it's what it's called, right? And so, so here we got, like you're doing that point of view stuff and we're doing point of view of a character who eats eyeballs by stuffing them in his eye sockets. <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that maybe would make it a little better is if you had little teeth on the top and bottom of, of each panel. Oh, go This is This is fun explanation of just that he can't find Jed. Yeah. Yeah. And so he knows it's one of one of the uh, news, arcana yeah. that uh, have, have figured Lock out how to block up. him off because he's yeah. not dead yet and he can't find him. So wonder which one's responsible. You know, it's nice. It comes back and it gives us a recap. It's yeah. the, if this is your first issue, at least you can catch up yeah. mo mm -hmm. more or less just from, uh, you know, from this issue. Yeah, this stuff is great. And again, putting back on your glasses and, yeah. and uh, illustrate that, Mr. Colorist. Great payoff at the end, too. It'd be easy to put that in the, in the beginning of that sure. scene. For sure, for sure. This is a great sequence where this girl gets in the information, she knows where Jed, Jed is. She's going to bounce, man. We established that, you know, maybe she could get it, her head, she could get into a little bit too much trouble. Wouldn't be bad to have, you know, a knight in shining armor or something along the way. There's, uh, what, what's his name? Gilbert. Gil Gilbert. Gilbert. Yeah. We'll call him Gilbert yeah. uh, early. So Gilbert's there waiting. It's like, oh, I'm going to accompany you. I have a serviceable revolver and my little, uh, my little sword stick thing. She's like, no, absolutely not. No way flip the page <laughs> right yeah and yeah, they're already like, on the move editing yeah uh, yeah uh we have not connected that he's fiddling right no that's a really green, nice reveal but yeah. there are these little hints right yeah. he's wearing a green vest and stuff and in hindsight it makes sense yeah. just from well, not even hindsight but in foreshadowing and then knowing who he is that he would be glomming on to her he's a really appealing likable character yeah like you can't help liking him and then when you see like what he actually is you know he's like this place that's like just you feel real comfortable and safe and happy you know healthy it's yeah it's good all of these uh characters are in jed's dream yeah is that right yeah is that how living inside this? his mind he is his own piece of the dreaming is like up in his head that's walled off from the rest of it and you know the sandman is is dead and this he's, is a way of keeping him alive he's got to go in with a with a playtex freaking dishwashing mitts it's that dirty a business <laughs> Yeah, some of this stuff's cool to me, too. I feel like it's good drawing, and it gives, like, a real imposing quality to Sandman, where it's like he's he's angry, yeah. and, and you're going to see what, what can come of that. Has a certain weight. Again, it's a good way to end yeah. your issue, where it's like, you're not going to like... You, this this yeah. isn't a dude to piss off. Yeah, it's 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 like the Batman scene. It's like, you know, I also like whenever they up. describe his robe early on as being, like, almost, like, living. Yeah. Uh, I don't think this is the best representation of it. This is okay, but there are some really cool robe illustrations as we keep going where it's almost like you're doing something with the ink lines. I'll try to remember to point them out when sure. we see them, but it, it's one of those qualities of like the description of the robe is almost impossible to draw. So it's cool whenever you see people kind of like rising to like some kind of, how do you interpret this thing that's almost abstract? The the sort of combination to me is the Kelly Jones approaches, man, where it, it's always kind of flowy yeah. and blowing. 
love this spread too. And this wouldn't have been a spread, you know. This would have been your page one. Yeah. In the uh, in the original printings, in the comic books. Now these <clears throat> these sort of like cheerful Kirby characters are drawn in uh, Bernie Wrightson yeah. language, you know, which would have been contemporary. With, like that cheery Sandman was coming out the same time as like the first issues of of uh, Swamp, Swamp Thing. Thing. You know, it's an interesting pairing. And it is Crane. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's Sandman and, and his uh, pregnant wife. Yeah, this, gets, this Sandman. Who gets pregnant, pregnant in the dreaming. And the, the, these are established characters. You know, yeah, Lyda Hall, Hall. Like, I think, is, is she, is she like, Wonder Woman's niece yeah, or she's, something? Yeah, like, related to Wonder Woman somehow. Yeah, I, I'm not yeah she's that Wonder Woman person. sidekick character. Wonder Girl. Some xerography on the background Yeah, I was going to say, this is getting into some of that interesting background effects. And they talk about... Uh, a thousand thousand screens which is what you're seeing in like all these little panels you know, oh like you know what's funny fun things the, to try the, to fulfill this is the uh this is the go back this is the chris Bacciallo uh issues and eric reynolds helped out on these that's eric reynolds right there <laughs> <laughs> and awesome. and they've they changed it in the trades but if you get the original issue there is a blow job <laughs> in one of these tv screens that uh got amended for the trades that's funny. I feel like that's Brian Boland. A Brian Boland piece of art right there. Need but that, for Vendetta. That's Eric Reynolds, and uh, Chris Pachala will be in here. Uh, he said that, Eric Reynolds said that they were in the back of a comic shop, like in, uh, I guess, Orange County. And Eric was, like, helping uh, spot the blacks and things. Yes. Chris Bachelot, uh on your guest penciling. Uh, the next issue will also be guest penciled. And when we were coming into this, I was excited by the art team because I, I like these artists. And I think up to this point, a little bit underwhelmed. Mm -hmm. There have been some good panels and good moments. But post this, it feels like it really picks up artistically. Uh -huh. And uh, is this even John Costanza doing a lettering fill-in? And I think the next issue might have a lettering fill-in. So it feels like maybe deadlines had gotten out of control. If he's taken six yeah. weeks game to write an issue and, and who knows, the artists aren't quite up to the task of being maybe on a four-week schedule. Maybe they're getting their books late. It feels like this is where the catch up happens, like almost a not a relaunch, but kind of like, OK, I know what I'm doing now. We just got to get back to, to on time. This this is how comics work now. Oh, yeah, this is it's structured for specifically this. Now. Yes. <coughs> Chris Bachelot looks great, mm -hmm. you know, so you know, young, so young, like like his whole life got made like he really wasn't doing he didn't he got his first opportunities. This was a low level book. Yeah, right. this is like. Trying to think when Shade. Shade would be after this. Like, yeah. Oh, Shade's course. a big yeah, Shade, run up yeah. for him, right? You sure. know what? Um, this looks so much to me like Frank Miller's Ronin. Yeah. There this, are these like, elements. Man, this sure. panel in particular, even yeah. the color reminds me of, of the Ronin. Yeah, dude just fully going for it, man. Like, try, like this is his audition. Yeah. Imagine this is your audition. <laughs> Krang looking really good right, in this yeah. panel. Yeah. <laughs> what a contrast Frank, between your two it. Sandmans. Yeah, so I guess this is her 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 young young superhero outfit. Yeah, and he's going off to, and she even says like uh, when she was that superhero, is just copying her mom. Yeah, right. Which and, another one of those almost Watchmen esque this, nod, like, or vice versa, maybe. His superhero and sort of superheroes in general in this series are these clueless doofuses. There, and uh, it's it's another thing like you see in Alan Moore a lot, where you have like the hero type who's a complete idiot. And then his sort of sidekicks are the real powers, are sort of manipulating him, letting him think that he's the big hero and sending him on his little missions, you know, at their behest. Yeah, they even comment about how dumb he is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's kind of taken out, like, of, of the, the show, the, the Lyta Hall character and the Hector Hall. Like, they're, it's its own independent thing. And Sandman is the little boy who's, who's given this... Uh, you know, like he, he gets to be a hero in his dreams and okay. it's kind of a very, a very cool approach. All right, man, their car breaks down Rose and, and, uh, and Gilbert. And so they end up going to the nearest hotel, which happens to be the uh, site of a serial convention. And whenever I first tried reading this, that was the hook, right? It was yeah. like, this is a serial killer right. convention storyline. Yeah. There's a lot more story than sure, just that yeah. part. That's like two issues or so in here. Uh, but it was the part that it would frustrate me as a reader because I would pick this up and try to read it and be like, I don't, there's no serial killers. What is this yeah. about? <laughs> you know, I, I love the the line she says when they're checking in and she's like, okay, these cereal eaters, growers, whatever. And like the next word is killers, you know, yeah. <laughs> cereal eaters, growers, killers. 
Yeah, totally. And in case that's not enough, the next scene is your serial killer yeah. in action once again. <laughs> Dude's going to get their fingers bit off by the guy's eyeballs. <laughs> And back to our nightmare monster showdown with Sandman. Sandman versus Sandman, you know, old and new. And and Morpheus just just cracking up. Oh, you're Sandman, huh? Yeah. Just laughing. And kind of changes the mood because he was in a serious "I'm ready to kill" kind of mood. And then he's like, "Okay, you got to laugh out of me. You know, good for you, kid. You know, you you made this more fun than I thought it would be." These type of visuals, right? Like you got to. This is a dream comic. Yeah, but also paralleling where yeah. our uh, our dreamer is imprisoned it's cool to see morpheus as the nightmare monster mm -hmm. you know we, he's our title character like he's usually the hero yeah it's great how much he is not quite the hero yeah he hangs back a lot very scary if that's the hero that yeah. you're waiting for yeah and, and you know he's he's a very, a very flawed character you know, and he's not interested in helping people no. he's not like hey jed let me help you or whatever he's just, it's just kind of like yeah all, all the serial killers don't end up in prison right. or anything like that yeah, it's much more of a serviceman than it is a hero. Like yeah. His role is got to keep the dreams working. It's He's not, got another agenda. That's yeah, not we're not like here to a, rescue yeah. or reassure you. His laughing is even scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, through the... Uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, this and is a horror comic. The visual representation, like the nightmare monster just towering over our quote-unquote traditional yeah. hero. In, in, in those primary colors. So you have your pastel, uh, your pastel pellet. And then just traditional superhero. How about this for like color hold stuff that's going down, man? Does he ever look more like Neil Gaiman? <laughs> There's there were a lot of panels where I'm like, it's just Neil Gaiman. Man. Yeah, I thought that a lot reading this. You know, even even hearing like that voice. Yeah, I mean, people make fun of George Lucas, you know, <laughs> creating these. Uh... Jack Porkins is that the Lucas? What? Well, no, no, Luke. <laughs> His name's Lucas, yeah. and the hero's called Luke. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he saves the universe. A little Atomo energy. Yeah, absolutely. In this. Absolutely. I had to reread this to see like what happened to his parents. You know, it's like this this burst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the coloring could have made that a little bit more, I don't know, clear. A, a great comeuppance though, because those those uh, adoptive parents are, are such scumbags in this story. And... Yeah, gonna make him wish his mother had an abortion instead of him. Right. About the worst thing. You, you know what right I mean? Like him. like horrendous. So like like yeah, keep that character in character right before you you destroy him. And again, defeating these bad guys is secondary their their collateral damage in in uh, sandman's real uh quest yeah i'm just a little bit surprised you don't see them at all right, whenever yeah. whenever they get their yeah. come up and have, mm -hmm. have a i don't know a hint of, of his shape some being, entrails being destroyed yeah right whenever i think about it's what you would actually home. show it's pretty unpleasant but because because i mean with this, in this is domu you know this is the little girl right. like fucking using some psych psych stuff good moment with all of your remaining or Sandman pretty uh, pretty easily. This piece feels so tipped in. It doesn't feel like Bachala. It looks feels like Charles Vess like came in for one panel. And you'll see when you, when we do like Midsummer's Night's nice Dream issue, it's it's that line quality. Yeah, I don't know about it being Vess, but I mean it can no, easily be Vest. a lot of the uh, the inker yeah, handling yeah, yeah. it. You yeah. know, like like something came in and maybe they weren't thrilled with it. And it was like, well, just fix up this one. I mean, how how many stories are there of like bullpens doing that with different comics? Both Marvel and DC stuff. And he's, he's like, go away, little ghost, and, and turns Sandman into... And I'm kind of noticing it here. It looks like he's turning into like a crow shape, you know, which is what ghosts become in this cosmology. And he's like, listen, man, you shouldn't be getting pregnant from, from, from dead guys. Your baby's mine. It was it was conceived in the dream it world, was, so... It so... was conceived prior to the dream world, but spent most of its gestation in the dream world so yeah it's his he lays claim and that, and that, and this, this is incredibly important in in the mythology of of sin and this whole piece right here i love the uh kind of the reality versus the dream version yeah. of, of lyda yeah yeah and we've seen that in that uh john constantine uh issue where the lady was addicted to the sand mm -hmm. and you got to see what the reality was versus the dream it's a cool use of comics as a medium i think mm -hmm. not always easy to draw but if you can pull it off i feel like that's a really good use and here the a story and the b story come together where jed's gotten away he's running away and who's he running to? oh man that blue collar lets you know everything you need to know there that poor kid is no luck man he's behind the eight ball yeah he's a, he's a dickenian character another great uh another great ending of an issue yeah. and reading these as the single issue reprints it really made me think like how these things stand alone as issues as satisfying issues on their yeah. own and then like once you put them into 
a 75 issue narrative, like mm-hmm. they, they have the same kind of uh, success, but a very different experience. You yeah. know, like, like being able to write the single issues at this time period, like people just abandon that. Got the Zuli issue, the first Zuli issue. Yeah. Michael Zuli and uh, is it Steve, Steve Parkhouse? Yeah. I have some of his art and other stuff, and I really like him. Gets, They're a strange uh, couple. Yeah, it makes page. sense to me, man, uh, because they like this kind of like pre raphaelite type uh-huh. artwork. Like Steve Parkhouse's work, you know, whenever Eclipse brought Miracle Man over and had success with that, and they started bringing all kinds of stuff. There, Parkhouse, I believe it's Parkhouse, did, had a had a run in uh, Warrior also, and that gets reprinted by Eclipse. Uh, it's it's formatted a little weird, so they have to put like some weird stuff on the on the top margins or bottom margins. But it's very very uh, action adventure strip oriented kind of artwork. British fella, I'm, I'm guessing because it's Warrior. I think I had a how to book by him twenty years ago. I don't have it anymore, but you know, like I like his cartooning. Like I think he's a solid cartoonist. Uh, this, interesting marriage though between the two styles. This is the Hob Gadling story, yeah. man, and this is like one of the like I read this as a kid. And it introduced me to, you know, like, certainly as a little kid, man, when you have your first, like, kind of family members pass away and things, like, death is extremely, I mean, it's scary to me now. But uh, this kind of helped me, like, make peace with it. I, uh, no gaming on, on that Mark Marin interview, he's talking about how he talked to the girl who played death and was like, you don't have a responsibility. you got to keep your ears open and, and just, like, allow people to tell you super horrendous things and and you have to kind of just like acknowledge like listen and and, mm-hmm. and move forward but don't let it hurt you and don't you know yeah. give too much or give too little and and like if i was to like pull his coat like this would be the issue that i'd be talking mm-hmm. about because it just helped me deal with like a whole lot of stuff well, in life at a young age yeah for me when i was re- i was pretty young when i read this and i was like yeah that's the plan i'm just not gonna die like you're you're in denial of that yeah you know, like yeah, anybody unfamiliar, this guy decides he does, he's not going to die, yeah. and Death is like, okay, we'll, we'll let this go, and Morpheus is like, cool, I'll, I'll tell him and I'll catch up with him each year. Right, each Death is years. a sucker's game. And this motif comes up again and again in this series, where it's like, people don't die because they have to die. They die because they choose to, according to the logic of your... And then it was the same thing with Hell, where it's like, people aren't in Hell because they were forced there. They chose to be in, and, and continue to choose, and they could leave at any moment, but something in, in, in the human psyche wants to punish itself. And so, like, Zuli, man, this is a very complicated comic to draw. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that, you know, Morpheus is going to meet up with that guy. Okay, so you're not going to die. Let's meet up here again in 100 years. Mm-hmm. And you got five, six, seven centuries worth of stuff where you have to have period-specific architecture. So on, on both creative person's part, there's a lot of work that needs to be done that is not putting pencil to paper and making pages happen. No game it has to figure out like the history of basically technology. Yeah. They're talking about chimneys here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you got and you got these grizzled old guys who are like, ah, oh, these pussies, man, who want chimneys in their houses. Like it was so much better before chimneys. <laughs> yeah, it makes the wood strong. Ed, Ed, think about this. You gotta draw the difference between the thirteen hundreds and the fourteen hundreds. Right. Yes. Like what, what is the that? fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and and what kind of reference do you have for that kind of stuff, man? It's it just like and, and and you're changing attire, you're changing architecture. What are the technological advancements? The, like the work that is done for this issue alone would take me a year. Yeah, 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 for sure. The inking is so bizarre. Like if you yeah. look at these lines, it's some kind of maybe a fountain pen or something yeah. where like you're going back and forth without lifting your pen. Uh-huh. It's a scene nib. <laughs> <laughs> And we also don't get like, you know, 1608. It doesn't, right. Uh, right. you yeah. know, like, like your yeah, indicator is yeah, not the, quite the, there. The costuming and the, and the architecture are what, what take you. There's, there are parts like that make me think of that great R. Crumb single page history mm-hmm. of yeah. America. Right. But they don't quite do it here. Like, I, I feel like that that is kind of a missed opportunity, man. Like mm-hmm. where if you could like create the animated GIF of the outside structure yeah. of from the same exact camera view, like that great uh, crumb piece. Cause like, this is what the bar looks like in one century. And this is what we have, you know, 100 years from yeah. then, updated technologies, updated uh, attire. And the whole arc of Hob Gadling's life, there are ups and downs depending on the century. Yeah. The dude is damn near aristocracy or, or royalty. 
in one century, and then he is a mumbling, like Bowery mm-hmm. bum, the next run-ins with uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare, and and there is a lot. Like you could read, you could read endlessly about um, did Shakespeare write his his right, yeah, his plays and theories, stuff like yeah. that. And uh, it looks like Neil Gaiman is kind of given a little bit of that to uh, you know some some other dudes. So these Shakespearean parts, they 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 pay forward uh, in in the future in the great Charles Vess issue and some others. There's a reference to printing technology, (laughs) which which he describes as a gimmick, but he's getting (laughs) getting involved in that. That's a pretty fun moment. Um, I don't think it's here yet, but they get into slave trade. Yes. And it's one of the things that Morpheus is like, you you need to get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe the next. I think it's after. after Is it after? Yeah, it's because this is his fall and then he's rich again by the next time after this. Yeah. And it's uh, this is a Hard to make these moments. He does some stuff where each moment, each next hundred years, there's some cool stuff that's introduced. So yeah. in this one, he's having his first child. And in right. this one, a hundred years, you know, he's very excited, he's very yeah. up. In the next one, the child died in a bar fight. Yeah, the, his, his wife died in childbirth. Yeah, like their second he's lost kid. his fortune. Like, but as you say, Ed, this is, this is your, you know, yeah, right. He's not ready to give in to death yeah. yet. It's a mugs game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got so much to live for. And that's kind of like the takeaway. But like, this is a fantasy story, make believe kind of stuff. But there are points in people's lives where they are kind of ready to give up. So this is kind of something to kind of take with you. you know? No, like, like, like world. this thing, man. Like, so just and there's your your building being built up, Ed. Yeah, totally. And you have Lady Johanna Constantine showing up, man. Yeah. Because because at this point, it's now legend of the meeting of these guys in this yes. exact yeah. location, and she's. You know, she's interested in uh, the occult and things. That's the Constantine way. Uh, so she's prepared. She's prepared for a long time. She's got heavies with her and shit. She's got plans within plans. Yeah, it's one of the twists that I think is really great. Like, we've seen a few of these meetings now. So now we've got them at knife point. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's it's, clever. It's really cool. And, it, and it's nice that it's Constantine. Yeah. You know, like, it, it, again, plays into that bigger universe. It's an interesting thing because the, the John Constantine that we know... In, in the Swamp Thing issues is kind of hinted at as maybe being immortal himself. Maybe maybe the JC in John Constantine is Jesus Christ oh, or just something. like Red Badge of Courage. You know, so this is a choice that Gaiman makes that kind of negates that, you know, that, that he's just the latest in a line. And and now we have the location of exactly where that bar is, man. That's huh. in Whitechapel, yeah. dude. How about that for, for uh, yeah, it, interesting. And again, a little bit of a nod to Alan Moore, right? right. I mean, yeah, from he's, hell he's is, wearing is, is the, starting up probably around this time. He's wearing the Ripper outfit. Not too far from uh, from our friend Gilbert, his outfit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this is such a great issue, man. Yeah, it is great. And again, like you were saying, it seems like little standalone, like, hey, here's a little change of pace. We got our big story going. Let's have a little fun. But it all connects. Reminds me of... Uh, Gilbert Hernandez's Julio's Day and uh, Chris Ware's Lint, yeah. where it's like you're just checking in. You know, the, the, the pacing's different, obviously, but it's it's that thing of like we're going to have just moments that, that delineate this passage of time. Yeah, the book into this and, and sort of the MacGuffin is death and dream go into a bar. And death is – she takes it upon herself to just get acquainted with the humanity that she serves. And Morpheus feels – elitist about that like i like i don't what, what do i have to be here for so when it's suggested yeah, that great i like this that sequence. every hundred years we we meet up together like uh we're friends at this point and and uh, like morpheus is completely yeah. insulted because it's just it would be so below him it implies some need on right. his part right which is unthinkable right it's great though and he's like good cliffhanger at the end of the page i'll be here in a hundred years if you know if if we're friends, yeah, right. Yeah, I'll see you then. It, it's re- it's really sweet how, yeah, it's nice. uh, like on the TV show, how how they play this because okay. when he's sitting there waiting after after their their scuffle, um, it's like the first thing that Morpheus does when he escapes the bubble is like run there. It, oh, it's nice. like that's all happening yeah, yeah. while he's escaping. So like this guy, it, like it, he might not be showing up. Right. He almost doesn't make it just because of what happened in volume one. Exactly. Know? Exactly. And then he shows up. And he's all 80s up. Totally. <laughs> yeah, look at that mullet. It's Chris the Crow. Is there any connection to the dollhouse in this story? Because this feels like an inventory story that could have been plugged in anywhere and definitely feels like it's a deadline issue. Yes. That, yeah. that we get this he, one here. Here, I like the story. Yeah. But... Right. Here's, here's what I think it is, man. And here's how it tangentially like fits in. Uh, this is the issue 
where uh, where Sandman is m- more connected with humanity right. than ever. So like when he has to kill Rose Walker at the end, and 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 there's that kind of that kind of push pull emotionally with that. Like he's and, he's kind of he has this in mind. You're, you're right because up until this point, when we were seeing him as like the dream monster versus the Sandman, it's kind of like. Why the fuck should I give a shit about this guy? You know, and then here it's like a little vulnerability. Like, yeah, yeah, he's he, he he is the hero of this story. He's not quite the kind of hero you've seen before, but he's a good guy underneath it all. It's nice. It gives him some personality, but it could be anywhere. Yeah, I love seeing Dave uh-huh. McKean do the Corinthian. Yes, and we did uh, that Dust Jackets book that w- we looked at all of the Dave McKean uh, covers for Sandman, and there's uh, some artist information associated with each cover. This is Neil Gaiman with the smile. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't remember that detail, but man, <laughs> that really adds to it. <laughs> Unforgettable image, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's a great image. So here we go. Serial condition. Dringenberg back in, in the house, man. Yeah, and I think it's strong from here on out. Like, yes. I, I think that whatever time off to catch up really paid off. Steve Bissett? And I'm wondering, <laughs> yeah, because the convention, comic book convention. Oh, totally. Yes, 100%. I, I can relate Name to tags, yeah. panels. Yes. He's, he's, and, he's got a year in, and so, like, Sandman is, is getting more and more sexy and stuff. So, so like, he's he's exercising his own demons here, not just with attendees, but with brethren. And you know what? Like, this isn't 2020, uh, you know, San Diego Comic, or, or, you know, 2015 San Diego Comic Con or whatever. This is... 1990. Late, yeah, yeah, early 90s, late 80s, where it's like... It's it's a little sparsely att- it's not it's not jam packed wall to wall you know I would take Joe Kubert too yeah Joe Kubert yeah <laughs> but I mean if you're doing Bissett, isn't that still a Kubert reference in some way so is that Archie Goodwin <laughs> okay <hi. Yeah. laughs> are we Why gonna not? play that game uh... are we gonna play that game guys let's do it who's this <laughs> say something man put a part on the table because <laughs> that's Jim Shooter oh man that's this is funny Will Eisner checking in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, Peter David. <laughs> I was thinking that, but a lot of hair. Yeah, the a lot mustache of hair. is good though. Yeah, so this is this is <laughs> this such is the guy, a bizarre. This is the guy who ran mycomicshop.com. Uh, <laughs> what was that? What was that joint? Lone yeah. Star Comics. Yeah, Lone Star Comics. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Saunders. <laughs> right, it's Buddy Saunders, dude. <laughs> That's amazing. This kind of has the rhythm of a comic convention too, because everybody's showing up. It's kind of exciting, and then and then there's a point where it's like. I found my people all my life. I've, I've been an outsider. Now I found my, and then by the end, they're kind of like, get ready to go home. Get me the fuck out of here. It's a peculiar conceit for a story. Yeah. You know that it's serial killers because you could yeah. do anything. It, they could be traveling salesman right. convention. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you wanted to plant this in a different world, but like there were serial killers, but there were crazy things like, like in the, in the eighties, like, like zine culture. So low key, there's that kind of stuff going on. And I mean, Howard Stern, they would call the Nambla line, right? Mm-hmm. Like there was, there were like Nambla is getting together. Like that, there's this disgusting groups finding one another, and this is before the internet, so you had to do it in person. I remember seeing footage of early hacker conventions, and everybody in the whole joint is wearing um, Lone Ranger masks, and it's a, a room full of dudes with fucking Lone Ranger masks, and like loaded to the gills with different technology of the 70s it's wow. it's fucking badass and there's still a little bit of shame connected to comics at this point too you know yeah definitely you don't want anybody to know you're you're having a comic convention and it's a cool conceit but you really don't like there weren't yeah. supposed to be anybody that wasn't part of the convention in this yeah. hotel but unfortunately rose and gilbert uh find their <laughs> way there and how about that for... that yeah and again this is another one where it's like is this really what the story of Little Red White Riding Hood was, you know, like, you, am I am I getting a history lesson here, or are we still in like Neil Gaiman's fantasy land? You know? Yeah, this is a wild story because it involves cannibalism. Yeah, you know, saying that this was the original version of it, and then it was kind of massaged into what yeah. we know today. Yeah, yeah, and and, 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 and we've heard that plenty of times. Sure, yeah. uh, but this artwork right there, this two pager, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's who knows what the medium was to start, but then it has to get distilled into black and white lines. Yeah, and I love that it's not a grid. You know, they're square panels, but the they're color. not lined up. You know, what is tr- what is troublesome in the reading experience of like the spread mm-hmm. is that I take this in as a panel. And so I went there and then I'm like, oh, no, I'm supposed to read like this. Right. I'm not sure this was a spread initially either. It would help if it was not. 
Yeah. Be, for for right. that specific reason, yeah. because I totally went right there. Because it looks like it a It does unit. look like it. Yeah, it does look like it, but boy, that drawing's amazing. Yeah, it makes me think of like Lone Wolf and Cub or something. Yeah. Like, if it, like Japanese calligraphy art, you know? And here's our Corinthian showing up. Yeah, now I'm thinking, is that like Lou Reed? And I'm th also thinking like Tim Robbins around this time kind of had that kind of look. And I think he wore like weird sunglasses in one of his movies. Maybe you're, you, you're not thinking Howard Chaikin showing up at the convention. <laughs> 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 Great hair. Yeah. Storanko. <laughs> 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 a little tall. A little tall for... <laughs> but, got, but got the white. Yeah, these would have to be switched their heights if they were... Uh... <laughs> I bet the no sleeves is a uh, is a joke at someone's expense. Steve Rude. <laughs> oh, he had good uh, hair too. You know what? Uh, 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 Cerebus. Uh, Dave oh, Sim. Shit. Dave Sim. He had that hair. That's interesting yeah. because that would be that group of like uh, you know, Gaiman was part of that mm -hmm. that circle that like kind of New England coming out of the Turtles kind of group, yeah. the creators and stuff. Um, so we we've got our organizer Nimrod being like, "Hey, I need a favor because one of their guests didn't show up that was going to be mm -hmm. the guest of honor." So uh, appealing to the Corinthian. It's neat how they all know each other. And I mean, like, that's a really nice splash page. Yeah, for sure. A lot of work has to be done on the uh, colorist part to to uh, to get this stuff across. And I'm looking at these images. I don't recognize almost anybody. I don't I don't recognize yeah, I was anything for like a John Wayne Gacy. Exactly. Clown like, or like, yeah, like where's Albert Fish, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, but there's it's just it feels random. I wonder if that's something that editorially they mm -hmm. said you can't use real you, right. you know, you can't use a real person's yeah. likeness in there. But look at what we have here. Like the letterer, you know, if they did anything like I'm, it's it's my th thought in this, unless told otherwise, that this part is done by the inker it wouldn't surprise pe me. penciler. Yeah. But the colorist has to figure a lot of that out because there's not a lot of holding lines here. You know, for like right. the C and I think a that's lot of the shit. argument of, that it's done by the pencil or anchors. Like even the color parts. Yeah, why not? It's a color hold, you know. Yeah, yeah, like I, on a I, I on an extra layer, like a, a piece of vellum or something. Yeah, we've seen that in other comics, just applied this way. It's it's somewhat unique. Speaking of coloring, like how about that for yeah. some strong stuff, and and signing these pages. Yeah, you know, there's several of these. You'll see. I guess it's Dringenberg's signature on a few of these pages, and I, I kind of like that. We've talked mm -hmm. about you know Mobius signing his pages or Eddie Campbell signing his. I like that. Yeah. It just feels like these are artists that are, I don't know, much more confident and in control than in some of those mm -hmm. earlier issues. And this is getting into your convention uh, model, right? right? Guys sitting at the bar, BSing, uh, talking about panels and, and the layouts for the weekend. And it's the guy who talks big game, mm -hmm. who but who who has no stripes. Yeah, you know, has no stripes in the game, and and it, it's it's very clear to like sort of everybody yeah, involved. Yeah, you can sniff them out easily. Easily. Yes, and. Uh, pumping up this magazine chased yeah. have you seen this magazine yet that's gonna that's gonna come back our film program i like the programming the, notes the, the yeah right because it's like <laughs> it's like all the stuff that could have gone into it for me because there's a by the numbers like this guy read that fucking john e douglas's mind hunter book because like it's clearly spelled out like what what it takes to be a serial killer it's all the right stuff you know it's manhunter it's, that's a hannibal lecter flick before, before silence yeah. of the lands the with the michael mann joint you know what um for kayfabe con do this like have a film festival that's based exactly <laughs> on this list <laughs> i i i uh if you remember in the in the 90s there was um the iceman killer there's two specials on yes. hbo mm -hmm. where they just sat there and talked with the guy i watched this thing on youtube I, i'm subscribed to it it's these behavior experts who watch mm -hmm. stuff and then they reverse engineer and, and, and tell you what they see and they're like this guy's fully bullshitting about mm -hmm. like uh, so much of it they were able to pin like 10 15 murders on the guy or whatever but He's in prison. He's there for life. He's just pumping. He's kayfabing himself. And, and but I read the book also, and in the book, so I guess what I'm saying is you got to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. But um, he was talking about there were two or three times in his life, and he was tied with one other serial killer guy, a Mr. Frosty guy, who had a ice cream truck, and he said that the the guy would serve kids ice cream in a day and maybe kill their dad that night, um, where. It was almost nonverbal. There was a woman serial killer, and it was almost nonverbal and random that they found each other. Like with the Mr. Frosty guy, he was in a urinal at a restaurant or something, and they looked at each other and they just they knew. Yeah, that's crazy. That they were killers, man. And 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 he met a woman, and they just they knew that they were different. And 
sort of bonded and I always know the comic book dudes on, on <laughs> yeah. the airplane because they have the t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> well that's not even true anymore man because I see a lot of yeah, Captain but... America shirts on people the, uh, you, you mentioned Manhunter as being on there that is a might have to re up and it was Manhunter you were talking about okay God damn it. You know, that's very telling because your phone is newer and used way less than mine, and that battery dies quicker. It was good for a while. Yeah. Okay, you brought him. Oh, you're yeah. talking Michael Mann. In, the, uh, in, that, in the Hannibal Lecter series of books, there's meetups of serial killers, and I think they meet in international waters on a yacht. Oh, that's so sick. But it's, you know, like that concept is out there, the idea that these killers identify with each other or, you know, connect in some way, have something in common that the rest of the world does not. <laughs> there's a panel where they're talking about how, like, you know, we're something different. There's people and they're cattle and we're awesome and everybody and I. And that's that's your Corinthian I, uh, state of the union. I, I mean, I've been on panels where there was that kind of talk. Where yeah. I can't relate to people who don't make comics. <laughs> you know, we're special. <laughs> Nobody else knows this. This is what life is, and everybody else isn't living. Turns out, Boogeyman's not who he claims to be, yeah. and he's uh, he's going to get his. They're, they they make the pack, you know, when all the serial killers show up, like, you don't shit where we eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the don't have anybody else in this in this hotel because they want to tempt fate. It's kind of a cool storytelling thing to set up a rule and then break it. Yes. Know? Yeah, exactly. And, of course, once they expose him as being publisher of that Chase mm -hmm. magazine that he's putting out there, well, they are going to break the rule. How about that treatment right there? I like it. It's mentioned that because they had to bring this guy out to the woods in the car proper yeah why couldn't we just put him in a trunk i have a surprise in there so yeah, that pays off later something's jed, in the yeah. trunk already yeah and it is jed but this color treatment is really sick it's like it's like here's like our last moment of humanity or something and then now we're in kill mode mm -hmm. literally seeing and red these great smiles with that backlighting <clears throat> and it's very uh it's very sexual the way they they sort of speak as they get into it where it's like taking turns mm -hmm. and that was fun yeah and here's here's our guy and why you can't have somebody uh, a civilian yeah, as part of it. He's it, like, how how old is this girl? And there's barely anybody on the dance floor and stuff. Yeah, that's Wait, an SPX prom. <laughs> he when he's talking Funland, he's talking about like Disney World and how he's like a serial killer goes to Disney World and Disney helps him cover it up. This was like a, a real um, urban legend yeah. when I was a kid. And when I went to Disney World, they, pe people were telling my parents, okay, if you lose your kid. Watch their shoes because when these these people kidnap your kid, they 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 cut their hair, they give them a different outfit, but they don't have the right size shoes. So your kid's gonna have the same shoes. So like this, so it's like you know this is this was reality as far as I was concerned. Reading this when I was a kid, bar talk with a couple of killers <laughs> and are comparing numbers, and the one guy's like, "I kill anybody," <laughs> and he's got a big number, you know, as a result, and he's like, "I only have eight. And he's like, eight? That's chicken shit." He's like, I don't kill anyone. I'm, I specialize. I'm the connoisseur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's got a very specific kink. I can yes. make a ton of comics that are all shit, or I could make my small body of work that's amazing. You know, that kind of talk. Totally. His uh, his specialty is preoperative transsexuals. Um, it's that a, seems like in in 1990. That's that's a pretty that's that forward. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like like he he introduced a lot of that stuff to to me. As as a kid growing up in you know suburban Pit, Pittsburgh, yeah, and we're done now with our uh, killing killing of that Chase publisher, and uh, they're kind of just glowing in yeah. the after mm -hmm. effect, yeah. you know, like you can see them in this relaxed state, and, and they really enjoyed themselves. Here's our panel discussion, <laughs> and it is you know it's women and serial killing. Exactly, this is this is 1990s. Every comic convention had one of these kinds of panels. Well, and she's saying well, stuff. Not, not the serial killing part. She's saying stuff to like piss off her panel mates. Have you ever seen that on a panel too, where somebody's like, "I'm not like these other uh, you know <laughs> idiots." <laughs> and how to make it pay? You know, so here's here's the famous page. Uh, there's no masturbation in the DC universe. Uh, how's that go? Well, bec uh, because uh, it's not in here, but initially it was that he would like masturbate in this. And he had to take that out because he was told there is no masturbation in the DC universe. And Neil Gaiman said, 
that explains a lot about the DC universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a cool visual conceit too because we're talking about dismembering and killing and all this kind of stuff. So like the panel borders are like your cuts. That's a nice use of color too. Mm-hmm. We're yeah. gonna show off Rose and Some our serial language. killer's fixation on her. Zero in in on her. Yeah, that's like family circus kind of thing. And and now he's fully demented. Like he was kind of a big kind of doofus, but this is like such a threat. You curve the wolf. You curve the speed lines. You you curve the door, so mm-hmm. you really feel the swoop of of that door opening up. Yeah, the camera angles real low. Is the wolf too much? A, too like much on the nose type shit. Yeah. Um. I you know, like we've had the the big bad wolf story, and now we're gonna put it on his t shirt. Yeah. It's a. It's. I mean, I, I pretty think literal. If uh, it was a peg leg Pete from Disney. That would have been awesome. <laughs> that would have like been the drawing, move, you yeah. know, like he's talking about Funland and stuff. Uh-huh. It would have been the move. And I think that's probably kind of what they're thinking. They I just don't think it's pulled want... off as smoothly here. I would think they didn't want a lawsuit. So it's like, okay, you can't draw a peg like Well, even just making it more of a cartoon. Cartoon wolf, yeah. Generic cartoon language mm-hmm. wolf, I think would have worked. And uh, Gilbert had given her a piece of paper and said, only say this name if you really yeah. have to. So now we're bringing Beetlejuice right. into uh, the DC universe. Beetlejuice lived in a doll's house, you know? Yeah, right. So here he shows up. The Vortex has called his name, and he's come to the rescue. And she must have been, like, done, right? Like, he mm-hmm. brings her back to life. Right, and he, it says, like, he, he heals her wounds. So, yeah. And he's a weird fuck, because he's got to kill her. And here's your Corinthian address, Tom. Right. <laughs> we are the American <laughs> dreamers. <laughs> now, um, so I love how so many of these guys are super passive-aggressive. They're all, like, little, like, nebbish kind of guys, and then, like... They're ready to just kill the human race, you know? Yeah. And Morpheus sitting in the audience and decides he's going to come up and take the stage. And and basically uh, deals with this whole group, right? Well, in some ways. Yeah, like he he, he takes it because they're, they're delusional. Right. And, and they're, they're like in a, dream. In, in, a dream, in a dream state in order to like make what they do okay for themselves. So he just removes that from them. This is handled really uh, interestingly in the uh, in the TV show where... Rose Walker is destroying the walls of the dreaming and it kind of dissipates dreams power a little bit. This sequence happens and it's actually a bad thing for Morpheus. So there's extra beats that that come Mm -hmm. into play and Rose Walker has to choose like, and she knows that, that the dreaming, like if she goes with Morpheus aside, that she's going to die in the end Mm -hmm. or she could have everything she wants, her friends, her family, all that stuff. If she goes with the Corinthian and, and, and offs, dream they really establish in a tv show like the strength of like what it means to be a vortex you see the dream world starting to crumble at times and things like that so on that second pass for 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 that part of it it's done really well like you get no real stakes with the vortex you just know that it's a thing that has to be addressed but in the show you really you really get you 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 see why it's important that that get taken care of and you see what he's taken away is their dream. Their you know, dream, the yeah. dream is over. It's just, yeah. You go from like, Corinthians saying, we're the dreamers, to uh, Morpheus saying it's over. And you'll know how little you mean. Like, like, welcome to the truth. This is like a repeated motif throughout this series. And it's in the Ramadan story, too, where he builds this, like, imaginary world that's so convincing. You think it is the real world. You think this really is true. And then he takes it away at the end. You get disillusioned. Whenever, uh, you know, when, when people often compare Ghost Rider to Sandman, that pen and stare, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we find Jed. Gilbert returns with, with uh, Rose's brother yeah. in a really bad state. Got to get him to the hospital. And here's here's the uh, serial killers just shuffling off. This yeah. is this is the drive home from Heroes Con. <laughs> we are fucking spent. We got nothing in the tank. You know? <laughs> and and they spend some time with that on the show too. You see everybody kind of shuffling out, and you see you know some people in a car like putting bullets in the gut, like about yeah. to off themselves, like all kinds of stuff. Uh, props for not doing a full moon. And there's a couple of really good moon shots in this in this sequence. I may have missed a really good one earlier that we, was like a quarter moon. We saw this view in the yes. beginning when the house was established. Yeah, it might have been chapter one even. Like yeah. the very first page of the, of yeah. the dollhouse storyline. Yeah, same line. angle, everything just now it's in silhouette. And her brother is still in the hospital. Yeah. She's kind of this like, not a ghost, but really struggling with this. I was kind of reading this like, is Jed going to catch a break? Like, is he, like, I kind of forgot, like, how that story resolves. Is he going to die in the hospital? You know, right. you know and she can't sleep. And so, we get into everybody's dreams now. Yeah. Yes. Ken, Barbie, Zelda, Chantel, 
the whole crowd. Uh, so this is what can and and it's fun because you could you could profile somebody like and imagine what their dreams might it's be. Almost text language, you know, you're using yeah. numbers and single letters right. for words. Computers. Yeah. You know, and so and, he's yeah. Go ahead. Well, he's he's in like a uh, like a, a music like the big time music video or something. You know, he's in in uh, Wall Street. Yeah, he's yeah, a, yeah he's a Gordon say, Gecko like, character for sure. Or that like serial killer movie. Um, that, that American, Psycho. American Psycho, yeah, totally. And then, and then we have, uh, or through the Looking Glass, she, she's in the Never Ending Story. And this stuff really appealed to me when I was, I was like, yeah, this like fantasy world. This, living in. this was pretty cool. Like when you watch the show, because like you see Martin Tenbones, and like yeah. when you see this character again, he gets pulled out of the dream and is in like Times Square, and the mm -hmm. fucking cops <laughs> just like, gun so it's like, uh, I was watching this nice. with, and 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 they're like. Oh, he's so cute. Mm -hmm. He's so beautiful. I'm like, yeah, I can't wait. I hope, I hope there's a season two. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the luck dragon from Never Ending Story. We have Chantel and Zelda having their dreams. Yeah, full Peter Nagel mm -hmm. with, with uh, either Patrick. Zelda. Is it? I think so. Pa oh, yeah. I always think Peter Max, Patrick Nagel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really neat seeing these pairs because in the daylight, Ken and Barbie are indistinguishable. They're so, so, but then their dream world couldn't be more distant. And then these two, it's kind of similar. You know, it's like very different kinds of goth, I guess. I really love all the lettering too. Oh, uh, yeah. Todd Klein nails it in this. We, I've been critical of letters who try to do different lettering for characters, but it kind of looks the same. He gets some real variation and spacing and everything where it's like they're unique lettering. Yeah, he's the only guy allowed to do cursive in, in comics, man. <laughs> and how is like the stereotypical, like Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli kind of... Uh, stage guy and we go back to our uh, our three fates right? right right yeah and rose still tossing and turning not mm -hmm. not dreaming well and, and that's going to uh give us some payoff here and gilbert going to the uh, hospital to visit jed yeah such a nice guy and i see some of that matthew every everybody's coming together is is kind of what's adding up here ted mckeever asks some of these yeah, little, little panels Absolutely. And just look at the methods and materials like like a lot of Xeroxes in maybe like a five to 10 percent reduction on each one as you're pasting it up. Yeah. Amazing for a page effect. And I wonder if at one point you can um, copy five. But, mm, but but yeah. I, I, I just don't know. I don't think so. And it's then, funny. I do that digitally. Yeah, where it's yeah, like yeah. just select five layers and copy them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like you got to build up a couple and then you get it and then you can do that. Um, and then just another set of. Mark making with, I, I believe, ink Xerox. Wash. Oh. I was thinking Xerox with some of this, the grays and stuff. Well, yeah, you could, you, when you paste it up, when you're done with it, it could, it could be that. I love the hairline on that. And they just have different great. arts. Yeah, another piece of like, we're getting into our dollhouse motif mm -hmm. where you're almost cross sectioning. And that's a, that uh, John Tenniel, like classic through the looking glass. Yeah you know public domain imagery from 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 the lewis carroll book nagel your mckeever joint this is like p craig russell-ish type type deal and then like i don't know how you would describe that but then this is like that public domain clip art right, clip yeah. art that you could just use this was the part that i thought might have been like a bucket of paint stirred <laughs> up yeah with with like that that Bill Sienkiewicz bleach and shit like doing mm -hmm. weird chemical reactions to this stuff you could literally see pigment in here I think I can't tell what's going on and these are clearly pasted up yes Maybe yeah and it's more layer something of, you know turn the books around as you're reading mm -hmm. as you're kind of descending into this dream world it, it's into a this vortex, vortex yeah. right and this like resolution of the story it's good it works but like the meat of this comic is all like. The height of this comic's already happened, as far as I'm concerned. Like in this in this book, you know, this is like a nice way to tie it up. But like, the best is behind us. Yeah, yeah. It feels like this is almost set up for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so funny because like I, the first say five books I've read a lot of times, and I feel like the last batch I read maybe two times a mm -hmm. piece. So I don't quite remember all of that. I feel like over time, like we'll probably put these under the microscope. You know, one one by one, uh, eventually. And we're here with Rose's mom and grandmother. The grandmother being on the verge of uh, death. And that is Unity Kincaid from from issue one of Sandman. Mm -hmm. So pretty much, Rose's face is you know being taken off for her fate. Got to close this vortex, and that means uh, ending her life. Yeah, there's young Jed in the ICU. And Gil Matthew's here to retrieve our uh, Gilbert. 
to be revealed as uh, Fiddler Green. He's ready to go. Still honorable, classy figure. Mm -hmm. Got the dream issue. Takes place almost exclusively in Slumberland. And it's pretty barren, you know? Just te terrain. Yeah. Because you so need like Fiddler's Green back. Stuff. Like the hands is part of the landscape. Good hands throughout here. Several uh, several versions of these hands that I'm impressed by. Get lots and lots of explanations of vortexes and things. And to the point where the girl is like, listen, if you're going to do something, do it. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm literally bored listening to you. So if you're going to kill me, kill me. Yeah, Morpheus seems, I don't know, man. He drags it on. That's that thing, like, the, the this, this is where the Hob Gadling story, I feel like, like fits into... The, the overall comic is is this set of interactions here this this issue in, in specific i mentioned about five hours ago when we started this episode <laughs> the handling of the robe and i feel like that's the inking that i was talking about yeah. as being like kind of an interesting if there's some if you're trying to make this be alive in some mm -hmm. way i feel like some of those marks are pretty good for that yeah, bits of paper coming through and wild mark making you know like we haven't seen a lot of stuff like that yeah up to this point and Fiddler Green transitions back into the the land the the land. Good, yeah, he's good, like Mogo. Good, good three panel sequence right there, man. And we figured out an out. Yes, mm -hmm. bring in Unity. Yeah, she already she just died, so she passed the threshold. She and, was supposed to be the vortex, but it got skipped over because he was because Dream was gone. Right. And she wasn't. She was inseminated by. By dreams, man. Like she was disseminated in the dream world. And again, a callback to our our uh, the heart, yeah. The heart Raylan. of glass is that is that Debbie Harry? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say there's some Debbie Harry references here, but it's a different comic we're talking about today. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when she's explaining like reach in and pull out your heart, and she's like, you know what? And she's like, it's a dream. Dream logic, yeah. You can do whatever. This might be the first uh, three parter. Yeah, that I've had to record, and it's not—it's not that long, really. It's like it'll be about an hour and a half. Hmm. So we'll just do my stuff after. I think I have uh, there. There's an app I have open. I think yeah, like my uh, so, weather app or something that's live. Something, something big, yes, sir. Yeah, you got something major open. I've been tracking that Florida stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. I have to make sure that's off. I like that handling, that idea of this is a dream, so figure it out. Do, totally. do some stuff that's that you couldn't do whenever you're awake. And Dana Jones in the Temple of Doom was only a couple years prior to this. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it may have had more impact if I hadn't seen uh, Temple of Doom <laughs> at a young age. And that's it, right? Rose I, wakes up. I mean, th this is probably has to be a conversation in DC editorial, <laughs> right? Like, there were cover issues. Man, you hope not. I, I just... I have a feeling, you know, like there were cover issues where they had to change artwork and things. Cover's different. That's true. And we return to our typing motif, so we're going to get the inside scoop from Rose herself. Yeah, and She's, this is... Uh, they inherited a lot of money, the family, bought a house by her, uh, where her mother grew up, I think outside Seattle or Portland, and uh, she's been locked in her room pretty much away from humanity. Another doll's house. And we get tied back into volume one where it's like she's a friend of the girl that was in the diner. She was right. on the phone. Like, so when she, that okay, yeah. when that girl in the diner was on the phone, like, this is who was being talked to. And there are your guys who ended up toast from the John D incident. I'll have to reread that issue because, like, my yeah. recollection is that she was just talking to her girlfriend. Yeah. But I guess, yeah, there's, like, somebody else she's talking to, and that's, that's Rose. Yeah, it's one of those you wonder, like, is that something – no game and like rep cons sure in this mm -hmm, maybe. six issues later or... I, I think there was a part in that in that sequence where uh the girl in the diner is like you know put so and so my okay. girlfriend on yeah and that would be the argument for her talking to 
And Our girl Rose. Finally, I thought we were going to get out of this story without this. Finally, Jed gets to live happily ever after. You know, yeah. like on the final page, you know, but pretty much the final page. And it's a brother-sister moment. Yes, I'd love to see the fox den. And it becomes uh, Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne, Batman Year One. <laughs> and, and he gets to maybe have a version of that kind of fun fantasy world that he was living out in his head to deal with, you know, his reality. I think this is the same pose as uh, the connoisseur whenever we're hearing the uh, the connoisseur and it's like a half page splash. I think it's the same. Oh, you're same, right, uh, dude. Reference. You're right. And that makes that makes so much sense because of the androgyny of, mm-hmm. of this character. It would be cool for the connoisseur to cross paths with desire and, and like get, get fucked up, like have the tables <laughs> turned on her. And this is Morpheus really giving it to her, like, uh, or, or to them, like, sets up more of the lore. Don't mess, don't mess with. Uh, we're not here. We, we don't, we don't run these people. Like, we're here to serve them, if anything. And, and, not and our toys. And, and very importantly, Desire was trying to coax Morpheus into killing one of their own kind, which would set all kinds of stuff in motion. And that, that that's a very important piece mm-hmm. for you know the 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 back half of yeah. uh the, the sandman series yeah it pays off in a big way you're right about the nagel references though mm-hmm. it, it's, it's really cool i thought of that a little bit whenever i was reading it but hearing you say it out loud like every every depiction of desire pretty much fits that yeah yeah and all, all the nagel imagery it's all like those 80s power suit lady like like yeah. the, like the stepmom in uh hellraiser you know big ass shoulder pad suits pander brothers hair malcolm jones wants to thank Randy DeBurke. Interesting artist for anybody who wants to look him up. Did uh did a run on um action comics whenever it was weekly. Oh right. And uh oh who's Black Canary. And it's really kind of cool yeah. artwork. If you're into I don't know, Ben Mara is probably the way I got to it. But doesn't do a ton of stuff. Um but that's stuff I would recommend if you're like I said, if you're a fan of theirs. So maybe maybe they all work together in New York and went to school together or something like that. That's a big one, man. Strong yeah. comic, man. Lots of uh, structure to it. Mm-hmm. You know, a structured comic book that came out on a monthly basis. Believe it or not, it happened. All right. Uh, before we wrap this up, well, let's wrap this up. All I'll, right. I'll, I'll shoot something else. <laughs> K Fabers. K Fabers. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? It is time to pre order the Hulk Grand Design. Uh, oversized treasury edition that has been pushed back to january but that's good it just means we can uh, sell more of those right now in the build up to it so pre-order that from your local comic shop or wherever you buy books it is a giant oversized book um put a lot of my life into that over the last couple years so pick that up and street angel deadly scroll live is back in print from image comics after almost a year you can pick that up wherever you get books too and join me on patreon.com slash jim rug and uh you can check out Sandman creator Jack Kirby. I learn all about him in Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And, uh, you know, read uh, Marvel's answer to Watchmen with Fantastic Four Grand Design. What are you laughing at? <laughs> and, uh, you know, s- still out there. Check it out. I'm, I'm super proud of it, of both of these works. And uh, check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. We're going to start new episodes in October. Red Room Trigger Warnings and Red Room, the Antisocial Network. Trade paperbacks are in stores right now. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit each book completely self-contained but they certainly work uh tidily together man if you scoop both up give them a shot you can hit up my patreon to read f- uh future red room comics as well as this current stuff three bucks get you the archive there put up new strips every tuesday hit up my link tree in the description you'll be able to get to all that stuff jimmy what else do we have out there man subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video you can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give them those marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics. Boom. I need to do my commercial. I didn't uh, interrupt our broadcast for our books. Oh, um, did I we think... do it? Did we do it at the beginning? Mm-mm. Oh, shit. We've been putting it in the middle and I just forgot all about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I need okay. to record that and I'll just splice it in whenever I edit. Yeah, do it. Let me know when you're ready. If you just want to put like all of our stuff up there and talk or something, like, well, you know what? I'll do it in pieces. Is the easiest way to do it. Okay, so. cool. Just let me know. Yep. We interrupt this video to sell some books. This is how we pay the bills at Cartoonist Kayfabe. We are all working cartoonists, so the best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe: pick up some of our comics. Tom Scioli's Fantastic Four Grand Design, uh, one of my favorite books of the last several years, is available wherever books and comics are sold. 
And that is based on one of Jack Kirby's most famous creations. And Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of King of Comics, Tom Shioli's biography of The King, uh, also available wherever comics and books are sold. Ed Piscor's Red Room, Trigger Warnings, and The Anti-Social Network are both available now in comic shops and bookstores everywhere. These are both self-contained. So whichever one you encounter is the one to pick up and start with. There are four complete stories in each issue, in each volume, plus a litany of great back matter. Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive from Image Comics is my Ninja on a Skateboard book. It's back in print after almost a year being out of print, so pick that one up at your local shop next time you're there. And Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, and Madness, the retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, available wherever comics are bought and sold. And you can pre-order the Treasury oversized edition that will be out first of next year. And now back to our Sandman coverage. I like seeing Street Angel squaring off with the Red Room. And I think maybe there's a crossover <laughs> that you guys could do. An unofficial crossover. Hey, why not make it official? You're both That's the true. owners I of this stuff. Could. I'm going to hit them in the head real fast. And, uh, See what the commenters are saying? Yeah, yeah. Just stick with the chat. Keep kicking with them. And there's a suitable lag for sure, though. Um... Jimmy, this is where you get your supercharger in effect and, yes. and like really power up your, your phone. Do these comments become permanent with the video or do they kind of go away? Well, that's a good question. I think they always run. To, uh, to cover up that one. Yeah, it was worth the, the extra. Is that my thing? Yeah. I haven't switched it over. I have a couple of super judges on No. Bad language. Uh, <laughs> funny what can tell. Ooh, I like the live recording. Oh. Yeah, right? Yeah. I couldn't find a good uh, copy of your cover. Really? Yeah, it, it was it was just on some weird askew angle. <clears throat> who's who's got a good? Uh... Let's grab a scene talk. Yeah, yeah. Um... Jimmy, the other ones you're going to record will be like the Richard Corbin. Yeah, and, and Conan Room. Okay. I might do a Russ Greenberg while we're on break. Yeah, yeah, do it. Smart. So are you set up with water and stuff? Um, No. You need a water? Yeah, I, I could use one. I'm running low on coffee here. Thanks. Yeah, so let's do... Uh... Let's do that Spider-Man 50. Spidey, that's a good one. Yeah. What the fuck, man? Pull, okay, pull do, you, do you want to do this one? Yeah, because all I have is a... Uh... Oh, it's like a story in here? It's in the book, yeah. Oh, shit, I see. Is it this? No. no it's, um, it's, it's towards the back. Some cool stuff in there. 
it doesn't it's, have it doesn't have hulk, hulk 2. 2 no okay. yeah i wish but my hulk 2 is this like little paperback this like little color hulk paperback yeah mine was a uh, a little black and white i, I the black and white one too it's i like hope you one, all have like these. a mini comic of three or four issues uh What's yeah that from yeah i don't it, it, mine was like the uk it was like a uk collection Now, what did you call this, Tom? I called this Marvel's Dark Knight Returns. Okay. <laughs> Man, I like that edition. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these things are pretty handsome. I think one of the more interesting things with Spider-Man is how they've had several real art runs. Like, yes. like, like if you were to say what's the definitive Spider-Man, it's... It's easy to say Dick Coast since that's first. It's, it's hard, yeah. But man, there are really good artists that, that run through Spider Man. This era of Spider Man to me is just like this is close, your, that that's Marvel. It's that's a, what it's, Marvel looks it's like. It's under ruse yeah. Spider Man. If I close my eyes and think about Marvel comics, this is what I see. And do I need as to aim lights up? Yeah, like I that's think a glossy it's move. Page. And this is state of the art comics. You know what, dude? You, you, I keep my hands on this stuff, I think we'll be good. All right. Right? That looks good, right? It's a little yellow. It's just yellow. It's I mean, yellow. Look at it's it. like, yeah. This is orange. That's uh -huh. yellow. Yeah. That's fine. It's, this is probably closer to what the print comic was. And I, I think a lot of it is my, my camera always warms the stuff. I don't know how to mm -hmm. white balance. It just doesn't automatically do it the way it does for yours. That looks good. You that looks like good that? as well. Yeah, I mean, it looks real faithful, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That looks like an old comic right there. Yeah, I like that. It looks real faithful. And it's cool, too, because like, you can't cast a shadow. We are, we are like lighting tech masters. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Painting with light. I'm just going to uh, keep, keep this here. I'm not going to move it out yeah. because of the scale of it and stuff. What a great cover. It is. Iconic, man. Love the color. Save it. You're blowing your spot. Uh, uh, well, it's all preserved for posterity. Hit, hit it when you're ready. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. Today we're going to be talking about Amazing Spider-Man number 50, classic issue. But before we do that, uh, Jimmy and I may have already been to uh, CXE or we'll be going to CXE October 6th through 9th. Uh, that is Columbus, Ohio. We're going to be uh, selling comics, signing comics, and talking comics out there. Same thing with Baltimore Comic Con at the end of October, the 28th through the 30th. And uh, the Jacksonville Public Library is going to be hosting a zine festival uh, October 22nd that Jimmy is going to be a part of down there in Jacksonville, Florida. Kayfabe Tour is upon us. These are your prompts to uh, inspire you to draw some stuff. Hashtag us in your posts uh, on Instagram, we'll be able to see your stuff. And if you at us on Twitter, we'll see your work. Uh, people are talking about there needs to be a wild card, but we don't play that game here, Ben. <laughs> These are the prompts. You got to stretch your imagination for sure. Let's jump into the video, fellas. Uh, Tom, when you proposed this one, you said, well, tell the people what you said. I, I said, it's, <clears throat> it's Marvel's Dark Knight Returns. All right, man. With that thesis in mind. Got a compliment. That cover is just spectacular. Amazing cover, amazing color. Red on red. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I don't know if Spider-Man ever looked better yeah. than, than that Spider-Man. It's cool. Romita Sr. is such an interesting artist because he defines so much of what uh, my childhood memory yeah. Yeah. of all these characters are. And so to get like a book drawn by him, it, it, it does feel like the real version of these characters yeah. sure. in, this, in this a is, weird way. This is the center. This is like the center of the Marvel aesthetic. This is Stuff your... came before, but this is where it got polished to what we know yes. it to be this is your this is your poster this is your under ruse this is your pajama shirt that you had as a little kid at the end of the cartoons when they would show a spider-man like this is the spider-man uh there is a large segment of the the viewership who were like ditko like yeah, who, sure. who were there mm -hmm. you know for three years yeah. of ditko and when this comes along they're like okay i'm gonna pump the brakes now but for another segment of that audience who was uh, from around that same period they were on board with this to that death of Gwen Stacy, and that's mm -hmm. all uh, John Romita. Is this the Tash and collection that, that came out recently? I haven't no, seen this. Is, this is Folio edition. Okay. I, I haven't seen the Tash and one. Boy, this is a nice. I like this collection a lot with the blue uh, edges of the pages and stuff. Very nice looking book. Color blocking. 
now, now with this story, you get the sort of action out of the way early. You do. You know, it's like James Bond or something. One of the things that's noteworthy about the story for me is that uh, a lot of time transpires mm -hmm. in this issue. There's there's a arc of time that could be it could be maybe a year's worth of time. A, lo a lot of things ha happen here, and uh, you just don't see that. Like it's a very smoothly paced comic typically like yeah. the way stanley writes it's it's you know moment to moment rather than like month to month even or mm -hmm. something like this another uh piece that comes to mind is that it's when you read it it's such a good uh idea and it feels crazy that it took 50 issues to get here yeah with all of the chest pumping that uh jr jr uh, jr that uh j jonah jameson does about the spider-man character this feels logical this feels like mm -hmm. uh a place to take and the series, uh, the fact that like they do it all in one issue too, like absolutely, you know? absolutely for sure, man. Whenever I see this page, I see the menace that, that Jameson talks about. He assaults a lady. Spider Man assaults a lady a couple pages later when he hits her with the fucking web shooter in the face. He's pretty scary looking. We know Spider Man for you know sixty plus years, so it, it's not scary because we're used to it. But that's a pretty scary looking design for a character. Pe people talk about that. You know, who were there at the beginning and seeing the cover with Spider-Man and the um, the the lizard and like, where's the good guy? Yeah, <laughs> you know? I can see it, and I wonder if that's just something Stan Lee recognized and was like, or maybe even saw in some of the fan mail. That I mean, that's just part of Marvel. It's in this that these are kind of like they're horror heroes. We take them for granted, yeah, the underoos and all that, but they're horror heroes. He's Spider-Man. Spiders are creepy. The, How the thing, you know? iconic. Oh. Is that first panel? Oh, sure. That's what I'm talking about, man. That's that's a classic Jr. John Romita. <laughs> Jr. Sr. <laughs> Jr. Sr. Jr. Nothing. So, we're, you lay out all the bullshit that the character has to deal with, man. Right. Girl problems, Aunt May problems, health Over problems, scheduling, uh, classroom issues. His grades are slipping. Uh, he he does have a Betty and Veronica in the mm -hmm. form of Gwen Stacy. And Mary J. So so we can't cry about him too much. And he rides a motorcycle at the height of like Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper. Yeah, the the motorcycle. If you read like all these issues, the motorcycle is this like ongoing, uh, you know, soap opera. You know, of the motor. <laughs> it's a very important character that kind of gets forgotten. The character evolves a, a bunch from from like where we left him with with the Ditko stuff. Yeah. That 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 is that is for sure, man. And so here's kind of the beginning of some of the Dark Knight Returns stuff. Like you always think of Doctor Volper in oh, Dark Knight yeah. Returns, and it's like, okay, he's like got the Hitler mustache or whatever, but reading this, I was like, wait, he's J. Jonah Jameson. He's going on the TV talking about what a menace Batman is, and think about all the issues where, like, J. Jonah Jameson teams up with and facilitates villains, yes. you know, in it and stuff, and it's like, that's what that's what Miller's drawing from. This, this I'm sure, was a very important comic to Miller as a kid. So you got faces on TV screaming about what a menace with, like, a graphic in the background that the superhero is. Yeah, so we will we'll, we'll embark upon our uh, superhero retirement in a minute. But first, the videos are brought to you by the comic books that we make. Uh, Tom Shioli, guest host in the house, man, is Fantastic Four Grand Design in the Wild. Jack Kirby, Epic Life of the King of Comics is out there. Uh, some of the newest work that Tom has on the stands, and he's working on a pretty cool secret project that we will unveil uh, sooner than later. Jimmy has... Hulk, Grand Design, Monster and Madness on the stands right now today, and it's going to get that Treasury Edition treatment in early 2023. And if you missed out on that first printing of Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, you're in luck because the reprint is now in stores, and you have no excuse. Get your hands on it. It's all the Image Comics versions of Street Angel out there, plus a lot of extra material that you won't find anywhere else. And Red Room Trigger Warnings, Red Room the Anti-Social Network, uh, two trade paperbacks uh, that are completely self-contained of my latest efforts. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. If you see any of these, scoop it up, give it a shot. You don't need both to get uh, full stories, but if you do, you get a wider view of the uh, universe. Now that we're done paying the bills, we'll get back to the video. And uh, we are about to get to the, the uh, most epic uh, splash page in a Spider-Man run post Steve Ditko. But Jimmy, you got, you're chomping at the This is here. amazing. This this highlights John Romita's like romance comics background and ability to draw good looking young people very expressive very and much. the beads of sweat you know like <laughs> it's not common in these uh, in these Marvel DC comics of this era to have this kind of like uncomfortable drawing and stuff and Tom you're so right having the TV screens on in terms yeah. of a Dark Knight piece because I always think 
you know, Chaikin does that before before Miller, but here we see John Romita and Stan uh-huh. Lee doing it before either of those guys. So and pretty it, cool. And it's so interesting. It's very bleeding edge because it's so literal. You know, it's like you you got to do some of this before you get the idea to have TV screen as panel. Oh, you yeah. know, like Will Eisner needs to show you how how that's done. But even look at some of the visual language, like these lines coming across. The that's in, that's in the, the yeah. interlacing. That's in in Miller's. You know. I think the coloring on this page too, like this is just an unusual page. Like, sure. Well, they're yeah, doing three something panels. different with a story, you know, to have a page like this. Back in these silver age days, man, if you were going to inject a splash page in the middle somewhere, it had to pay off. Mm-hmm. It, it was not, you know, mid nineties speculator comics where it's just like an excuse to draw something fun and cool. It's like, you have to earn that page. And you think about the great Steve Dayco sequence, pu- pushing the, uh, right. the machinery off of us. Uh, so, here we go. And it's a non-action scene. Like, it's very, very important story-wise. And it's a very striking image. But, you know, your your mind would naturally go to, like, oh, it'll be a scene of somebody. Like, we saw that in the Ditko annual where every splash is, like, Spider-Man punching somebody. Right, right. You know? Yeah. But yeah. this is Spider-Man hanging it up in the rain, in sort of like an Eisnerian rain, like, like uh, you know, Miller's Batman. And even with Parker facing away from the camera an unusual choice absolutely man yeah 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 like because like the salesmanship is a this is more important than him just going oh i'm so sad mm-hmm. it's like this says everything totally you, you don't need that facial expression in the garbage great you know? color great color hot yellow on our guy there built with this, that previous page super blue everywhere else and that fire red it is it reminds me so much of death ray and dan Klaus. absolutely mm-hmm. like this is a different tone than than almost any Marvel co- comic I've read from this era. Totally. Yeah, De- Death Ray was like Klaus doing his Spider-Man, you know. For sure. And um, so... Now we're going to accelerate time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, a, what's a world without Spider-Man? You know, what what is that? And, you know, it's like, you know, like Batman, he sort of hangs up as... He, he Because his other self is causing, like, too much damage in the world. And the way it's lined up, like, if, if I were retelling this... Instead, like it's him watching TV where he finally decides to give up. I think it should be the reverse. I think it should be the TV and then finding out that Aunt May has been suffering because he's a, like, make it personal, make the stakes personal. Before right. He hangs it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because it almost, this could be a tantrum, you yeah. know, like we see him go through mm-hmm. the stuff that he's gone through 50 issues. And mm-hmm. then the last straw is somebody cutting promos on him. And he's like, fine, I just won't be Spider-Man anymore. Mm-hmm. But you're right. If you flipped it around. And you get the TV stuff, and he's like laps that off. But then he has a real life issue. Yeah. Then uh, that does increase the power of that for sure. This is a great Stan Lee ism. The little kid that brings in the Spider Man. <laughs> Jameson's so excited, man. He's a kid at Christmas, and he's like, "Get you! You do deserve a reward, kid. Give him a free copy of the Daily Bugle." <laughs> he's like, "That's a reward." And then the caption, even alas, we will never know whether our disillusioned youngster ever took his free copy or not. <laughs> Kind of a montage sequence, man, mm-hmm. of, of, of the bifurcation of the crowd and uh, what they think on Spider-Man being through. Dude, these pa- this paper's so chunky that like I, I keep like... Yeah. Right, thinking there's something in between. So then here's another piece of Dark Knight Returns. He goes on the Johnny Carson show. This right. is the current show of the day. In Dark Knight, he goes on the David Letterman show. It's like the, but he goes on there with the costume. Ed McMahon is uh, modeling it. There's Johnny with with dark hair, and you got your magazine. Yeah, I don't know what show, show that's supposed to be. Like, I'm sure there's some. I think it's know, probably like that. Yeah, something. yeah, yeah. Like that Mike Wallace joint. Uh, tw- like tw- 2020 used to be. There's mm-hmm. like a great like Rod Serling, Mike Wallace talk promoting yeah. Twilight Zone that was sort of like this dude sitting around smoking. <laughs> and I got super excited when I got to this piece because I'm like, of course, this would be like the one monthly comic where you get. 50 villains and, and their mm-hmm. reaction right. on things but it doesn't quite go that way so like stanley saves that for the annual yeah, when that I, kind of thing goes down it kind of like dark knight returns it, it it becomes just about general street crime yeah this now becomes rampant because nobody has to be afraid of spider-man anymore now this is a twist i'd kind of forgotten that's kind of interesting is like foswell who was the master plan not the planner he, he, he was like some villain from like the early issues yeah um and then Big he goes, he goes, he goes straight. Yeah. And he, but now he sees this power vacuum, and he's thinking about returning to crime. And he has this character that he's built. It's almost like a, a the way Spider Man captures photos uh, and brings it to the bugle. This guy is able to adorn this this uh, stool pigeon kind of uh, 
attire yeah. and gets a, a deeper inside scoop when he writes his articles for the bugle with with one distracting uh feature or whatever right. like uh you don't see this kind of stuff in modern comics either very often where I feel like there's a great energy throughout this page of these supporting characters all doing stuff. You know, you see that he's not Foswell's not fitting in with the uh, the mm -hmm. street level criminals and what they have planned. And it's visually represented there. And you can see that they are interested in this in this new world order that has come about. When you see an image like that, you have to imagine that this old big man Foswell fella must be a vestige of a Steve Ditko he's era. A, yeah, he's a Ditko. Guy. And, and uh, you see when Romita has to do that, like he's bring, he's, he's a very, he has what he has from his romance days and all of that, but he's got to bring in Kirby and Ditko mm -hmm. and integrate that into his natural style. That's, that's part of why it does become like the Marvel style because it does integrate those yeah. two elements. And, and I mean, I think it's safe to say John Romita is just like a monumentally underrated artist, like just so great, but he's kind of adjacent to these you're, superstars. You're you know? right. And I, in my mind, he's not underrated because I rate him highly. Right, you rate him. But, yeah. but you are right. Like you don't hear John Romita with Ditko and Kirby. Mm -hmm. Man, he's he's important. He's foundational. Yeah, yeah. Little montage sequence, man, showing you the upheaval. Yeah, of, crime's going nuts. Yeah, feels like references to say the comics of ten years prior. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like you can imagine this being a Lev Gleason image. Totally. And Kingpin looks good. It's a different yeah. Kingpin than what we would get years later. But man, I love those big chunky hands. Absolutely. And this is like what Kingpin was before mm -hmm. Miller got hold of it. There's that famous uh, thing that he says about uh, John Byrne told him to just light him differently. Like yeah. you start off with the Ramita Kingpin. And then when he lights his stogie, it is now a Miller character. Yeah. All the Gwen Stacy, Peter Parker stuff is beautiful. I can yeah. see how fans of the day would have just been in love with her. <laughs> yeah. And, and then leave comics fandom when she dies yeah look at the two broads man that, that that pete has to decide on and stuff both classy chicks super fly all those motorcycle panels i love <laughs> <laughs> he wears that sweater it's not on this page but we've seen it in a couple different scenes already of like that crosshatch sweater yeah it's like a it's like a mohair you yeah. know it's it's like the way that uh that John Byrne would do the Wolverine chest hair when he would ink it. <laughs> That's right. And and here's where he's like refusing the call to adventure. You know, yes. when, when Batman's like here seeing the news reports and he's got to switch the channel, and, you know. Yeah, and he almost he almost does it. It's, it'd be like somebody that's Muscle lost memory. a limb. Yeah. Vern Gagne at the end <laughs> man, oh, in the man. old folks home. Not the body slam a guy. For for like Miller, like with Dark Knight, it's it's almost like a tried and true thing now to like marvelize dc if you want to make dc cool give it some marvel and he does it like his batman is the captain america man out of time you know it's he's got all these all these marvel elements that he brings to these sort of like stodgy dc uh elements but you know watching it on tv and hearing it on the radio is one thing <laughs> When you see some actual stuff going down, uh, he can't refuse that. There's too much. He has too much baggage associated with that. And that's like the roughest part of Spider-Man 2, which kind of does this. The Spider-Man movie part two that kind of does this story is there's like a scene where Peter Parker does. He hears a guy getting beat up in an alley and just keeps walking. And it's like, yow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is a Marvel comic. So he, you know, anti-hero only goes so far. I read this in the treasure. I mean, the uh, essential. Uh, I don't have a color reprint. Mm -hmm. And I had to just imagine that this would be colored properly, like yeah. subduing him in the shadows because he's he's doing the work. I mean, he even has a red shirt on and blue pants huh. uh, and is just talking about, OK, two hoods. They don't notice me. And the good guy, his face is turned away. He's in shadow. And now this is existential crisis 101 right mm -hmm. here. He's at the docks. You know, he's he's fully Marlon Brando at the mm -hmm. docks. And he's going back into his you know reason for doing all this stuff in the first place it's kind of tugging at him yeah and and look at that the, the, the clean line steve ditko mm -hmm. you know he's looking at his amazing fantasy 15 yeah. and <laughs> shit to, to like figure out how to draw this uncle ben yeah always nice to get the reiteration of the of the origin there it is dude straight lichtenstein <laughs> lichtenstein would make five billion dollars on an image like that the the other element here that i think miller kind of 
took from it's it's not in this particular issue, but at this time when you had Captain Stacy, yeah, and you like don't know if he knows that Peter Parker is Spider Man or not, and that's like the tension. Through, and then you find when he dies, you find out that he did know the whole time. That's kind of like how Miller handles um, Commissioner Gordon. You know, where it's like, does he know that he's Batman or not? You know, it's in, in, in year one particularly. That is such a great panel again of like this menacing yeah. figure coming down from the top and part in shadows. It's wonderful. And and this is very Ditko-esque, this pose, this leg, and something that you'd see in Frank Miller. And it makes me yeah. wonder, like, where I always associate it with Ditko, but who knows? Maybe well, uh, part, of, part of bringing that in. He's referencing a lot of the images from Amazing Fantasy 15. You could probably find, like, a gawky version of this panel and like that i'm ready panel. to draw the little dot eyes the dot in there eyes, from yeah uh, yeah yeah exactly. totally. And, totally and even this that that might might even be the punch it's mm -hmm. around this era where uh stanley like really has the his formula down where tie something up and you got to keep you got to keep the gravy train rolling in yeah so like the foswell story is like still going and i don't know how it resolved because i always thought of foswell as like a good guy so i don't know if they kind of he, he sh ends up being good in the end or what but. yeah and as you can imagine the way our story ends got your impact shot spidey is back to spite we are back to status quo mm -hmm. it's what you got to do in this old era of comics it almost there is a part of it that really does kind of read like the uh, the spidey daily strip yeah where like maybe something happens on a Sunday and the whole week's worth of strips is recapping what happened in that Sunday. And you add like one little piece and the, there's almost no momentum. Like a glacial piece. Um, seeing how um, Jameson keeps the Spider-Man costume behind glass in his office makes me think of Batman's uh, yeah. uh, Batcave where he's got like the Robin totally. costume and stuff. It's just like all this little these little flourishes that, that you can't help but think get like embedded in Miller's head and maybe even subconsciously as he's telling the Dark Knight story, these little things pop up. It does feel like so many of these panels are, they, they look iconic. Yeah. You know, and I think it's that Romita style that mm -hmm. man, they, they look, you know, you mentioned Lichtenstein. There's a lot of panels in here that I think you could just pull out and put on a wall. I guess that one part I that I was thinking one. is it's, it's not, it's, it's not, not in easy. here. Yeah. It, was, it must've been another issue where there was like some lady like, Hey, Spider-Man, he's a punk. Mm -hmm. get, get out of here blah 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 and then he he, he spider webs her face <laughs> i kind of remember that too <laughs> that might be in an annual yeah it's so coming weird. up and this panel it feels like that'd be right on an action figure package mm -hmm. yeah even the, the yellow background feels like the, the the toys of my childhood or something the side of like a car a toy a matchbox where they put like an image from, yeah, from like a there's a spider car. van mm -hmm. i just had to look because yeah. i because i swear I mean, there's so much of that stuff with these comics where, like, your memories implanting things. Uh, like, the other thing, talking about, like, Ditko and stuff, it's like, Ditko has all this great stuff. What's his weakness? Uh, the people look kind of weird. If, yeah. if you want, like, a, a beautiful girl, you're not going to get that. If you want a handsome guy, you're not going to get that. In, in a, so it's like, wow, it's Ditko, but with, like, good-looking people. Sure. Like, there's a winning formula right there. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing with Kirby. Same with Kirby, exactly. Yeah, smooth off some of those rough edges. You got a commercial. You got thing. you got a sexy guy, man. We'll have to do more stuff out of this folio edition. It's it's got some some key comics. Yeah, like some we nice can stuff. go right into Starenko, please, man. We got it. We got to do that stuff. But let's get the heck out of here. You okay. good? You good? That's a me? nice yeah. book. It, it, like I said, first time seeing it, and it's a really beautiful. Even the cover, I like that texture. Yeah, and, and it, it's, it's got nice. a big box that it, it's the silver age. So it has this big silver box that it comes in, and then it, it came with like a little. Uh, Fantastic Four number one replica. I just bought a uh, facsimile copy, you know, like with the silver, the silver border uh, Marvel reprint of uh, Fantastic Four five. First appearance of Doctor Doom, yeah. and in the letters page, there's a Roy Thomas, Roy Thomas letter. letter yeah. yeah, just from fandom. Anyhow, let's get the heck out of here. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, tell the people what's up. Street Angel, Deadly Girl Live, back in print after almost a year from Image Comics, collecting eight complete stories there of the uh, homeless ninja on a skateboard, perfect for any comics fan, especially a superhero or Spider-Man fan. And Hulk, Grand Design, Monster Madness, two 40-page uh, issues retelling the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk are in stores now with an oversized treasury edition coming first of next year. You can pre-order that now wherever you buy comics. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see lots more of my work. Talk about Treasury Editions. Yeah, we got the Fantastic Four Grand Design Treasury Edition. Um, I also have the Total Recall Show channel where every Thursday I'm reading an issue of Thor going through the whole series. And uh, we got Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And it's also October is Jacktober. Um, I have a, a series of drawing prompts, Jack Kirby-related drawing prompts for every day of the month and, and a wild card too.
<laughs> and check out my Patreon. Go to patreon.com. Search Tom Scholey. There should be Spider-Man since he's jacked over, you know, the Spider-Man. <laughs> Thwip. <laughs> Red Room. The Antisocial Network and Red Room Trigger Warnings. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. And both of these collections completely self-contained. They, they each contain four full stories. Uh, if you see one of these books in the wild, scoop it up no matter which one. If you dig it, grab the other. Uh, you can go to my Patreon today. Uh, for three bucks, you get the archive, which is all of this material, plus the stuff uh, that is going to come out in 2023. Uh, is being serialized right now. Three bucks. Can't beat it. More than 300 pages worth of stuff. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, fanny packs at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy. We'll be on our way. Read more comics. Let's stay in a spidey mood. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. We'll stay in a spidey mood. Yeah, Miller Spidey, Miller Doctor Strange. Yeah, man. A real sweet spot. As soon as these comics come out, I'm like ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't say anything. Just wait. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, save it for the air. You know, there was one thing in the uh in that Spidey issue. Like if I'm I might have accidentally read three you issues have, of, Sp yeah. of Spider Man, man. Uh but there was uh, something about I, I think it was during the gangster shit. Where they're talking about like let's let's get a meeting together like the Appalachian meeting yeah and uh, I I I just happened to like watch a whole documentary about that stuff mm -hmm. man you know that deal? it's like when J Edgar Hoover had to acknowledge the existence of the mafia it was like mafia leaders all over the country there was there's nine families five in New York and that's the hub turn off the camera yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they all converged on this one dude's crib to have like a big meeting at an estate and just randomly like the cops like one of these guys they drove from california or something and like ran his plates and was like oh this is so and so from california like let's see where he's going and then they go to the crib and there's all these out-of-state license plates at somebody who they suspect is like not on the up and up so literally like straight up street cops like like patrolmen uh discovered like all, all these crime lords like in one dude's crib having a meeting and it became a thing where like j edgar hoover finally had to like acknowledge the existence of the mafia and la cosa nostra and all that something just by accident and that's the appalachian meeting that, that happened like almost like a serial convention i'll tell you it's an interesting story because like uh hoover was denying the mafia he was and i think it's senator kefauver yeah who mm -hmm. who was publicly like no there's there's like on record he's he's acknowledging it when hoover's stance is like it doesn't exist and it was, I thought that was credited with what made Hoover have to acknowledge the mafia because, like, you had this senator that was super powerful. Right. You know, like, when he came after comics, it was a scary moment for comics because of who the dude was. Yeah. yeah very, you know, like, like, he was like a guy not beloved, well, I, no, terrifying. But, but he, he stood was, up to like, like, a hero, kind of. You know, he was like a hero figure. If you are down with McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, shit. right. But he wasn't backing down from anybody. Like, he stood up to yeah. the FBI I mean, whenever was it was. the 50s, you know. Yeah, Not too many people are doing when that. You, when you read that stuff, I feel like it's Hoover is like, it's kind of it's kind of strides. He he understood the strides and effect before there was a term for it. You know what I mean? Like, let's not talk about let's not excite kids about fucking trying to figure out how to join and shit. Like, oh no, it doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is with Hoover, it was different. He it was like collusion, like he was part of the you know. Like yeah, I I, I don't know enough about it to know, but I just I, I feel like I mean it was at odds with the senator and yeah. Mm -hmm. That Appalachian meeting. I'd much rather that senator fight with Hoover than right. fight with comics. <laughs> <laughs> that Appalachian meeting is what's referenced in The Godfather. Like, that's kind yeah. of what that yeah, meeting sure. is supposed to be like. You know? Yeah. Totally, man. Hit it whenever you're ready, Jimmy. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. Before we get to our video, got to let you guys know that we're doing a little bit of traveling in October. Uh, October 6th through 9th. CXC in Columbus, Ohio. Jimmy and I are going to be there signing comics, signing, signing comics, talking comics. Baltimore Comic Con at the end of the month, October 28th through 30th, we are going to be at Baltimore Comic Con doing our thing. And the Jacksonville Public Library, October 22nd, Jimmy's going to be in Florida for a zine festival. It is Kayfabe Tober, man. So the prompts are in effect. We pin them to our social media, to our Twitter, to our Instagram. Uh, hashtag us on 
uh, Instagram if you participate in Kayfabetober and at us on Twitter if you are doing some drawings. We'll share as many as possible. And let's jump right into things, fellas. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man Annual, number 14. We did, I think, 15 was the uh, Doc Ock story that Miller did, or maybe okay. it was 13. Uh, Frank Miller doing Doctor Strange, Doctor Doom, and Spider-Man. Magic, totally going full freaking Ditko yeah. uh, with, this, with this sucker. Yeah, Tom Palmer Sr. on inks here, which Super is Super noteworthy. Fun. Absolutely a, uh, noteworthy. The the late Tom Palmer, a great inker, one of my favorite inkers, and getting to see him on Miller is pretty interesting. Also, like these stories are so weird to me because they're a different era of comics. Yeah. You know, where Frank Miller's coming in and doing thirty five pages or so of Spider Man in an annual, like I don't know if there's an equivalent of this today. Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen eighty. So it's very early in uh, in Miller's run. Uh, these are Marvel comics, which suggests Marvel method. Mm-hmm which implies that we're going to get to see Frank Miller do some visual storytelling yeah. stuff and pace his work. It doesn't look like your average Spider-Man comic. Right. Joe Rose and the letterer are getting a show off a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, with this kind of ornate mm-hmm. script throughout. I'm shocked this um, Spider-Man character hasn't shown up in continuity. I in know, like right? <laughs> yeah, that thing is how... Here's a question, man. Is this the letterer or... Uh, or Miller, I wonder. Yeah, with the ornate stuff on the outside. I give it to the letter. Me too. I assume it's the letter. Yeah, but if 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 you say that, then is that the letter? Because that seems like a lot of the same shapes that Milton Glaser. Yeah, I, I I'd lean towards it being the penciler. I'd lean towards it being Miller. I bet the letter finishes it. Yeah, because sure. the letters yeah. would do borders. That was yeah. usually part of their job too, and I feel like that would fall under a border. You see these masks in Miller's work a lot. Yes. Yeah, I wonder what that comes from. Yeah, I think well, some of it's yeah. Japanese. They're definitely like the demons that you see in um, Ronin. Mm-hmm. And there's you see those masks and Electra lives again. And Denny O'Neill, you know, his uh, his editor at Daredevil. Yeah. So uh, those guys a long, long collaborative history. <laughs> this is such a Wallywood cast. Like that's the Wallywood Doctor Doom uh, solo series, you know. Oh, right, right, right. The way the castle's drawn. And, and seeing Tom Palmer on top of Frank Miller, like, absolutely noteworthy, especially in scenarios like this, because mm-hmm. we know what the Thunder approach is with enough Gene Cola and Tomb of Dracula images. So it's cool to see what Tom Palmer's bringing to the table with, with stuff like this, man. Good good guy for some moody atmosphere. And that's the Dark Knight Returns lightning strike. You know? <laughs> Got some Latverian shenanigans about to go down with this little igor type character oh i love all the shadow on dr doom yeah that's really really hardcore very ominous one thing that uh, tom palmer is known for is kind of bringing serpents into prominence using it a lot in his ink work uh for, for marvel and we're going to see a lot of approaches uh very limited sets of tools the cartoonists were able to employ in these old newsprint comics so you get it in where you can fit it in. And whenever there's these energetic approaches, Tom Palmer is showing up and uh, creating a space for that, man. 100% yellow background with the uh, 100% magenta sitting on top to create that kind of you know, bright red. I'd like to see what the uh, original pages look like because it, it, do you do that on a piece of vellum? Mm-hmm. I would think that would make it the easiest. Yeah. And it feels like... Like you say, Palmer's got a lot of experience with this, so probably. And and, and and we say that because Palmer is inking what is read here in black, so you can't yeah. separate that from yeah, if you want the to get figure those work lines of, right of the character. Sometimes we talk inside baseball a little too too inside. Got to got to spell it out a little bit more. Uh, one of the things with Marvel Method is that uh, you kind of have to anticipate and allow s- space for the, the the writer to put put his stuff in there. And I think that it was fully intentional on Miller's part that, like, you know, you do a little bit here and, and you create that separation. Like, this character is in an abyss mm-hmm. right here. But I think he was, like, allowing some space for some lettering to happen. And, and, and Denny O'Neill just didn't, didn't show up. Because this is very left heavy. Yeah, we see that in the Wolverine uh, that he does with Chris Claremont, where there's, like, these weird white... But it kind of creates a new aesthetic that's yeah. kind of interesting. The difference with this page is, like, what what you're talking about with the with the um, Wolverine's pieces? Every single page he allows some negative space. Mm-hmm. The but it would usually be like the panel would cut off here. It wouldn't be a right. big chunk mm-hmm. of a panel. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, but it is something. Anything you can do to make things a little different, like it, I, 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 I don't dislike it. Like I, I like it, and I like seeing this glimpse of Ditko space by, by way of Miller. Miller and Ditko, like they go together so well. There's so much Ditko in Miller. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Especially, Beautiful. especially when he leans into it with with yeah. Spider Man. So, guys, keep this in mind. You see, this is like. A, a magical binding this isn't like a piece of metal that this mm -hmm. guy's tied to this is a magical binding so that is what frank miller pretty much will pencil in for some things that we're going to see later and you'll see a different approach by tom palmer with the way that that magic is is, is handled there yeah this is a pretty awkward moment too doom is watching films of hitler right and i feel like you have doom and dormammu teaming up and you put Hitler in there, and it's really like that's an awkward fit. It is. How about this piece right here? If you were looking at at the issues, there's there's a uh, half page ad for a band called Shrapnel from Salute Records that has a song out called Combat Love, and it's the guys from Shrapnel with Spidey in an ad. You could literally send away to Salute Records for for a copy of the thing, and this ad Frank Miller art is it? It's yeah, I guess so. Oh yeah, Whoa. right. Yeah. Joseph Rubenstein on the inks on that, and then it's going to segue into a comer a couple of pages of, co there, yeah. of commercial for for the shrapnel mm -hmm. band that, as far as I saw, could tell, a pretty low fight. Mm -hmm. Like they must have been just hanging out with Denny O'Neill, or, or like <laughs> there's some weird story there. If the kayfabe audience has any info on that, I'm very curious because it's very glare glaring. Yeah, I mean the guy from there went on to be part of like a more famous band, and he wrote some song that like gets referenced in a in a another like negasonic are they the band that we're gonna see they yeah they are, are the band. they're a real band they are they're a real band oh so man this i did not ad, connect that ad yeah see shrapnel like this ad segues into co comics content of this issue like it, there's there's a story there that we don't know so yeah, yeah al milgram the drummer or something <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying man some of jrjr's favorite band at the discotheque uh yeah so we got the hitler piece and it's it sort of it, i started to think like uh you know you get you get Hiroshima Nagasaki, and then you get you get Akira many years later. Uh, is the idea of like the guy who takes over the world does that happen with Hitler? But then I'm like, no, there's Genghis Khan, there's there's Alexander of Ma Macedon and stuff. So like, it doesn't come from there. But uh, yeah, anyhow, it's a strange thing to see going back through an issue. You know, going into a back issue like this, that's an odd panel. <laughs> right. I mean, if you read a lot of like 60s comics and and like wally wood and stuff like that at like every other issue the villain takes his mask off and it's hitler you know like you know or or you know and especially marvel i mean you had all that like red skull stuff and whatever so it's not it, yeah it's not and and the red skull where he's got his little island with like his like Mussolini guy and all this kind of stuff. it's 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 pretty much a, an established part of marvel it's just like okay now we're in the 80s so you know once again, an, another uh, inked approach with the the magic here, with uh, our little Igor, or our Urzat's Igor character, uh, and I bring it up just because we'll we'll see some crazy looking uh, Tom Palmer stuff in later parts of this issue. That's a pretty badass image right there. It is. Like, like I don't think Doctor Strange ever looked cooler. Well. It is this like a tryout for Miller's Doctor Strange? Because he was going to do a Doctor Strange series. Yeah, there like were ads for it. Yeah, ads for it. So is that what we're seeing here? Because, and again, what a lost opportunity. I mean, obviously he did a lot of cool stuff instead of that. But man, a Miller Doctor Strange. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting what if in comics mm -hmm. history. And it might have come out of this. Maybe he leaves here going, you know what? I have more to do on this character. This, this is a very well lit mm -hmm face man i like there, there's a reference that was used for this and and, and tom palmer bringing like years of work with colin at this point i was gonna say finishing a lot of a lot of palmer on that face yeah yeah i was looking at this and, and uh frank, sounds dirty <laughs> frank, frank miller created the the todd mcforland chains mm -hmm. you know you see it right there and those are heavy chains like the characters interacting with each link right there he's bound up and dude this is like the kayfabe mailbag. Like, just he's got stuff coming in that, he, that like, yeah. What is this? You know, it's all surprises. And and for us, it might be, you know, some issues of Deadline magazine. But for <laughs> Doctor Strange, he's getting mummies in the mail unsolicited. Right. Well, this is um, Citizen Kane too, where he has all those like big wooden crates full of statues. And whenever Miller can like keep somebody's face in shadow, 
he goes there. You know? that, that feels like a Ditko approach. Yeah. A lot of obscured faces in Ditko comics. And and the, the Spider-Man um, and Doctor Strange team up in an annual is a Ditko thing, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That guy on loose, he's got the black light. So they held true with that. But look at this stuff that mm -hmm. Palmer is bringing to the mix, man. You have to have like a wide area to work with uh, if you're going to do something like this, man, because you have to allow for a lot of room for error yeah. of like registration mm -hmm. slipping and things. But seeing these big chunky lines with no holding line, that does feel magical. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's pretty cool. There was some of this in that Spider-Man Fantastic Four comic mm -hmm. that you guys reviewed a while back. Right, right. And I love the black light mm -hmm. concept. I yeah. think that's one that's really good. Like you're, you're working with a limited tool set that's a pretty good use. That that's a Ditko thing too. I, I mean, I think maybe like a purple would have read in a really cool way that like the black doesn't quite. You know. And you could do that with Serpent. It would be hundred percent magenta, hundred percent cyan. Ha has that very like dark purple color. Choreography on the part of uh, sure. Miller, something that he's totally known for. Man, we got the we got the bad guy kind of splitting up our dudes with. Uh, Doctor Strange being the tank, capturing all the attention of the bad guy. Well, this dude, what's his name, Wang or something like that? Wong. Wong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good action shot of Doctor Strange diving out of the way and like counter magic beams. Yeah, and look at that dude. That feels like something Miller must be drawing, right? Or yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He he draws it in pencil. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like the stuff that we saw earlier, uh, it was just. Uh, Tom, Tom Palmer deciding to use a black line on like the small pieces probably knowing that you have to allow room for that registration to slip but when you have these big moments there's no reason to have that black line yeah and it really feels like energy I remember like maybe like the first week at the Kubert school like I had this solved for me because I had mm -hmm. no idea like how that was done yeah. and it was such a mystery to me and I had some teachers explain that stuff to me Really like this panel. Yeah. You get a cross section of the house, so you get a little bit of your exterior New York shot. Water, got to have water a water tower in there. Yeah, yeah and uh, if I had any advice for Doctor Strange, man, it's like maybe gracefully sit sit down on the ground <laughs> before you leave your body. Because that guy, when you jump back in that body, it might be... Paralyzed. Yeah, it might be a Twilight Zone episode. Dude, that's Austin getting dropped on his head by Owen Hart right there. Totally. That's a bad way to fall. Yeah. But beautifully dramatic. Yes, very dramatic. It's all about the drama. Good moments of uh, astral astral version of Doctor Strange mm -hmm. being white, you know, again, using the limited tools that you get in a comic book at this era, but effective. Yeah, yeah, you see the Ditko in that face right there. Totally. Part of it is that, uh, you know, that old joke, uh, if you could see three whites around the side of somebody's eyes, they got the crazy eyes. Like, uh, when you pinhole those pupils and you allow space for all four sides of that pupil that that's a dicko stroke that's something that he brought to uh his his artwork something that you could was common with this stuff manson lamps <laughs> using yellow serpent mm -hmm. for uh this kind of like a thought energy astral projection eisner window right in the middle of your page you're right man eisner window with a gil Kane <laughs> like final piece with ditko energies those really feel like it too, and that's got to be Palmer thinking that way because they're inked with kind of a fat line. Yeah, yeah. It feels like a Ditko era yeah. line treatment. When, when Ditko sort of comes back to Marvel and is doing work there, the inkers are like bending over backwards to make it into like prime time Ditko, you know? Yeah. Whenever I would see this as a kid, I was so literal with the imagery that mm -hmm. I saw, and this stuff would always like fuck me up. Like, oh, so he just like turns into spider-man like mm -hmm. yes, i like, didn't understand the implication burn marks that <laughs> yeah come out. that's a fun page is a nine panel grid there's a lot going on in there another big ditko piece and uh, i don't remember deb at all from anything is she either. an ongoing character at some i, some, I don't know yeah. but she looks with those glasses she looks very ditko-esque and then debbie i'm just thinking like debbie harry you know like that that's that's the person in the moment here i like yeah unbelievable the way this spider-man's drawn the background but just the way he's drawn kind of blew my mind with that like rim lighting around it. and it's it's a nice way to not have to draw every web but it, it looks so great it's it's you, amazing you feel the page. volume yeah because you allow the white for that rim lighting from the thunder uh but from the lightning but then uh tom palmer's using zip 
like he uses zip here to great effect. That's the zip, yeah. Are you shocked and it's the same deal. that he doesn't use a, a second color? It looks like, like it's a, a lighter color. Yeah, a white or a yellow, I would accept mm -hmm. there, is like your outside lighting, you know, almost an outline. Because like the way that's that's drawn, it is that usual like double lighting style. Yeah. It looks amazing, but yeah. I'm surprised they didn't do that. The, the, thankfully, he has that zip there, right? Mm -hmm. To create two colors. A second color, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is that old maxim where you have to get it to work in black and white because perhaps when you bring the color into it, it's hard to fuck up. Yeah, maybe. There's a lot like like that's a heck of an image, man. You could you could color that two or three different ways and it'd be very effective. And this perspective on the buildings, I mean, there are guys, Joe Quesada, you know, that really use that a lot. It looks incredible there for at, a two page spread. At this level too, it's all directional devices mm -hmm. pointing directly yeah. to great stuff. Our guy with this kind of spread, man. Before we get out of here, we gotta let you guys know that our books are brought to you. We got to let you know that our videos are brought to you by the books that we make. Tommy has Fantastic Four Grand Design, Jack Kirby, Epic Life of the King of Comics out there uh, in the wild as we speak. And his name is on the spine of dozens of other books, man. So make sure you check out his bibliography. Jimmy has Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness issues out on the stands right now. But it's going to get that big Treasury Edition format like Hulk Grand Design. and I mean, like Fantastic Four Grand Design, X-Men Grand Design in early 2023. Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive trade paperback is back in print. So make sure you scoop it up. Uh, don't lag this time, man, because it was out of print for a little while, but there's no excuse right now. Red Room Trigger Warnings and the Anti-Social Network are the current things that I'm working on. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Each book is completely self-contained, so if you see one of these, give it a try. Check it out. Support Cartoonist Kayfabe that way. Now let's get back to the video, dude. This pose right here continues the energy, okay. man. Like this, the bounce of this, Feels like lessons uh, that like Joe Mad took away, Art Adams took away. Uh, in some of your work, Tom, uh, maybe some American Barbarian, I was paying attention to the way that like a back view of a character with arms back and how mm -hmm. those like shoulder blades get close. Like you're right, you're yeah. so good at that, man. And that is a that is a well built figure right there. In classic color theory, right? Yellow and purple being your complementary colors there to make that yellow character foreground pop. Genius. You're going to see from here on out the way Miller plays, like with his use of shadow and, and absence of, of line, what he does with Spider-Man. And it's it's like a Spider-Man I've never seen before, other than here. When you see these gargoyles right there, I'm imagining Frank Miller's using that side of the pencil mm -hmm. like this to create the kind of... Uh, gravelly textures and think about gargoyles like in his body of work like in the the batman stuff and you know do you guys think that miller does this two-page spread because he does this quite a bit in different comics too uh is a way to kind of like gimmick ad treatments and page turns because like you have to run this as a two-page ad if you're editorial yeah yeah and you know like you hear about cartoonists in the past that would do tricks to like manipulate the engravers and stuff like hey i got fine lines so you can't over expose this or whatever it feels like this is one to kind of like, like maybe manipulate with your storytelling a little bit right great water tower <laughs> <laughs> again like ditko miller water towers i'm so impressed when you see a three panel page in this era uh especially this layout you know like that that's one of those that's built on that six panel grid but you see it now and then very and well composed cool. image yeah well, we're getting close to ronin here we are there's a few Ronanisms. Mm -hmm. Some of the demons in the Dormammu area where there's a bunch of those little demons, they remind me of moments from Ronan. It's so funny seeing like the, the Ronan stuff, the, the um, Sin City stuff, you know, it, it pops up here and there. Straight up Bigfoot cartooning, you know, like whenever he would do this sort of thing, like in mm -hmm. Sin City Hell and Back or somewhere, it's inter characters interacting with uh, Dr. Seuss. Yeah. You know, this is big, Bigfoot cartooning, little headless uh, demons. Love this, too. We t I mentioned Will Eisner window a minute ago. Like, you see Eisner talks about using windows as, like, a panel border. Let's use the most iconic window in the Marvel Universe as, like, a panel frame device. Is this the one where you I were? I found it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we Somebody were, gets smacked in the face. Yeah, we were, we were talking uh, Spider-Man 50, and I was like, where, where the hell did I see a sequence where a lady gets slapped in the face? Props to Dennis O'Neill for setting up that gag, too. Like, so really, good. really put some words in her mouth. We're all cheering for her to shut up. <laughs> There's the Marvel Method working for you. And here's where the Marvel Method falls apart. Yes. This sequence here, he's battling with all these little demons, and it's making them act weird. And we, we realize that nobody else... It's in his else, head. It's in, in his head. Nobody else can see those demons but him. So kids see him, and they think, oh, he's breakdancing. That new dance craze that's sweeping <laughs> the nation. But 
it gets fucked up by in the writing because the writing they act as if they do see those and they're like what are those muppets but they shouldn't be able to see those they should just be able to see spider-man breakdancing yeah real dumb super dumb how about that yeah. dude that that's big a, hole. another good coloring on spider-man there too yeah mm-hmm. that's that choice to do solid color on him that we've seen a couple times it is unconventional and mm-hmm. it's it usually works in this comic and you think about like a Spider-Man people are familiar with. If you're watching the Spider-Man cartoon and maybe Spider-Man and, Amaz- and his amazing friends comes along a little bit after this, maybe. But that's how he is in the Spider-Man cartoon. There's not webs covering that's everything. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah that old backy shit. Yeah. I love this three panel sequence. That just works for me on every level. The silhouette Spider-Man's on either side. That man, that magenta yellow in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just breaking up that magenta with these blue treatments. They're really going for it with color. You know, even this next page, those top two panels are a lot of color on uh, weird colors. And some, and some more of that serpent stuff. And you, and you see the registration slip, which is, mm-hmm. you know, Inevitable. how things can pot- pot- potentially get dicey. And is this guy, like, may- maybe he was intended to be, like, a relative of Doc Ock or something? Because he's, like, sick on the tea. Right, yeah. He's got the haircut, the glasses. Now we get the ad. <laughs> right, yeah. Taking a place at CBGB's. yeah. Uh, for shrapnel, we saw the ad earlier. Let's see the ad payoff, man. And it's like uh, a theme band, a, co- a concept group. Yeah. And everything is about uh, enemy lines, and they have they have uh, weapons and bombs. They're like an early '80s guar. Right. <laughs> I like the coloring on this spread too. And it's Frank Miller, like you know he. He's a, he's an old cuss, man. He's reading Mickey Spillane books. He ain't going down to CBGB's to go see <laughs> Richard Hell and television play. So what is CBGB's to him? All darkness. Great silhouettes and a great like little romantic comedy moment. Absolutely, in, in man. With you know juxtaposed with uh, George C. Scott at the beginning yeah, yeah. of Patton with I like the background the way they imagery, faded the colors, you know, on the on the red, white, and blue. We know that that ain't the right lettering right there. Man, you mentioned Doc Ock and like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And so Shrapnel is like Pied Pipering the CBGB's attendance uh, throughout the Bowery. And it sounds like it has a little bit of a pull on Spider-Man too, but maybe his powers or whatever helps him. Res- He's like, there's something very compelling about that song they're playing. <laughs> and he keeps blowing off that, uh, that Deb. First, yeah, they were yeah. supposed to go to CBGB's, and they didn't. And then they're supposed to go get coffee, and he's like, oh, uh, I got to I gotta run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You always got to inject that piece in every yeah. Spider-Man comic. And look at this. It's a straight-up, like, blitzkrieg of soldiers for the shrapnel army of uh, Doctor Doom. Yeah, it makes you uh, – the, the callback to Doctor Doom watching the Hitler films yeah. in a weird way, like, it, it kind of ties into the sequence. Yeah, because there is that, like, square thing, like that famous footage whenever they take over France – now imagine um, this story. It would have been so easy to take that romance element, like to maybe not even think of the romance element, but it needs that. That's like Spider-Man. That, yeah, that's Spider-Man. That's that's the Marvel formula. If you if you take those like romance comics out of the equation, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, yeah. You got to give does, them some. Yeah, it makes it very human. Like if you're reading this as a kid that is not Spider-Man, has no powers, that part you can relate to, where it's like, man, he's messing up so bad with this mm-hmm. girl, like over and over. Why is she ever going to speak to this dude again? I feel like the El Jefe part, like that, that was put in there by uh, Frank Miller, on the uh, marquee. You gotta love it when he does like Times Square. Yeah, the, the signs and stuff. The Coca Cola, you never get away with now. We've seen a lot of uh, his interpretations of this kind of thing uh, in the Wolverine miniseries. It would be all serpent, mm-hmm. and it would be the colorist, or well, who knows who it yeah. is, but. It would all just be colored lights and things. This is a really strange choice around Spider-Man's eyes to make the too. black part blue. Blue, yeah. Cool, though. Trying it, some things. It just things. feels like experimenting, right? Yeah, yeah, trying some stuff, man. I love the fixed camera angle stuff when, when, yeah. when shit goes down. And here is a bound uh, Doctor Strange inside of a crystal. You know, seeing this Spider-Man treatment, it does make you wonder, like, what if Marvel gives Miller Spider-Man? Like, DC yeah. basically gives him Batman because this is the this is the intellect, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is this is kind of Miller separate from like most of your your job guys is like okay, let's see what haven't we seen before. Let's see how yeah. this works. Let's try some stuff. Makes you wonder what he does a year or two on on a book like Spider Man. Yeah. In the wow. past couple of years, man, like he did a Spider Man piece. You know how he'll just mm-hmm. on in a studio just show yeah. off these pieces and like he's co- continually continuing to innovate. Yeah, you've never seen anything character. like that. Not at all. Before, yeah. 
hanging from the webs, okay. and, and the webs are all in a straight, almost like a piece of graph paper. Hey, man, go back a second. Yeah. Where, what's Spider-Man standing on in these panels? Like, what is this? Yeah, it's like a question. giant cactus or something. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, here he's on this pipe, but is that the same thing? As yeah, this? it's like these weird chimney yeah, things. So. Yeah. Some industrial chimney. It's I'm not, not like sure this one works. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one's not going to not gonna draw a lot of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and look at these CBGBs guys, man, doing performance art class. <laughs> I am a blade of grass. I feel like this is a Kirby reference. I feel like I've seen that in, like, maybe New Genesis or, you know, something Got to, got to dispatch the black light villain and see it's that incremental thing where you go with the creation then you got to go against igor and then it's like dr doom and and this uh guy who's doing all this stuff he went into business for himself yeah. dr doom didn't want him to do any of this right all this hot magenta hot reds look at these man dude it's like uh batter mixers <laughs> And, and they're getting nasty. Before when we saw them, they were just kind of smooth. Now they got some spikes on them. Yeah. That's Continuing that treatment that's a right good, there. That's a nice Doctor Strange concept. And those, like, yeah, it's beautiful. And those hands, like, I'm trying to think where he got those, like, that one going like that. Because I feel like somebody... You see did. that with, like, Frank Brunner. Yeah. And those dudes that, that did mm -hmm. those 70s uh, Doctor Strange yeah, comics. Right. When he goes to these vertical panels in this sequence, I think it's very effective, too. We yeah. haven't seen that much, this issue, if at all. Well, and there's something about that that's, like, speedy. You know, it changes the, the, the tempo. tempo. And it works so well for superheroes who are doing all their action in the sky, in a city where everything's vertical. It sets this up. You yeah. know, because, like, you, you, your last panel there is basically that vertical drop into the crystal. Ooh, double serpents, baby. <laughs> Cyan's and magentas. It's the it's the warring powers yeah. lightsabers, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so cool. I wonder if like when Palmer does it, he kind of can't wait to see the issue. Right. Like like let's see how that turned out. I wonder if these guys even got comps back. Then. <laughs> yeah, the time delay is so weird. And if you were doing a couple of monthly books like a Palmer would be doing, who knows? How about these serpent hostess Twinkie heads, <laughs> man? Like like with, it's just all colors, totally muddy. <laughs> and then you got your typical spider-man ending man saves the day mm -hmm. helps doc strange out in a big bad way uh doc strange will do anything to repay him spider-man asks a very simple question what was the bar sinister the ben sinister the ben sinister and he doesn't get an answer and I, hopefully somebody in the audience maybe know, like is that some lovecraft reference or something like what's the like i understand it's this bad thing that's supposed to happen but is it referencing something specific right and then spider-man he can't win throws a little tantrum splits off look at all those uh splinters i like that they do this panel twice where yes. it's like this is like the freeze frame yeah you know. yeah real smart so there it is man Frank Miller going full Steve Ditko. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's the complete issue. Yeah. Uh -huh. You think of the annuals now and it'll be like three or four stories. Well, maybe not now. Maybe in the 90s when I was yeah. buying annuals. But to get like complete uh, full issue worth of Miller, pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, uh, the Stan, Stan and Steve, man, they, I feel like they set the template. When you get Spider-Man Annual 1 and it's the Sinister Six and you're mm -hmm. a cool splash page of of Spidey dispatching every major villain, like that, that sets a high bar. For the rest of your uh, Spidey annuals, and man, the color holds on the on the cover. You know? Absolutely, even a dicier one, man, the green. Well, no, because you got a hundred percent. That's just blue. Yeah, it's just a cyan. Smart. Yeah, we've done a couple of these annuals lately, and it's it's interesting to see like there are some real standout stories spread around these annuals. If mm -hmm. you know uh, which ones to go dig out, yeah. you mentioned Ditko earlier, and like I have that Avengers where it's I think it's Ditko pencils and burned yeah. inks. There's a lot of uh, kind of noteworthy stuff in some of those older annuals. It's true. And uh, not the last annual we'll be looking at on the Kayfabe channel. Kayfabe is like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, let the people know. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live. Pick it up now. Back in print after almost a year. Eight complete stories, full color. Uh, get your money's worth. If you like Spider-Man, you should like Street Angel. It's a young hero uh, bouncing around, fighting ninjas, all that good stuff. Hulk, Grand Design, Monster Madness. In stores now and coming to stores in an oversized edition in first of next year. So pre-order that wherever you get your books and join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg to see lots more of my comics and art. Tell them draw some science, man. We got Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. We got Fantastic Four Grand Design. 
uh, check out my Patreon, uh, check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. We're, we're going to start back up doing new episodes in October. And also on that channel, I have Thursday comics. Every Thursday, I'm re reviewing uh, a new issue of Thor, going through the whole series. So join me there. Red Room Trigger Warnings, Red Room the Antisocial Network, Trade Paperback are my latest efforts in stores uh, today. Uh, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Each book is completely self-contained, uh, as hardcore as the cover imagery. If you could stomach that, you'll dig the interiors. Uh, Serialized new Red Room comics on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks gets get you the archive there. That's all of this uh, material plus new stuff. More than 300 pages for three, three bucks. You can't beat that with a baseball bat. Jimmy? Let them know uh, what else we have out there, man. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merch, and fanny packs at our spread shop in the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Read more comics. I like Ben Mara popping in here. How oh, is he in there? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like that's a new one for him. He asked if that was Frank Miller on art. So oh, uh, yeah. one, one of the Miller books he may not know. It's so much fun discovering a Frank Miller you didn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't I don't know if there's any left for me. I know I, what you I mean. Might have stopped, but <laughs> every now and then one comes up. You're like, Frank awesome. Miller know it all. <laughs> you, you got you got that uh, that Mar the Marvel team up where uh, Matt Murdock joins S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, early. That, that's an early one. That and was they're a all playing cards. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, I discovered that one not too, maybe like five years ago or something. That's a that's a recent one for me. That was a kayfabe effect one that Jimmy brought to the table. I had no idea. Yeah, about. I think that might have been a hero somebody brought up to me. It also got reprinted like maybe in the early '90s, late '80s again. That's what we would hear in comments. Mm -hmm. You know, I think like probably all of, of uh, Miller's Marvel work has been reprinted in some collection or another. Yeah. So this kind of stuff to me is. It's about it's about the art. I didn't read this uh -huh. thing all that deep. I mean, you know, I'm into the stories in this thing, and and like a single Hulk issue, like the way it's like a satisfying unit of comics. Yeah, yeah, really... yeah. Save, save it, yeah, sure. save it. I said it. It's, here. it's, it's forever. <laughs> That's true. I'm handling things differently now that we're uh, Big Brothers watching. <laughs> There's meta. Yeah. There's meta elements I, I, to the kayfabe channel. I'm, I'm the guy saying save it for the air, usually. Right, right. This is still on camera. Beautiful. Yeah, it looks good. I'm going to pull out this for uh, just a minute to kind of compare the coloring on it. Yeah, Because look at the variations yes. of those two things. Fucking trash, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look at how Beautiful. shitty that is. Do you have an? Uh, do you have a Hulk one? Like, you know how they said that the gray was weird? Like, do, oh. can we see what that looks like? I guess so, huh? We'll, we'll find out if this is like Stanley bullshit. If the gray is actually mm. perfect, yeah. Look, look for one. Look, it looks great. Yeah. What's wrong about that? These are doctored a little bit, though. I probably. I, I, I doubt it. Like, huh? Yeah, I mean, you still get the point across. Like, well, the levels are definitely adjusted on the scan. Well, sure, but he was saying. But that's set that clear. Yeah, he was saying the gray was all over the map. It would be like black in one, purple in another, green in a, you know. So maybe I'm not right there. It. A little yellow there. I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you got that. That's miscoloring. Yeah, though. I mean that's not a gray misprint. Man, look at that. that man, that's what a iconic. beautiful. I, I've, I've never seen this issue in its original yeah. form. Fashion needs to do one of those deluxe uh, reprints. They, I mean, Folio. The, the has gray a Hulk does look pretty volume. good throughout there. So I don't know. Folio editions has a Hulk, and I think it comes with issue one, like a like a little replica. Yeah, you, you're 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 on that tip, huh? I did not go for the Hulk one because I got so much of that Hulk stuff already it kind yeah of, I, I didn't feel like I needed it but it's tempting yeah this is this is something you gave to me is it okay yeah Jim um you could do a tax write-off <laughs> buying the Hulk uh, folio edition you could write that off you know that's true that's true we got this YouTube channel man we could write yeah, any of that shit off yeah. Welcome to the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. Going to be looking at uh, Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby collaborating. But first, Jimmy and I are going to be at CXC in Columbus, Ohio, October 6th through 9th. We're going to be at the Baltimore Comic Con the 28th through the 30th uh, doing Cartoonist Kayfabe business, man. Can't wait to meet you there. And Jimmy's going to be in a Jacksonville Public Library for Zine Fest October 22nd. In October, that is Kayfabe-tober. 
through your drawing prompts, man. Uh, make sure you hashtag us on Instagram and at us on Twitter. We'll be able to see all your stuff that way and uh, repost as much of that stuff as possible. You guys are super creative and can't wait to see what kind of art you generate from these drawing prompts. So it's one of those great weeks where we have Tom completing the Pittsburgh Holy Trinity of comic book makers. The grand designers. The grand yes. designers, if you will. <laughs> Incredible Hulk number two, collaboration between Jack Kirby on pencils and storytelling and Steve Ditko on those inks. Yeah, and before we go too deep, I did want to show off like a, like an earlier, you know, like the original color. This one's a little bit different because it's on my screen, but you can kind of see like just how different they do with their recoloring. Man, it's a uh, talk about a different treatment, you know, in these recolored editions. We complain about them anytime we show them, I think. And, and I feel like a broken record at times complaining mm -hmm. about yeah. them. But you can see the dramatic difference yeah. uh, you and know, be, between these two. And beyond the lens flare, stuff like that, it's literally just clarity sake. Yeah. You know, you don't need to have this blue foreground thing against this purple background mm -hmm. thing. You solve it that way. Like the, the OG guys, they solve that for you. It is a limited color palette that it that they work with. And we talk about 64 colors, but realistically, like we're looking at about 20, 20 colors, 20 something maybe, like that. Yeah. And they learn how to make it sing on that newsprint. And so to recolor that stuff that's all built for a certain model, um, you know, we compare it to music a lot. If the stuff is mastered for, for vinyl and then you put it on CD, it mm -hmm. sounds different. And you see like just worlds of difference between these two treatments now jim when you're working on hulk grand design this is how you're reading all this stuff you have like files that you're i have both okay. i have boxes of hulk okay. comics and uh yeah digital copies mm -hmm. of a lot of it so working on both yeah so just for the purposes of this video we'll use this uh masterwork thing did that one have um the signature because sometimes the signature gets deleted in those old ones and then brought back and it did one. have a signature but it doesn't have ditko's signature as part of it okay. yeah, yeah this, this one doesn't look like it either and that's the cool thing uh when you see this because you see both hands at play yeah throughout these pages man you see you clearly see ditko in there but it's the bombast of kirby it's the pacing of kirby and in terms of visual storytelling man you know ha having having dinner with uncle howard shaking in town and he's talking about visuals for storytelling value is what art and comics is about and that is the marvel method man mm -hmm. that is what the great marvel method uh pencilers and artists brought to the table is every single image is pushing the story forward so and kirby's already a master at that stuff now we get to have the steve ditko finish Fantastic mashup. Yeah, Stan Lee said Steve Ditko was his favorite inker on Kirby. You know, yes, he did. You know. um, and look at this. like It's the Hulk as like a horror concept. Yeah. Seeing all this reaction and like the terror that people have when like Hulk's in town. Yeah, I mean, it, this is an early Silver Age Marvel comic, and it is still a vestige of the monster comic. The innovation, the innovation is that you just, it's just not you know, Groot on one page, one six pager and, yeah. you know, Fin Fang Foom on the next seven pager. It's just Hulk. Yeah. The full book aspect is a big thing. And then the continuing story with continuing characters is like yeah. another big, which they establish with fantastic. And this Four. is really that continuation of the monster stuff with like your aliens mm -hmm. as being a part of the story, you yeah. know, just issue two. Yeah. And we're already going into that, that and it, formula. And it's total like lost in space, zipper up the back kind of uh, alien costumes, outer limits, now, um, t in story terms, like thematically, we have the Hulk, uh, maybe not green at this point or whatever, but green in our minds. And they have these like toad men, kind of, they're, they're almost like a mirror of the Hulk. And a yeah. lot of the ways they behave in this are kind of like holding up a mirror to the Hulk. The way they talk, the way they, the, the smack they talk and how they're going to make everybody pay. It's like we're, see we're seeing Hulk held up to a mirror. So uh, the MacGuffin to get Hulk to be Hulk I don't think it's a fully established as just anger. It's it's when the sun goes down. Yeah, it's like That's werewolf right. stuff. Yeah, and it's it's uh it's it's clear it's totally a Mister Hyde thing too. Like when I look at the early Hulk pre color and stuff, and you just like imagine it without the yeah. color, like it kind of he could just be a flesh guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like just like a big brawny flesh Mister Hyde kind of character. Did you guys see that monster at midnight story? It was like a monster story that they did a little bit prior to this uh jack kirby and stan lee and it it's jack it's like a jekyll and hyde and it takes place in like a london you know 1800s or whatever thing 
and it's like a hair's breadth away from Hulk. And then like a couple months later, they do the Hulk and just bring him into the 60s. You know? So Bruce Banner and uh, Rick Jones, they need to figure out a way to suppress the Hulk wh whenever he uh, turns heel at nighttime. So they found this kind of bunker that they're going to be able to push a cinder block, yeah. a brick wall. To just keep them ten, yeah, ten, in. ten foot thick cement wall. I, I love that, and it visual. just takes one guy to like right. turn turn it to to move this thing that's got to weigh a hundred times. <laughs> I was reading this, rereading this this week, and I was just thinking, like, could you imagine if you're trapped behind that thing? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not sure you could move that wall. No. I don't know if there's a tool that you could cut through it or anything. You got to get that e that Elon Musk submarine thing. And imagine if a villain got a hold of this while the Hulk's in there and he just kept turning the crank to get that thing to That'd like smash him. That'd be really good. You could tell that Rick Jones is plucky because he goes like this with his hat <laughs> brim. Yeah. yeah, he's part of the young generation. <laughs> Bruce Banner wouldn't think to do that. Would you pick out Ditko's inks if you didn't know it? Yes. Uh, yeah. On, I, on, various, on various pieces. Uh, that's a Ditko drawing, yeah. right? That's yeah, cool. does look like it. And and that's what you get. You you see both hands, mm -hmm. you know, like that looks Kirby-ish. It's interesting how much Ditko inks these bodies in sort of like big full lines or solid blacks. But when we get into the faces, you get to see the hatching. It's almost like, uh, you know, just, I don't know, a different approach to faces. And I think, a he's, a, I think he's a pen guy. So, mm -hmm. so we get to see what Kirby looks like with penmanship rather than like the, the thick, chunky brush inkers like a Chick Stone or like a Joe Sinnott who had that very deft hand with the sable hair. This is like 102 type shit. We got some Kirby motifs, like a city that's pulled up, almost like Asgard or whatever, but he'll have like big chunks of city pulled up with like rock underneath. We got the um, the, the oceans being drained, like that um, OMAC double page spread. Like Kirby's doing like the tiny version of all this stuff. He's going to like expand later. <laughs> Hulk with a gun. <laughs> be still my heart a ma magnetic gun <laughs> turning it against his captors and hulk is like such a myth misanthrope in these stories like he's just a nasty guy he wants to hurt people and yeah you know they talk like uh when peter david does the gray hulk and mr fix its personality is different than the green hulks it kind of goes back to this one mm -hmm. although it also seems justified because humans are just they mess with him non-stop <laughs> and the hulk is even like I've got control of this spaceship. I'm going to rain death on humanity. <laughs> and he doesn't. Like, he turns into Bruce Banner in time to not do that. But then that's what Bruce Banner gets arrested for. You were about to rain death on all of us. Do you realize how insane that is from, like, the, uh, the government point of view where it's like, if Banner did build this spaceship, maybe we should focus on, like, the scientist that acts like he works with us and he's built this spaceship like mm -hmm. there's some technology to exploit here yeah, yeah just yeah. like we're, john carpenter's the thing we're, we're we're beyond uh operation paperclip where we <laughs> took the nazi guys so you know you were just born in saskatchewan or something like uh, we can deal with you but the, the constant mcguffin of of uh ah oh, bruce bruce banner you bastard yeah he's you did always that. in trouble and it it takes a while to dig him out of these situations. Like, how do you explain your way out of this one? Thunderbolt Ross, like, always just wants to call him a commie pinko also. Mm -hmm. Oh, he hates him. A milk sop. Yeah, he yeah. And it's, says that. and it's that classic, that classic shit, man, of, like, the old generation and the new generation. Like, you young pussy, he wants to call him. You fucking bleeding hard hippie. You know, well, we're, we're the tough guys. And you're a lily liver. And, and it's also that, like... Lily liver. <laughs> we got mustaches, and you can't even grow. <laughs> and and you know it's it's the it's the military cats and the dudes that you know dodged the draft. It's all it's all that shit. Yeah, definitely, man. This is where that that kind of like new coloring really makes the art stand out as something different. Yeah, you know it it looks like a video game or something on that last <laughs> panel. Yeah, it does. Black bars, I think, is an interesting approach, man, because you, know, you don't have to like render out each. Makes your coloring yeah. a lot easier. Yeah, Kirby didn't draw black bars. You know Ditko. Yeah. That's a Ditko time saver right there. Yeah. And, dude, it's full-on invasion. Here's a real good example of, like, seeing Kirby's hand and Ditko in the same image. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen a lot of Kirby imagery. And certainly that's Kirby-type hair. Yeah. And there's even proportions that are Kirby-like with the face. But those are um, Ditko eyes. There, I mean, they, there is overlap. And yeah. so when... Ditko's ink and Kirby, that overlap becomes even more apparent. <clears throat> we got some great like Kirby sci-fi stuff of drawing the moon, this big gravity ray that's going to draw the moon to crash into the earth. 
and at the very least fuck with you know tides by the way magnetic ray and i say that because i always think of like the dick tracy stuff where the magnetism is like this big thing oh yeah it's so it's so bizarre it's like this little little bit of history where it's like magnetism was what we were all into that i mean that same thing was the magnetic telescope in that uh, max fleischer superman cartoon this is super cool man i don't think i've seen kirby do this before where like let's have our dream sequence or or uh this yeah. is just a headspace vaporware that this frog king is talking about and you start it off and you end it on right, the same yeah. page yeah it becomes straight and then you get the book in this is a tool to use that. Yeah. that is good yeah this definitely. is like you can employ this into your own practice like i could think mm-hmm. of a million different ways that that this can fit into our own works yeah i feel like we've talked off camera disproportionately about <laughs> about panel boards yeah. and, and you see it in red room you see it in hot yeah. grand design like it is a piece of the of the puzzle but i haven't done that that's pretty good hey guys full moon yeah mm-hmm. so what's going to happen well it's going to go in the full moon zine yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we have our heel turn look at that ominous figure dude Coming gonna you. hit you with some twisted metal that that is the most terrifying image of the whole deal you know what it really is and it's worked in so well like yeah. right into the cannon right into the cannon perfect and also i mean he is a bad guy there, yeah. there's a train coming we we get i don't know if we see the uh the effects of that train but that train is derailing we, meanwhile while, while we're reading this page that train is crashing we yeah get, you know we get it's a, lot a comic of you know i mean this is what makes it a superhero comic though he can be a, a, a monster and horrible but he's got his secret identity that's nice you know well i mean he uh-huh. is making gamma bombs right yeah but he's, he's fitting into the Isn't social X-Men order. insignia that these soldiers are wearing? <laughs> Five parts. I, I feel like you did a great homage to that in Hulk Grand Design. I'm going to ask you a question, Jimmy. Uh, pull up that file. And this is a coloring issue that I was thinking about. Because, sure, these military outfits, green. Hulk, green. But is there a better way to solve that by just pushing the characters oh, well, out? in a different color and let's see what the ogs the hulk's not end up green. doing he, is the hulk yellow there it looks like he's, he's very uh, yeah it's very light yeah but that's the that's how you do it ladies yeah, and absolutely. gentlemen absolutely that's how you fucking do it yeah you you get em- these interns to color the color of this shit and just separate forms you know what is impressive though for being an issue too is how far along they are in the mythology yes. of hulk in terms of, of hulk the way the world reacts to Hulk, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, whether it's the town that he goes into and everybody's scared to death and running or the servicemen or policemen responding to him. It's like he's pretty uh, they, they figured out how they want him to fit in this world. Yeah. It's comics. You're allowed to make these guys red for a panel and then they could go back to their green outf- outfits. There's a purpose for that. I wonder now if you were to read this, that it would be like uh, communism, right? Right. How okay. dare you color those servicemen red? And he uh, creates an instant garage door and then seals it back up. Yeah. With the guy's up. arm out. I was thinking <laughs> of that. I read this stuff and I just think like, oh, that dude's arm, he's just destroyed oh, the yeah. bystanders. <laughs> okay, Jaime Hernandez popped in for a panel, <laughs> right? Isn't that so, like all the lines are perfect there. Pretty good. That would always mystify me as a kid when you'd see these drawings and it'd be like one line for them. Yeah. And, it's, and clean and perfect and everything. You know, you get a little bit more of it here. That was always like, I don't know how you do that. I wonder if they ever did a Hulk story where, like, we really dealt with some passage of time stuff. Because I think we had about three days pop mm-hmm. up uh, in this issue. And, and it'd be cool. Like, if if that's a, uh, a MacGuffin for your comic, that should be a storytelling piece at some point. For all the stuff that they have figured out here, I think the nighttime changing is something that they struggle with. Yeah. Because that becomes more and more of like, well, wait, how are you changing now? Like over the next yeah. several issues of Hulk stories, you'll see it's like different things that cause him to change where like they haven't quite figured that part out. And we know it is anger, but even that it takes a little bit of time to like kind of, they don't explain it totally. It's just the Hulk keeps mutating and how he manifests keeps changing a little bit. These are the keystone cops of American military might. Because this boy... <laughs> Able to fend off whole soldiers. First off, he's able to run past them. There's a couple times whenever he has to get through all the all the soldiers. Yeah, he just gets past them all, and he's going to fend them all off. People with you know trillions of dollars worth of uh, you know American tax dollars going to their weaponry, getting getting uh, held back with just a fire hose. And Rick Jones, he's supposed to be like Ricky Nelson or Pat Boone or, or somebody, I guess. Like yeah, some kid, kid pop star. And this is this is like a a Jack Kirby ending. Like when in doubt. Just create some giant gun 
that you shoot that like solves the problem. And yeah. it's it's not the greatest ending in the world, but it gets you out and you've had so much great stuff going on up to this point, you kinda it's okay. You know, you got us out of the story. Story wise it feels like the kitchen sink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like you have a couple of stories happening. It, it's strange like the military versus Hulk subplot that runs through all these stories because mm -hmm. you have other stuff happening. Like that's a full on outer space invasion. Yeah. But we still gotta have the military going after the Hulk. Almost to the point that that sub story takes over the main story. Yeah, I I love this final panel. Like this oh is, yeah, it's a beautiful graphic, and it's just that's the whole status quo at this point, you know. And it's not. I mean, this is a character, a, a, a traumatized character. He's in turmoil. Like yeah, like even if it's a happy ending, he still has to be in a box and shoved away and yeah. not happy about it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, you're right. It's a tortured character. It's metaphorical. It's it's all about like keeping stuff inside and you know. Visually, it's cool because it's almost like panels within a panel. Yeah. Super fun to look at the tandem yeah. of uh, of Ditko and Kirby. There's that one great Red Ghost Fantastic yes. Four issue. Might mm -hmm. have to put that one under the microscope sooner than later. Man, you guys good to go? Yeah. Okay, favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are out there. Jimmy, what you got? Hulk Grand Design, speaking of Hulk, glad to do a Hulk story. These Both of these issues are in comic stores now while supplies last, but the big oversized treasury collection is coming to stores in 2023. So pre-order that now wherever you buy books. There's about 40 extra pages in there. Super uh, cool fluorescent green cover. I'm excited for that book to be out there. And Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live, back in print from Image Comics. Eight complete full-color stories in this volume of the Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard. Perfect for uh, superhero fans out there. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see a lot more of my comics and art. Tom. Uh, the Hulk shows up in Fantastic Four Grand Design and Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And please check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. And I'm reviewing uh, issues of Thor one at a time every every Thursday. And uh, it's also uh, October is Jacktober. Uh, every month there's a different drawing prompt, uh, different Jack Kirby related drawing prompt uh, if you want to get in on that. Do you have a panel in here where uh, Stan Lee is at that event and mentions who his favorite Kirby inker is? Uh, is that in this? I don't think so because I think that was like it was, it was Jack's funeral or it might have been somebody else's funeral that was like after Jack died. It, it might have been like Jerry Robinson's funeral or something. I, I, it wasn't yeah, Robinson because no. we knew Jerry Robinson. Um, he no, not, yeah, not Jerry Robinson. Uh, what finger? It might have been Bill Finger's funeral. I don't know. Like well, somebody. that was the 70s okay, or something. Okay, yeah. I always heard it as Jack Kirby's funeral. Yeah, Jack, it was Jack Kirby's funeral. That but he said who knows? It. I yeah. mean, I, I heard it. We weren't I there. Wasn't there. Right. Yeah, we weren't there, man. Red Room. Trigger warnings. Red Room, the antisocial network. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game. Each of these uh, volumes completely self-contained. Four stories in each. Scoop them up if you see them. If you dig it, grab the other one. Uh, I'm serializing new Red Room comics on my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three books get you the archive. It's all this stuff. Plus new Red Room comics that will see the light of day in 2023. But you get it first at the Patreon. Jimmy, what else do we have out there, man? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, uh, fanny packs, and more at our spread shop in the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Read more comics. So I have a commercial to shoot with this one because I don't think I... Uh, I don't think I did my segue piece, man. So I'll just do that real quick. You got your mic off, right? Oh, I, yeah, I, I got the mic. Oh, yeah, right, right. And watch all these wires yeah, and man. shit. Because <laughs> somebody on, on the, uh, in the chat room was surprised to see we do the read more comics. Uh, it's not a recorded, pre-recorded clip. I guess my monotone makes it sound the same. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to try to vary that up a little bit more. Well, how, how's, it, how's, it, how's it going, uh, Taxi Driver? Like when they got the buttons and like, like uh, one word is emphasized, and he's like, uh, Albert Brooks is like, it reads this way, it should read that way. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, <laughs> no. Damn. And Taxi Driver? Mm -hmm. When they're in the political campaign office, oh, they get these right, buttons right, right. and stuff. Yeah. Not the scenes I rewatch. We that movie. the people. <laughs> no, we we are the people. It should be we are the people. Something something like that. That's right. Someone in the comments will remember. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot this commercial thing. Yeah, real man. Quick, man. Are you ready? Yep. Our videos are brought to you by the comic books that we make on the stands right now. Jimmy has Hulk Grand Design, Monster and Madness, uh, capturing the entire history of Incredible Hulk comics in two tidy volumes. Uh, but if you want one less than uh, two, wait for that uh, trade paperback. Treasury edition is going to come out early in 2023, Hulk Grand Design. 
Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive is back in uh, reprint uh, for the Christmas season. Make sure you get your hands on this sucker. Red Room, Trigger Warnings, and Antisocial Network are my latest efforts. Uh, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Every issue and every story is self-contained. So if you see one, scoop it up, give it a shot. Hopefully you dig it. And if you do, grab more. Tom is co-hosting with us this week, and he has Fantastic Four Grand Design out in the wild. Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. His biography comic of Jack Kirby is on the stands. Uh, support our channel that way by supporting our comics, and we can keep bringing these videos to you. With that in mind, let's get back to the video game. We are the people. Yeah. <laughs> it we are the, are the people. people. <laughs> is, is that what? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, let me grab go grab these uh, any fanny joints. I'm gonna call Taxi it. Drive. Mm -hmm. I was trying to yeah place that yeah taxi driver because because they they were the audience is talking about they thought that Jim's read more comics was just uh, tipped in mm. like one one clip <clears throat> you know what that is it's professionalism yes. very consistent mm -hmm. my broadcaster you, you can set your clock that's it. right that's right it's like Ringo's drums. Were you getting nostalgic seeing all that Hulk stuff reminding you of when you were deep in the elbows deep in Hulk it, it, stuff? It is funny, you know, like I, I was telling, uh, I think it's telling my wife how you get so obsessed with this stuff that once you send it to the printer, it's like you just shut that off because yeah. you just can't do anything. It's the serenity mm -hmm. prayer of like, <laughs> I can no longer change it. <laughs> Read more comics. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the Alan Moore videos. Yes. <laughs> Do a Captain OG read more comics character. It's a little overview, fifteen minute or sure. talk the virtues of it, man. Show show off this back matter. I feel like we get there supernaturally. Yeah, we get there naturally. Great process stuff. From the jump, man, I'm gonna keep this in, this imagery up, man. Just uh, if you look at the analytics of like that first video, it's like seconds of engagement, and it's on the strength of that shit. So this might extend it a little bit more. Uh, I'm I'm ready if you are. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I am Jim Rugg. and I'm Tom Scholey. Today we're gonna be talking about your dad's favorite comic book character, man. <laughs> L little Annie Fanny. But first, Jimmy and I are gonna be doing some traveling. October sixth through 9th, we're going to CXE Columbus, Ohio, uh, for a comic book festival. We're gonna be at Baltimore Comic Con, the birthplace, the genesis point of Cartoonist Kayfabe, October twenty eighth through thirtieth. Jimmy's gonna be at uh, the Jacksonville Public Library, October twenty second, for a zine festival. Cartoonist Kayfabe Tober is going on this year as per usual and these are your drawing prompts this go round can't wait to see what the cafe audience comes up with for uh, each and every one of these uh individual prompts hashtag us on instagram at us on twitter to make sure that we can see everything and we will try to uh re post and reshare as much of that stuff as possible uh with that upfront piece out of the way let's take a look at some little annie fanny comics man probably the height of, of magazine comic art mm -hmm. uh, in existence by Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder with lots of extra hands uh, coming in to help William Stout, Frank Frazetta, Jack Davis, Russ Heath. There's glimpses of crumb that get touched uh, in some of these strips, man. And it is a tour de force. We know that Hugh Hefner is a big time comic book head, big time cartooning head, employed a lot, gave the best rates Mm -hmm. Money could buy, man, for uh, illustration and single panel gags and things in the pages of Playboy. Mad devotee, Jack Cool guy. Hook Harvey Kurtzman up. They tried, man. They tried. They did Trump Magazine. That lasted all of two issues. Here are some of the other artists. In the, this is the early run uh, from 19... No, this is this the second volume. So uh, these are your contributing artists in the... The late run, Jack Davis, Sarah Downs, Russ Heath, Larry Siegel, Bill Stout. Let's let's start at the beginning, James. What's the what's the date on, on this problem? 62, 62 to 88. All right. 
Yeah, I think it's noteworthy just, I mean, 26-year run, you, yeah. know, you know, covering this stuff. One of the things I find really interesting about this work now, because I think if you're if you're a Kurtzman fan, this work is kind of, I feel like, mixed the way it's received. Sure. Part of it is how work it is. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think today where, you know, the black line is just not the only way to make comics anymore, it's yeah. interesting to go back and see this work thinking about it through the lens of comics today and totally. how we treat color and how much we have access to in terms of creating. They were doing some stuff the hard way. Oh, yeah. But definitely creating a look there that uh, does not rely on that black line art yeah. that so many comics did. And I think that's intentional at the time to separate it from like, that was a low produ- like a lo-fi production necessity, mm-hmm. the black line art. If you're going to do high-end production like Playboy magazine, you can do this. Right. And they would do maybe maybe for a year or something like that, man. Uh, you get a little over 200 pages worth of stuff, maybe closer to three. But that's not a lot of pages in, you know, 30 years, 40 years. So you said 1962. So this has to be before the death. Oh, definitely. They're not doing this. They're not tasteless. Yeah. yeah, like that's a high class magazine, man. You know, it's not an underground comic. Uh, but the, in terms of the satire, which is something that Kurtzman is always sort of known for, they were up to the minute, and as they get older, to me, uh, you know, I got that collection of Mad Magazine, and it, it, it wasn't that big of a deal when I was reading it as a kid. I was just like, whatever. But to me, it's so much more valuable to read like a 1990s Mad, knowing that it's people who are working on that comic, that magazine since the 70s, mm-hmm. because it really becomes like the old generation's thoughts right. on Game Boy, yeah, and. MC Hammer and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Like, so you're, you're already kind of getting a little bit of that with this because this is we're in the free love uh, generation and Kurtzman and Elder are already old cusses. I, I haven't read enough of this. Like, how is it as a reading experience? Like, it's, it's certainly like graphically very interesting. It, but You don't read, you don't read this book at once. <laughs> you know, it lends to a once in a while read in terms of each of these strips because it is so one note mm-hmm. you know it's it's getting this 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 character you know she, she's like uh who's that rosemary's baby chick oh, mia yeah, farrow mia I, yeah i was gonna say she's like little annie fanny but she is little annie. <laughs> right yeah totally russ Heath signature on this particular story yeah check out the artist <laughs> in, in uh this this early run man it's like paul coker jr we we just lost him not too long ago frazetta heath jaffe bob price arnold roth larry siegel some of these names you see in humbug I was going to say, like, time. that's something that I would uh, compare to in terms of reading experience, because a lot of this stuff may be uh, reference of the time and more adult reference. And I don't just mean adult like like uh, right. porn. I mean, like adult, like politics. whatever would be the, the mm-hmm. yeah, politics, a great example, literature, things like that. So it is a dense experience. But also, as you look at these panels, the density is not just in text. You know, like there was one uh, that you passed that was like art and you would see like every panel had paintings in it oh, going yeah. through like art history. Uh, you know, super dense in the amount of information that is on these pages. And if you were to just sit down and be like, I'm going to read this book cover to cover, you're really cheating yourself out of sure. kind of like, you know, you want to comb right. over this yeah. stuff, you know, like like this kind of stuff. Kurtzman's lingering on all of these, you know, any anytime you see a piece of text or an image in the background, it's something that, you know, has been thought about and cared for through three or four or five drafts. Mm-hmm. When you really scrutinize this work, you could you could see like a Jack Davis pop in there yeah and then it gets the will elder color treatment uh will elder known for chicken fat which is uh to to squeeze in uh as many jokes per square inch as possible so that is about the, you know that's the density that we're looking at here so that, I, I think i saw goodman beaver is he part of the continuity of like i know little annie fanny kind of grew out of goodman beaver creatively but simply that part of it yeah no, yeah it's simply that man goodman beaver from from help magazine uh was a blonde uh, little little uh, orphan Annie. Yeah, I'm betting they're gonna deny a, a uh, Goodman Beaver being in these pages based on that history, but sure. And look at this man: LBJ, Nixon, uh, Malcolm X, Chairman Mao, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Ali, all in one image. Can't yeah, be. Wow, that ain't easy. And just speaking about the up to the minute. Yeah, like look at the amount of of imagery that they're loading this stuff with great cartoony faces too, which again, like if you spend the time lingering on these images, you will be rewarded for it in terms of the cartooning that they're, they're certainly giving Hefner his money's worth. Yeah. Space race. That seems to be the inspiration of the, is, is like, this is art that's made when somebody's footing a hefty bill. 
you know, and wants to see the money they're spending on the product. Hugh Hefner wanted his money's worth, yeah. man. Uh, when in regards to the the sort of overworking, yeah. look at that. Okay, let, let me just finish my thought before yeah. we we get, <laughs> we get to stuff. But um, Kurtzman said that if we didn't make those changes on our own, Hugh Hefner was just going to do that anyhow. Mm -hmm. Like he was paying the best rates. These are three, four um, page pieces that might have been getting ten thousand dollars a page. Like at that high level mm -hmm. of a price, because beyond just uh, beyond just the the commission for the artwork, they also got free trips out of the deal. Uh, my my uh, lettering teacher at the Kubert School is Phil Felix, and he lettered the back half of uh, Little Annie Fanny, and they went on Hawaiian trip. Like Little Annie okay. Fanny goes Hawaiian, and, <laughs> and Hugh Hefner is paying the bill for that that reference work that they're accumulating. Uh, I had to stop on this because this is a strip that has Jack Davis and Frank Frazetta nice. helping out. And when you see something like this, you have to imagine that Frank Frazetta isn't doing preliminary artwork. Like that's that's his color on there. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it was in complete Crumb comics whenever Crumb connected with Kurtzman and stuff and was playing around with being an assistant on this material where I first learned that, that Frank Frazetta helped on Annie Fanny. And he said that they got Frazetta out of there quick because he was painting veins and stuff like under her titties. And they're just like, it's, it's not, <laughs> that's not what we're going for. That, that one little panel, it's like such a Frazetta moment totally. like in this, you know. Yeah, that lighting pops too. Yeah. That color palette and everything feels like it's a little bit different. It's interesting with these because I don't know how, how positive everybody felt about them that was involved with it. Right. But you think of Kurtzman doing things like Humbug where he's trying to do more adult sensibilities mm -hmm. in his terms of humor. This is a good vehicle for that. Yeah. You know, because it is clearly an, an adult audience that's able to consume this. Wow. Look Whoa. at that. Effect. Again, to op art. And the Beatles. E, the Beatles. I, I love whenever these old guys do the Beatles because like they just don't get it. They're like, oh, they're greasy hands. Boy. Just the beauty of some of these illustrations. Classical approach, man. Yeah, it's astounding. You can see why there's a couple of pages in, in a story, you know, uh, a lot of work for a month or two. I mean, that's like the Jack Davis creepy mm -hmm. one cover. It really is. You know, you, like you see him popping up. And, and the most important piece is the continuity of keeping Annie Fanny consistent with that Mondrian mm -hmm. uh, dress. And, you know, can... I, you trust Jack Davis to show up and create something solid right there. All of these supplements are clearly Jack Davis. Man, incredible. Like the motion on top of the, the cartooning. Yes. <laughs> wow. You know, this is what I'm talking about. Like, if you study this image, you're going to get jokes per square mm -hmm. inch all over this two-page spread. Psychoanalysis convention. <laughs> I would bet that this this was printed in an August issue. Wow, look at that effect. Getting into Garbage Pail Kid. You know what? I've seen a couple images that really feel like Garbage Pail Kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, Bob Dylan. That's the stuff, too, is, you know, so much of this may be lost to time for somebody that's yeah. of a certain age. Yeah. And I mean, like putting a Lichtenstein right in there, right? Lichtenstein, pop art and weaving the Marvel comics, pop art comics into the mixture. Yeah. So you can see the ingredients here. You know, this is Kurtzman being Kurtzman. Look at that. Dude, crazy cat. And, you know, that's that's like a pill in the Hefner. Oh, yeah, it's appealing. Who, who isn't it appealing to? And then you combine it with those onomatopoeias. Beautiful. That's a great panel, too. We've seen so many of these two-thirds page splashes. That's a pretty nice variation. Love it. The cool thing about these volumes, too, skip ahead a bit, is the back matter right. where we get a lot of process. Yes. It is such valuable information. Origins of Little Annie Fanny by Dennis Kitchen. Uh, and here we have like uh, examples of what goes into each of these pages, man? Like these are not pages that are ill-conceived. If you're going to spend that much time on the final render, you better get everything in order. Right. And the reason you do it is you can't re-render the end result. Like no. that stuff needs to be ironed down before you go into the paint and the color and stuff that would just make it impossible to make it look good if you're changing. So his process 
Harvey Kurtzman uh, is a process that he refined over a period of decades, man, like with the war books. And it's a process that got adopted by others, like Art Spiegelman, I think, works in, in the same fashion, where it becomes a function of ha having adding um, overlays and using different yeah. color markers mm -hmm. to uh, show you what the new edits are. And you might have five or six different pieces of overlay. We saw some of those at the Billy Ireland. Yes. With all the pieces and stuff. Oh, man. And like the very early layouts, these are so classic. And they're in that uh, Kurtzman monograph. Yeah. You can see some more examples of that stuff. But it is interesting to see it develop out that way. Yeah. Classic Kurtzman kind of approach, right? Just all gestural, rubbery. And for those playing at home that don't know who Ernie Kovacs is or something uh -huh. like that, each of the strips has a little bit of annotations to hip you up to some of the things that you're seeing Smart. on the... Uh, on the page there look at that false start wow yeah sergeant Imagine pepper doing all that and then starting all over <laughs> that's incredible i love seeing that stuff though to see like where do you start you know yes. like, completely rendered faces in the middle of a, of a pencil rock drawing Jim, i could see you doing that in one of your comics have a page that's like deliberately like partially rendered partially not let's jump i like that idea yeah let's jump closer to the 80s which is more our era yeah we might and actually get a and, reference. and see you with, with some of these uh <laughs> That is a long run. It really is. And, and rigorous work throughout that run. And she she maintains, like, if this is approaching the, the 80s, she still looks Arnold. like Joey Heatherton type chick or something. Hard to change that part, right? I guess. It'd be funny if that were a gag of, like, if they changed, updated her look and it was some plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so I guess bodybuilding is in yeah. vogue at yeah, this moment. Yeah, pumping iron. The pump. Yeah, the jet age. I saw a porn shop in the background on one of those. Yes. Yeah, so I'm like, look at this stuff, man. Jeez. When's she going to go to a video arcade? Getting into jogging and running. Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> I saw the Tin Man back there. <laughs> there is a WWF one. We should see that one, right, Jimmy? Yeah, absolutely. Before we get out of here. How about this? This is a break from what we've seen so far. I love whenever you see some kind of innovation that he's able to bring in after, I don't know, 20 years into it. Right. Well, just regular cartooning really stands out in this context. That's a straight up family circus. Inset panel there. Very nice. Saw some John Travolta staying alive. Shit. I don't think I have this second volume and I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Like, wow, look at the density of that page. Oh, yeah. How many? There must be 150 characters on that page. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild, man. And, and by the way, at this point, it's Elder and Kurtzman. There ain't no help. I uh -huh. wonder how involved, like, is, is Hefner involved all the way through? You know, at some point, does he kind of lose interest and let these guys do what they want? Yeah, the computer age. Mm -hmm. Always funny when you see a computer screen, like, in the With, back in the with day. ASCII art. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, too, when you think about computers and porn. <laughs> because, like, th like this Spot was the on. start. Yeah, like, sure. Like, I'm sure the like, first ASCII, and stuff. <laughs> ASCII image was, like, Pornography. <laughs> Sensory deprivation tanks. <laughs> Look at it. It's 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 all this stuff. Like it's it's it it took to you know the two thousands for that to like really catch in vogue. It existed back then. I think that's a Hooters reference. Knockers. I do. I do. It'd be a shame not to see the wrestling one. I mean, we got to be moving towards it. Yeah, I'd be coming in probably with like a WrestleMania. Absolutely. Wow. Sideways, how about that? Wow. What a spread. Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> with Spielberg. Got a 30-minute workout. This looks like a Mad Magazine mm -hmm. article. Yeah, the page strange piece. The page count's lowering. Three, three, three pagers. The lowers in the beginning. Yeah. In the beginning, they're like one and two pagers. They first present a show up in that one. I saw like a cool signature here. Oh, with apologies. Oh, oh yeah, because oh, that's yeah, the okay. composition yes. from one of the Conan's covers. Yeah, they probably just copied and paste. There it is. So, dude, how about that? Like that Arnold shit way back then is like probably from the seventies yeah. before before I, when he was just Mister Olympia. Right. 
right? You're really seeing like the years fly by through here. Ed Koch, Grace Jones. Oh, here's your, this is your wrestling yeah. joint. Yeah. <laughs> and dude, it is the era of like Corporal Kirshner and like, and like, uh, you know, Iran number one, Russia number one, Hunk America, Hawk two. Hunk Hokum and the Iron Schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, with a camel clutch. They're they're thorough. There's a better example of how they put the pages together with uh yeah, from, just, from start to finish back here. See those color overlays that you were talking about. Yeah. Body proportions. Talk about notes starting that the early um, very hard for anybody else to understand. You know, like the rough right. layout for this page. Yeah. They Impossible. literally imagine a thumbnail of that. It's just scribbles. I mean I've seen Kurtzman uh, layouts, and I've never seen ones as intricate as these. Yeah, for sure. These guys have been, uh, I think they went to high school together. So they have a very long standing relationship and I think have access to each other. So could just like hit each other up on the phone and h handle business as needed. Yeah, working out jokes and material. Oh, oh, this is a joke. Two, two vampires. <laughs> Will others that kind of dude, man. <laughs> That's a good uh, finished versus your. Yeah. Where, I don't even want to say rough. Place. Like it's a layout, yeah. but. But it goes deeper. See, here's your layouts with like mm -hmm. two levels of uh -huh. jokes and stuff added. I like seeing him drawing on uh, lined paper and on gridded paper. From the I've start, seen people bring that up. Like, where does that stuff exist? And it was like that was pre-print. Like you, you had that stuff. Yeah, Cartooning yeah. was a legitimate thing that enough people participated in that you know i mean it goes back you see it in the ec art reprints where it's like some of that stuff's pre-ruled and then later on when, when kurtzman's doing the jungle book and things like you, you see that and it's you know it's a it's a chemical technology it's and it's the same tools that create graph paper it's the same blue line mm -hmm. that you know they pre pre-print stuff and now we're at that place where we could print our own mm -hmm. man Yeah, there's crossover back then, too, for drafting tools. There is, so yeah. Stuff with the horizontal lines could easily be used in drafting industry where lettering is so consistent. The color well. rough. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, working everything out. Man, like this. How are you making sense of this? Oh, I know. I guess we're looking at multiple overlays, so you could kind of like that peel them apart it. and then make sense of and it. And as far as I can recall... Uh, Phil Felix had had a page or two, and he had a lot of roughs. And he had, he did have some roughs and things that I was able to check out. Uh, it would be like crescent art board, the thick illustration mm -hmm. board that these things would be uh, printed on. So uh, it's not even like you're light boxing. You would have to use probably like a carbon paper to trace off this stuff to get uh, your your pages oriented correctly to the way you wanted. And here you see the refinement of like rough and then tightening things up further. But here's the thing too, with all these levels of revision and, and, and craft and process that goes into it, none of this feels stiff. Right. You know, it, it all feels good. And then you get your last little bit of annotations to tell you what the hell you're looking at. Bobby Fisher. I feel very lucky that we have this kind of record of Kurtzman. Yeah, because like we have finished comics by him, we do, and they are so different than what you see with this version of finished comics, right? Let me go see. No idea. What's up, baby? I just need to get this door to shut up. Did you hear it? Boom. Yeah, I have no idea how that, what the heck happened there. Yeah, so we looked at a giant overview back in the day with uh, Little Annie Fanny, Penthouse Comics. Honey Hustler. Hustler, Hustler Comics. Decided to go macro today. I mean, to, decided to go micro today with... Uh, Little Annie Fanny in specific. You guys good to go? Yes. 
a favor, so like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, let the people know what's out there, man. Street Angel Deadly Squirrel Live is back in print after almost a year from Image Comics. Eight full color stories. Pick that up in time for Christmas. Perfect gift for any fan of superheroes, action, skateboarding, etc. And Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness. Both issues are available at fine comic shops throughout the land, at least while supplies last. And there will be an oversized treasury edition uh, collected and released first of 2023. So pre-order that book now. Get those numbers up. A lot of people ask what the next Grand Design book is. We got to sell some Hulk Grand Design so that Marvel knows it's worth their time to do another Grand Design. So get those orders up on the Hulk Grand Design. And uh, join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg to see a lot more of my comics and art. And speaking of Grand Design, we got Fantastic Four Grand Design and Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And uh, check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. And every Thursday, I do a new issue of Thor, do a commentary on each issue of Thor. And uh, check out my Patreon. Go to Patreon.com, search Tom Scholey. And uh, do it, 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 for this uh, month of October, uh, there's Jacktober, a series of drawing prompts for every day of the month, uh, all Kirby-related drawing prompts. Red Room Trigger Warnings and Antisocial Network are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Each book completely self-contained. And uh, you can get your hands on these comics at my link tree in the description below this video. Thank you guys so much for supporting it the way you've been. And if you want to read future Red Room comics that haven't hit paper yet, go to my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three bucks will get you the archive there. And uh, you can read all of this material and the new stuff before it hits paper. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, fanny packs, and more at our spread shop at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, given those marching orders will be on our way. Make more comics. And let me do a little commercial piece for this because I thought that I forgot to. Uh... Oh, I could have hit that. Is this your last bid? Yep. Get it real quick for me, man. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. On the stands right now, Jimmy has Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, Trade Paperback, is back in reprint, collecting all of his image comics, Street Angel work, eight stories in total, and some stuff that you've not seen anywhere else he also is, has hulk grand design out in the wild two issues of the the floppy monster and madness but it's going to be getting that treasury edition format in early 2023 but put in your pre-orders right now speaking of treasury editions fantastic four grand design and jack kirby epic life of the king of comics is in stores today that's Tom Scioli's latest works that you can get your hands on but he's got his name on the spines of uh, many of books man so pop in the name into your Google machine, you're going to find his comics in big volume and be able to enjoy them that way. Red Room Trigger Warnings, Red Room the Antisocial Network are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. It's my latest project. Uh, I appreciate all the support you guys have given it, given it so far. And can't wait for you guys to see the next round of comics uh, with all of that out of the way. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. I'll be able to edit that into something. Yeah. Cool beans, man. Trade mics. Thank you, well, that's on the <laughs> Oh, of course, yeah, that's one of my favorites. I'm excited to hear your thoughts on that. Hey, have you read the Alex Ross Fantastic Four? <clears throat> I have, yeah. So you have two copies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had yeah. one? I had one, yeah. I can't, can't hurt to have two. I should have done a, um, a second video on that with Tom in the house. I, there's still time. I don't, I don't know what you'd want to 
kick out though to make room for it. I mean, you guys did a great. I mean, you know, you, you know. Mostly, I'm just curious about your thoughts on it. Well, maybe we'll do a video one of these days, and I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I, I see your that. Your enthusiasm seems low. <laughs> I see that happen in Jimmy, like like uh, Tom and I back in the day, like we did a Killing Joke. Yes. And like we should do one. It was done differently, you know. It was just with us on the cam and stuff. If you guys are gonna do a second video of something you already talked about, I want to do All Star Batman and Robin. Because <laughs> because yours was very it was very much something and my take would be very much something else but yeah I and that's a classic uh, video too i think people would like i was gonna a, say a return that's, to that that, 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 that's a video if one of them response. deserves a sequel that's that's one right there jim rug getting spicy still get comments from that shit yes we do turn it up all right you guys have a preference as to what we do next victorious return to Conan. Let's do the Conan. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of ready for that since cool. you mentioned it. I like the ad on the back. I, I accidentally was... I fucked things what up. What did you do? Yeah. I accidentally was trying to airdrop you something when I should have been airdropping myself. Trying to do a, lots of... Too many screens. Lots of work at once, man. Too many yeah. devices. They come devices or screens. Yeah, both work. I'm just thinking about logistics stuff, man, for for Japan, especially if Jeff Darrow is out there with me and, and all that. Yeah. And uh, there's a thing you could get the uh, I, it's a it's a hot spot that you could just rent. Japan Wi-Fi Buddy is uh what it's called, and that gives you that gives you like a hundred gigabytes of bandwidth. Yeah. To do stuff, so you could even stream. And be cool. So, like, I gotta, I gotta order that up. You pick it up at the airport and stuff. Have it with you. You never run out of internet. So when you're like far from home base and you're catching those trains, and and you're nervous about like how your data plan is is holding up, man, that's just a good backup. That went out. Yeah, it did. Well, wow. super cool. I don't think I realized it was just a one shot. Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. A couple of dates where you can see us in October from the 6th to the 9th. We will be in Columbus for CXC. At the end of the month, October 28th to the 30th, we will return to Baltimore Comic Con, a comic book lover's con, and uh, the birthplace of Cartoonist Kayfabe. And October 22nd, you can find me at Jacksonville's Public Library for a comic and zine fest. We are basically up to Kayfabe-tober, so here's a list of cartoonist Kayfabe-tober drawing prompts. And uh, one for each day. Please tag us in, uh, and bring these to our attention so we can share them if you participate. I uh, love showing off the cartoonist Kayfabe talent out there, so drop in for cartoonist Kayfabe-tober and let us uh, spread some cool images around the internet. So today we are going to look at Barry Windsor-Smith, a cartoonist Kayfabe favorite, his return to the iconic character that he made popular in comic books, Conan, in Conan vs. Rune from 1995. What a crossover. Yeah. This is a uh, BWS vanity project. Do, do you guys know any of the behind-the-scenes story of how this came about? Like, it's, it's such a strange, like, awesome. I'm so glad it exists, but, like, him to return to Conan, you know? You know, I don't know the exact specifics because he had done Rune. You know, this is a yeah. Barry Windsor Smith creation for Malibu and Ultraverse mm -hmm. and... and kind of strange to begin with 1995 i think marvel had bought the uh malibu at that point in the ultraverse and i guess that's about all i know i i, yeah. I really don't know i think in the i think in the back matter they say that he takes some time off of storyteller the dark horse series that he is starting to work on in order to do this but i don't know what enticed him if it was that oh, he had a stake in rune some loot yeah, enticed him. yeah so i don't know the reason for it because i mean from the time he leaves Conan, I think fans are clamoring for his return sure, to Conan. Yeah. So it's a big deal, Barry Windsor mm -hmm. Smith back on a Conan book and doing everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and a character that he had equity in. I, I think about the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. I bet there there are, like, I bet they're thankful for, like, Frazetta for doing covers in the 60s and probably thankful for Barry Windsor Smith to, to revitalize the character in comic book form in the 70s. Because it is a thing where, like, Conan is the bigger draw. Rune was this, like, 
period in time kind of thing. And the only associations that Barry Windsor Smith had something to do with it. He probably had a little weight to throw around. Like, I'll, I'll do Conan, but I got I to gotta have him go up against my guy. Super smart. Because if you have some equity in this new creation and you want to get some eyeballs on it, that's why you go back and do a Conan. That's it. Because it is going to be a bunch of fans that maybe have no idea what Rune is, and suddenly they're forced to look at it. And the idea of, it's like Conan versus Dracula. So it's like, that it, it sounds awesome to begin with. So like, why not make it your proprietary Dracula rather than the public domain Dracula? This cover feels so underwhelming to me, yeah. considering what we're looking at in terms of Barry Windsor Smith, height of his artistic powers in a lot of ways. And like, it feels like you found a piece of clip art to put on here. And then just like threw together this whole top third. Now, uh, I've seen Barry Windsor Smith complain about the coloring in here, that the coloring was not done by his hand. And you can kind of, like, it feels like it's close to Barry Windsor Smith coloring, but it doesn't have like the... Before I open yeah. it, I just want to point out how violent this cover is. Huh. Because Conian is covered in blood. Yeah. Right? That's pretty hardcore. I mean, when you think yeah. about how far, what he would have been allowed to do when he was doing Conan in the 70s for a mm -hmm. Comics Code approved Marvel comic. And now you've got red blood on the cover. Damn. I mean, this might be the best issue of Conan, you know, and, and it, it kind of better be like, the, think about the artist that Barry Windsor Smith became. And it's like, it's got all the ingredients minus one. There's one ingredient missing, but um, you know, it's just a really great comic. And you see right off the bat story and art by Barry Windsor Smith. You mentioned color yeah. as being a, uh, a problem or something he's unhappy with. The color is really great in one aspect in that I think it's watercolored. Like mm -hmm. you see some effects that are really nice. In 1995, it was full on computer digital color was happening all over the place and not always to good results, yeah. usually not. So he comes in and he's doing this watercolor style that looks really good. Too dark in this. Point. Yeah, too dark. I, I think I, maybe the printing might have been what he complained of, you know, of the color. But I remember him complaining about the color. I think it is dyes. I think it's Doc Martin dyes. And I think it's pretty close to the approach that was done with uh, the Valiant work. Yeah. But Storyteller's out, and the palette is certainly the Barry Windsor Smith palette. Like, there are a lot of colors that you associate with those Gorblimey prints and that Storyteller color with, you know, the blues and the reds and all that. You know, and you compare it to Storyteller, and, like, Storyteller is, like, a more accomplished work. And it's, like, Storyteller, they have the freebooters where it's kind of, like, a, a, a existential Conan or it's like a, like a dissection of Conan where this is like just straight up Conan and it's like as great as Freebooters is you kind of do want just like a straightforward Barry Windsor Smith Conan with, with him at the height of his powers you know there's some real badass stuff in here yeah. in terms of Conan it, it is strange it's one issue it's not oversized mm -hmm. it's not deluxe or anything it feels like that that you know you think like this was it the only one yeah. issue it feels like there would have been more it would have been bigger or something uh it, but there are some great conan moments i think at least for yeah. my money here's the rest of the credits and there's an assistant inker and eric hope is the only credited colorist yeah. which that shocks me like i assumed barry windsor smith had a lot to do with this color like he's colored so much of his work yeah and this color is very distinct uh surprising that he's not credited Look at the way the flesh tone is applied, though. He has that thing where it's like three colors. They overlap a little in the middle. And you're not seeing that at all on any of the faces in this. So You are seeing some really wild, like wet on yeah. wet kind of color treatments where, you know, you see those pigments drying and it's like blues and turquoise here while you've got your reds over here. All in the same color pool. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff is pretty wild, you know, like some of the reds in the faces. Man, I have not worked with those dyes at all, Ed, but it does make me wonder... I like what's here. Like you said, it's a little dark, yeah. but I, I like the idea. And maybe it's just because no other books look this way. If you can do something with those dyes, like you you are an alchemist because they, unlike watercolor, where you can just kind of push it around and you can almost erase a little bit with watercolor, those dyes are unforgiving, man. Like they attach to the paper. That color is there the second you apply it and you have to like work it up a whole lot. Uh, the function of the uh, using the dyes instead of watercolors is if you're going on like the straight black line, uh, you can you can uh, the dyes will sink in. I think this is um, this has to be a blue line or a gray line. Absolutely, because right? when you get situations like this and you have some tapering in the background, like that ink line is sitting over top. 
and there are good moments like the fire to me works really well mm -hmm. so you know maybe some effects lend themselves better than to others i love when he picks up the jewel that's like glowing yeah. red and it makes his hand glow red it looks like it should be blood dripping off the fingers but it's actually just the color of the the rubies or whatever those the rune stones i guess but conan stops in here because he's hungry he's been on the road he's been eating lizards that are yeah. uh, sour sour flesh of lizards in his belly so stops into this this city to uh hopefully find some food and what he finds is an empty city like something yeah. is wrong here yeah pretty the, good tony and story yeah. setup and the, and the and the blues really sell you on uh the darkness like all the lights are turned out man yes and he gets uh once he gets in here like the wall comes down and he's trapped in here and he's gonna hear the uh his horse being ripped apart which is what these panels are describing and then silence right and and uh you know i guess you can't be showing that kind of thing but that sounds vision like we should see something i think it works all right narratively like he's locked yeah. away and it's in his imagination now like what is doing this and also he's in trouble now because his horse is gone yeah good good ad placement if you're reading this comic you might want to play dungeons and dragons too. It, does, it does seem to fit pretty well and uh he keeps moving forward because what else can you do and what does he find is just carnage, carnage and blood yeah. everywhere but there's one guy still alive saying help me good and visit. that guy's gonna give us some exposition yeah you get a nice flashback and it is like a, it's like you know young dracula story you know change the color i love the use of yellow in these sepia tones so bright for like your setting sky but yeah, yeah the, the different color for the flashback a very good indicator and the bloody dude yeah he looks pretty chewed up yeah i, I was thinking of red room like looking at some of it where you just got like unidentifiable i mean especially viscera, that you know, you know yeah. it's covered in blood the way he builds his faces is so interesting like because human faces do not look like this but it has a recognizable two eyes a nose a mouth there's some underlying structure but the way he decides it's it's pure style it's i, I feel like it's a guy who's conscious of having a drawing style yeah definitely and the backstory for rune i think is pretty cool here where they find this guy in very deluxe armor suggesting yeah. he's royalty or, or god or something and it takes a hundred days to nurse him back to health like whatever had torn him up tried to kill him yeah, very implying, hard implying a lot of really cool backstory and i guess he's like in his vlad the impaler kind of uh armor and um talking about faces like i love the design of rune's face because it's like he has a jaw that can like unhinge it's like a snake or something yeah and then like swallow a person whole you know and it comes across in the drawing those yeah. corners of the mouth go back further and further to the edge of the jaw uh before i go further i want to take this minute to let everybody know we are working cartoonists and the way we pay the bills at cartoonist kayfabe is that you buy our books red piss scores <laughs> ed rune <laughs> Ed Piscor's Red Room, Trigger Warnings, and the Antisocial Network. The first two volumes of Red Room are now available wherever books and comics are sold. They're completely self-contained and can be read in any order. So pick those up or order those now today wherever you buy books. Tom Scioli's Fantastic Four Grand Design, the deluxe treasury oversized edition, beautiful retelling of the overall story and history of the Fantastic Four, available now. Jack Kirby, the architect behind Fantastic Four and the Marvel Universe, the Jack Kirby biography available now wherever books are sold. Uh, Street Angel Deadly Scroll Live back in print from Image Comics and Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness. The comic books are available now. The oversized treasury edition will be out in January. You can pre-order that now wherever you buy books. Now back to Rune versus Conan. So how about that build, man? Because uh, this is when their world changes forever. Yeah. Turn the page and crash into madness as Rune, back to full health, starts feasting in front of everybody on the uh, nearest young woman. And what does he do? Unhinges that jaw you're talking yep. about, Tom. Completely bites her head off mm -hmm. and eats it in front of everybody. And then just carnage follows. And this is this is where you get bummed that the ink is a little bit dark. Mm -hmm. Because it's a room full of people that are responding. He's ripping people in the air, ripping them apart. Wish it was a little bit more clear and easy to read. Yeah. And, and uh, a story note, he's... Uh, eating like the the girl who was like most responsible for nursing him back to health. It's like this guy is like scum. It's such a disgusting visual too that he bites her head off and the hair is what it's almost a goatee that's right, sticking out of yeah. his mouth as he's like swallowing that head. There there is a movie called uh, that I think the Taking of Deborah Logan uh, where the big sort of climactic moment. It's a horror movie where camera goes on this lady and the jaw unhinges yeah. and goes and it is because it's that it's 
like uncanny valley in a way where it's like you see a recognizable thing now you see all the anatomical bits you recognize but it's in such a ghastly shape that your brain is trying to make make sense of seeing this new thing animals that can do that it is an ugly weird like you say ghastly like it, it looks unnatural because yeah. so few animals can do that so it's like a transformer that you've got an extra hinge or something there that you can open up it's a little bit of the predator yeah. uh, mouth yeah. which is a cool makes it a cool design i think so this guy finishes his tail and uh basically asks conan to uh for, for mercy yeah. asks him to kill him and he says you know if your god still listens speak to them now and then uh, a flash of cold steel, and it's done. I love this panel. Very simple, but you just turn the angle as Conan leaves the blood-soaked room. And man, what what a great setup for this like bad guy you're going to have to go up. That's against. right. That's that's when I was rereading this. That's what it stood out to me is like we've read a fair amount of Conan on this show, and uh, coming back to this book, having not read it since the '90s, it's like this is pretty good Conan yeah. setup at least so far. So he keeps going through. You know, the guy kind of outlined a way to to you know escape the where he's locked up and it emerges on a courtyard where it is a vision from hell to quote the book and you can just see nothing but but body parts even a throne made out of like bones and flesh you can see a torso in there it's a little dark but you can see it stretched for like the back of the throne Tony a answer calls. House. real smart to use uh, computer color on the um captions because it is a very muddy color, and mm -hmm. if you had to read text over top of that, even if it was just yellows and oranges, that could be a challenge. You're right about that. That that digital color, it's a good use because it does create a, makes that lettering pop. Man, there's like upside down that body's like the legs are hung up and the torso is just ripped off of it. Yeah, this is like, I mean, all through this time, I guess, Barry Windsor Smith is picking away at that monster story too so it's all that kind of like dehumanization kind of stuff conan destroys the throne just upset and then lightning spit splits the sky and you see the shadow the lines of like motion as this thing is just coming at impossible speed conan in his pose ready to receive it some interesting comic bookiness sort of coming in in this very uh i don't know illust illustrative kind of like naturalistic kind of story yeah, again, this is where you get, like, any of the places where we get dark, it's such a bummer because yeah. the drawings that you're able to see look amazing. Yeah, and, and by and large, they're keeping Rune, his Rune colors, and that does not help when you yeah. have a grape sky. Yes, very true. Very dark sky. Rune quickly grabs his sword and has, like, spiked knuckles, too, a little bit of the remnants of his armor on one of his hands, and you see skulls and bones all around as Conan goes down into the uh, into the carnage. It's so weird to turn a page and get this kind of ad in the middle of it. I, we, we need like a reprint of this, like the monsters, hard cut, you know, just black and white. Just let's look at this. I'd art. love to see this in black and white. And, you know, based on Rune and, and all those Ultraverse, I bet you never, you know, you just never see it. Imagine the yeah. legality yeah, of trying to get the legality is, yeah. Ron Howard and Marvel and everybody. <laughs> uh, not Ron Howard. Um. All right, so... The battle from this point on, it's pretty much we're going to have a showdown between this godlike rune vampire and uh, and Conan, and it goes back and forth. This is a wrestling match, right? Give and take, and that's that's Weapon X. That is Weapon X. I like that Rune has those incisors, or it's two teeth and then incisors. Not, it's not very Sorato, disgusting. Man. Yeah, I, I mean uh, Wolverine is kind of like just fuse these two characters together. You get Wolverine. And he always thinks about that jaw, you know, like that mouth opens bigger than the mouth yeah. of any uh, BWS characters. Yeah, when you say that, it makes me think like he should just punch him and have his fist go into his mouth, <laughs> like stuck. <laughs> It'd be amazing. He could rip out a throat or something like that. It, it is a really great fight scene and it's like down in dirt. They're slipping and sliding in the entrails as rain's coming down. I mean, I, I, I'd love... You know more and more pages you know but it is like yeah just like a sort of one shot thing you're right about the slipping and sliding it really does feel like they are going back and forth and it's not just each other that they're fighting but even the ground itself like the bones and stuff are popping up you see like bits of blood you know coming up as they're like kicking and sliding puts a rib into rune's neck and that kind of turns things for him. It's the opening. And then we get to read about how much Conan is just punching until like mm -hmm. his knuckles, the white of the bones are exposed from punching him in the face. It's it's interesting to see Barry Windsor Smith's like incredibly morbid worldview that he develops by this point applied to like what's pretty much like a pop comic. This is like this is like standard pop stuff. 
Yeah, when you put it through that lens, it's interesting to think you return to this character that made you famous, and this is the story that you tell when you come back to it. Like, mm-hmm. what a violent, dark, I mean, kind of almost hopeless story. He's doing all these meditations on death, and yet the hopelessness, like you think about how the ending goes, and it's like just like a really cynical ending. This is like the Barry Windsor Smith pilot, man. Like yeah. these greens against oranges and things. Yeah, so whenever Conan finally gets the upper hand, he's drawn to those rune stones. And whenever he grabs them, things get weird. A billion souls screaming in horror. And that's a little bit of, this sequence is a little bit of a callback to like the first issue of Conan the Barbarian, where there's like a moment where he starts seeing like astronauts. Right, like yeah. All kinds of stuff. That's true. And we covered that issue and the John uh, Buscema adaptation of that same issue. You, you mentioned know, seeing this vid. in black and white. Do you realize how different this looks in black and white? Like this sky that is almost black on the page here would just be open. Be right. Yeah. You know, it would it'd be line art. It'd be mm-hmm. very light colored if you saw this in, in black and white. This it would, is the Red Nails guy, by the way, I think. Yeah. You'd, be kind, you'd be blinded by the light of it. There'd be so much white coming off of it. And that's the thing, like, uh, usually the color separates the forms in a Barry Windsor Smith thing. Like, we've, we've done videos where we looked at the essential right. and just saw black and white line art, and it was like, what the fuck are we looking yeah. at? Nobody else could color this. Uh, but the color just, it doesn't help things very much. Yeah, that's interesting. Because his line art is usually so busy, and now yeah, you add, unbush. like, a busy coloring style on top of it. It's almost like the ultimate, in a weird way, the ultimate Barry Windsor Smith, where it is just busy on busy on busy. The height of 1990s ads, where, where they just basically call you douchebags and stuff. Oh, you're like, Wolverine, he's a wuss. Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Yeah, like, I'm, it's, I'm it's always contentious. The Daitanuki ad campaign or like a daikatana daikatana where it's like uh you know uh, eat, eat my shit or something no, it's, it's, i think it's something about balls suck, yeah suck something <laughs> you know what's bad though this is the old wrestling problem if there's never be calling some someone out like that there's no payoff bugs infest him this is the part that left me a little bit confused reading this is whenever conian kind of like wakes up out of this madness and rune is just gone you know, he's been infected with bugs, which makes for a great visual, but I don't totally understand it. Although he wakes up in just a carnage field, which <laughs> is pretty easy to understand. And as he's leaving, like, written in blood, I believe, is this... Uh... Helter Skelter? <laughs> <laughs> it's this this set of, of information. Separation, warrior, journey, disruption. No idea, like, how effective that is overall. As a story and his horse's piece. head is on fire. And sort of, like, the revenge in this story is him getting wanting to get revenge on the guy who killed his horse. Like, way at the beginning, you, you hear his horse getting killed from the other side of the door. And, uh, and yeah, like, Conan must have sort of had him on the ropes. And this is Rune's, like, last play, is to kind of dazzle him with this as he makes his escape. And so he hasn't defeated Rune. Rune is, doesn't have to, like, crawl into a hole for a thousand years ago. Like, Rune has just gone someplace else. It might take him a week to heal up, and then he's back to just, uh, you know, decimating the ancient world. Yeah. Conan grapples at his burning sword, his numb fist blistering without sensation. (laughs) And that's uh, kind of it, right? Yeah. He leaves and it says, you know, the, the devil is upon this land, let all men fear. It feels like the idea here is launch Rune as or, a character. Or get know. Rune out of it. Like, no more Rune. That might be Marvel's plan, but if you've got a financial stake in it, I don't think that's Barry Windsor Smith's idea. Yeah, well, he's he's very proprietary. Like, of course, like it, it, a million creators are like, I, it's my character. Like, don't touch it. You know I what guess I mean? so. Like, there's a million examples of that. It feels like a setup for Rune, though, to, to carry on, you know? Right. The, the presage the Holocaust to come, you know, like this creature is now loosed. And, and that there'll be a rematch that we're going to slowly build towards, you know? <laughs> so, Windsor Smith's art looks great. I, I I wonder how, like, the Conan fans responded to this issue, if they even did, because this is late 1995. Yeah, so lost in the mix. Um, it, it, it's kind of like a Lovecraft kind of thing, too, where it's like, you survive this encounter with these forces and you're just lucky to get out and only because conan's so fucking tough that he's not just like a gibbering uh you know uh, fool a- after that it is it is definitely conan is tough because yeah. you figure there's a whole city of people that couldn't do it mm-hmm. uh whenever they were all together fighting but conan's able to survive by himself yeah it's fun yeah it's a wild issue 
it's pretty so interesting it, as crossovers go like this. It's Barry Windsor Smith's last Conan comic, you know, other than Freebooters, which is kind of like middle-aged Conan. Um, I don't know where it fits on the Rune timeline, if like he does any more I think this is it for Rune. Yeah. Guys, good to go? Yep. Okay, favorites, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what do you got out there, man? I have Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness in stores now as comic books, and the oversized treasury size collection will be out in January, but you need to order that now. And Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live, is back in print from Image Comics. Eight complete stories of Street Angel in full color. And uh, follow me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can see a lot more of my comics and art. Tom, what do you have, man? Uh, check out Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's the life story of Jack Kirby in comics form. And we got Fantastic Four Grand Design, where I take the whole story of the Fantastic Four and boil it down into one uh, story with a, a beginning, a middle, and end, uh, putting a capper on that whole mythology. Check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show, uh, where I'm doing Thursday comics, reviewing a an issue of Thor every Thursday. And uh, do... Uh, do uh, Jacktober, it's uh, a, a series of drawing prompts for the month of October, one for every day, Jack Kirby-related drawing prompts. Red Room Trigger Warnings and Red Room the Anti-Social Network trade paperbacks are in stores as we speak. Each one contains four uh, unique stories that uh, are complete tales. So if you see any of these books, scoop it up, give it a shot. If you dig it, try the other one out also. Uh, this material is up on my Patreon archive right now as we speak. For three bucks, you get more than 300 pages worth of stuff, and uh, you get access to new Red Room comics that haven't hit paper yet. I'm serializing new stuff every Tuesday. Hit up my link tree in the description below this video, and you'll be able to get access to all that stuff. What uh, do we have? What, Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t shirts, merchandise, fanny packs, and all kinds of good KFAB stuff at our spread shop in the link below this video. It's another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel, given those marching orders will be on our way. Read more comics. I do always say it the same. Now they're in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of upset that I, I didn't see uh, the Dai Katana. Like the. the, the, the chat room didn't chime in uh -huh, right and give us the die katana because like yeah, i think like it was about real, balls or like, something it was slurp, you, you don't got the balls okay i, or I was like suck something or slurp something or something <laughs> like that said eat my shit yeah, like yeah. <laughs> i pulled this jimmy because this is just way better looking it is better looking yeah we'll do that one put that up there so i can set the camera because yeah. it's a little bigger and I didn't have a chance yesterday because I was doing too much of that uh, Japan stuff all night. But I um, I wanted to listen to the um, Ray Bradbury mm. story like while I was I working. I thought that too. I considered uh, because there's so much text that is just the same in these two. Yeah. yeah. And I got to assume that's coming from Bradbury. But I also have to assume Corbin. Well, I think this should all be on. Yeah, okay. Dai Katana. Yeah. John, Romero, John Romero is going to make you his bitch. <laughs> but yeah, there was an era where that was ads, at least ads targeted. Screaming to like at you and stuff. Yeah, don't be a fucking pussy, you piece of shit. Buy our X. Buy this, you bitch. I'm going to leave this up since it's big. Yeah, that's fair. I always hate moving this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's because of the lag of this. It's hard to center up again. <clears throat> Man. I'm so, I'm so happy to be doing this one, yeah. Jimmy. I think this will be a fun talk. Yeah. It is. Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. Fun video today, but first want to remind everybody that we will be on the road in October. From the 6th to the 9th, you can catch us at CXC in Columbus, Ohio at the end of the month. October 28th to the 30th, we return to Baltimore Comic Con, the original site of Cartoonist Kayfabe, the first conversation about this show. And October 22nd, I will be at the Jacksonville Public Library for their comic and zine festival. We are also coming up on Cartoonist Kayfabe Tober, so here is our drawing prompt list. We hope a lot of the Cartoonist Kayfabe loyal lists out there will participate we know there's a lot of talent in there so if you do participate in cartoonist kayfabe tober tag us so that we can share as many of your images as possible but today ed tom the reason for this episode 
we love these videos where a couple of cartoonists tackle the same story in very different ways. In this case, Ray Bradbury's A Sound of Thunder, interpreted by the great Richard Corbin and the equally great Al Williamson. Talk yes. about a heavyweight fight. This mm -hmm. is going to be a uh, a battle of legends. And, and, and it's an impossible fight, and it's an unfair fight because Richard Corbin has... A suitable pages. amount of pages yes. <laughs> to to get the story out there so he can have a little bit of storytelling happen, some visual payoffs and things. That is just almost never possible in an EC comic. So let's call it a celebration <laughs> because you can't really pit them against one another because of the the, the shackles that Williamson and Crankle and Frazetta were, were sort of under. Yeah, it's very uh, interesting because I have just utmost respect for both of these artists. Sure. They are so different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's We are using the box set edition of Weird Science Fiction for Al Williamson. And I think that makes sense because we're showing off his craftsmanship here, you know, yeah. his line art. And uh, Richard Corbin also has color that he's yeah. doing himself. So again, some apples and oranges here, but definitely starting with the same source material, a lot of the text the same yes. between the two mm -hmm. pieces. Yes. Uh, so we'll try to keep track of where the page breaks end since we have a different set of pagination. It's kind of interesting to see which parts are expanded in one or the other. Yeah. And uh, and we can dive in. The first thing that's kind of different is this title page for Richard Corbin's version of A Sound of Thunder. I think that's a complete separate piece. You know what I mean? This is almost like a, a cover for this story because once we get inside on page one, you can see yeah, a lot a more, more similarities. One one. Yeah to what we see with the uh, EC version. I, I feel like we should just do one story and then go into the next, man. You think that's the best way? I I do. Yeah. I, like, if you can manage, if you can manage, do it. I like seeing them side by side because there are a lot of, like, compositional... Yeah, mm -hmm. that's fair. You know, o overlapping. But you can see, you know, like, a lot of these elements are going to be the same. Uh, very different how he sets up the space here. Pretty traditional in, your, in Al Williamson, like bring all of our players together right from the get go. We know what's going on. We're in this company that's going to do time travel for a safari, an exotic uh, safari. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is Ray Bradbury Comics is the cover for this one. And then this one uh, adapted from a story by Ray Bradbury. So Ray Bradbury is kind of the star in these, you know, ostensibly. And that's why as wordy as like a, an EC comic typically is, this feels wordier because I think they want to kind of highlight Ray Bradbury's text as there's, much as possible. There's a lot that they have to sell to the reader, that they feel the need to sell to the reader to uh, to sort of get everything to to work. And, you know, they're talking about, like, recent elections. Yeah. Uh, in these very... You're, you're totally trained to, to know that anything that's mentioned in an EC comic is never just put in there for no reason you have six pages so it's all got to make sense for for the story so the second they bring up this dictatorship stuff and then you start talking about time and you know screwing things up if you just step on a butterfly or whatever like we we already know what's going to happen at the end yeah how, how different things would have been if the election went the other way and stuff then yeah yeah it feels so out of place in terms of right. like we're Heavy just man. we just want to go on a fucking safari and they're going to tell me about uh you know your p political ideology do you blame uh do you criticize brad i mean that's that's bradbury's choice right that that's well, going to be the thing that is um sort of the stakes well, that's, of, of this time that is why i wish i would have listened to like an audiobook while i was working right. yesterday because maybe it was way more subtle yeah, because Corbin is using this, I feel like, as his source material. I thought that too, and that's another reason I'd be curious what the original text is. And I mean, Corbin's an EC fan, right? So even if he's not using this directly, I have to assume he's read this story. It's sure. such a iconic story. I mean, like Dave Gibbons, like we talked about it in the Watchmen thing, and he, you know, he brought it up and stuff. Like it, this has been adapted in a million different ways. Uh, there have been nods and homages, like the whole butterfly effect. Yes. Thing is, I mean, that's that's Bradbury. The one thing that's interesting to me about the election stuff is when you think of our times now, oh, yeah. like I say it, I think every week we re record now that things just don't change. Like yeah. problems that were around when I was a kid seem to still be the problems around now. And it makes me think like politically, have we always had this? Right. right? It's just so divisive. And maybe in the past we didn't talk about it as much, but with social media, you're going to uh, because it feels like this is something that you would see in a new story now today. Right. Now, the, the feel of the Corbin one 
it feels so much like in sort of the 80s of like those mo- like aliens and predator like all those like it's got so- and and that's kind of like a fun element to it it feels like that part's really aged well the guy the the main character Eccles even looks like a uh, a bit player from one of those 80s kind of yeah. movies yeah like, like Dennis, Dennis Franz, Franz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one change from American is, uh, Buffalo Lyman is the character in in this story the uh, the presidential character and in here it's like Doucher so I don't know who's the original name and why yeah, that's changed it's probably too soon to be fucking with that kind of shit here I'm, i mean he's also like you know he's obviously referencing this but i'm sure he had to have a cut because there's like some elements that are in the bradbury story that show up in here that aren't in here there's a little bit of change here and that this looks like it's set in um not in a city yeah as yeah. opposed to you know we get this big city shot how about the reflection on like your your glass towers of the cars and congestion mm-hmm. in the streets um, wild amount of detail and there. this this is kind of like a gritty kind of future this is like uh you know the, the just that williamson look it's it's flash gordon it's this like aspirational kind of look look at that drapery dude amazing you know like he totally posts somebody out the, these i got this at a uh flea market it's my first ec hardcover that i that i ever got and it made it's the only thing that ever made me feel like maybe i'm never going to get to make <laughs> comics because this is just i I would try to copy this stuff and it would look so terrible. It's one of the parallels, I think, between these two uh, versions of the story or the levels of craft on display are mm-hmm. phenomenal, yeah. like so high. So page one, we get to, you know, it's he afraid and he's staring at his check. That's about here. That's about two and a half pages into the Corbin is one page Yeah, in the uh, original EC. I think there's some massive differences in terms of our... Uh, time machine design you know we don't see a lot of the time machine it's just an egg shape mm-hmm. in the corbin version and it's a little bit more of a sci-fi kind of piece still got the, the uh, dome EC. yeah definitely round the williamson stuff is so much fun to look at yeah you know? it really is brilliant brilliant drawing man the amount of text on these mm-hmm. pages quite a bit just get as much drawing in as possible you see the uh emphasis on these cool guns you know kind mm-hmm. of the high-tech guns that it's... he's a real chicken hawk fella too man talking all that smack but when it comes down to it, he's a he's a bitch. Our time travel is extremely truncated in the EC yeah. version. It's pretty much one panel, and you see Corbin going wild here with a, a pretty fun page as they go through from first a day, then a night, then a day and night, and pretty soon years and decades, and uh, you know several million years, hundred million years as they go back through. The costuming much more. I don't know, elaborate, I guess. Right. Reminds me a little bit of like the Eater Knot or something. Yeah. Some of these costumes that uh, Corbin is applying. But again, I think you chalk that up to a 1950s version of sci fi mm-hmm. versus a 1990 like yeah, eight, version eight, of uh, sci fi. And I think the color really plays out too. Like once you get back into that dinosaur landscape, color is really helpful and uh, very limited. If you look at the uh, EC color version, you know, it's, it's that limited palette. That is Al Williamson. Yeah. By the way. And got to give shouts to Roy Crankle, who is probably the background man on, on most of these panels. And your white screen tones. Oh, yeah. They apply mm-hmm. so much craft to that. It's amazing. Um, here's our big speech going on trying to explain the butterfly effect, yeah. uh, uh, you know, pretty much. Almost verbatim to, yeah. to uh, the text in, in the original. And uh, <laughs> this is a story I read super young. And, and thinking about that concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just blew my mind. I would I would be up at night thinking about that idea. Yeah, at a, at a time when this like it's become a very like everybody knows it now. But at a th- the first time you hear it when you're a little kid or whatever. And, and I mean, we had Back to the Future and yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. But just specifically, you know, if ten ra- if ten mice die, then a hundred mice yeah. don't get born, and and then a thousand mice don't get born, and then somebody's going to starve. I like the idea of like we're cutting away while we're having exposition. Like, let's see some interesting stuff. A little more variation than just uh, just headshots. When, when I go to the beach, there's like this wilderness path that has these like little <laughs> right. elevated platforms going on. And every time I'm on there, this is exactly what I think of this story. <laughs> Stay on the path. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they are path there. emphasize the path in both of the stories, of course. The stories are very, very similar. And, you know, you see kind of Corbin gets because of this extra page yes. count. He gets yeah. to expand some of these moments that maybe you don't get that luxury at EC at the time. Right. Our chicken hawk is... is pointing the gun and they're like dude don't even play around and you have to like get a magnifying glass to see and then he's and then he's antsy come on man where's that t-rex at i'm gonna go fuck up a t-rex 
they explain how to kill a T-Rex. You got to shoot each of its eyeballs and then go for its brain. Yeah. Here's a piece where you think of like two great cartoonists. How do you solve this stuff? And you're not going to show us the T-Rex, you know, like they both end on the setup of like, there it is. Mm -hmm. Got to turn the page to get your payoff. And uh, that's consistent in both of these versions. And it's almost the same composition in a way, but like with the color, it really feels like the beginning of Pee Wee's Playhouse or something right. like a Ray Harryhausen mm -hmm. kind yeah. of a stop motion. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking dinosaur. Land of the Lost. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that too. And it's another one where I think like, it's a reference to the original, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the designs there are pretty consistent. I'm going to break there to let everybody know that we are working cartoonists here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. The way we uh, keep making these videos is that we sell you books. Ed Piscor's Red Room, Trigger Warnings, and the Antisocial Network are out now, available wherever you buy comics or books. Completely self-contained collections of the first two seasons of Red Room. Pick that up wherever you buy comics. Tom Scioli's Fantastic Four. Grand Design, and Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, available and in print everywhere books are sold. And Hulk Grand Design, my latest comic, available in comic book format now, and the oversized Treasury Edition will be out in January. Pre-order that today, and Street Angel Deadly Scroll Live from Image Comics, back in print after almost a year out of print. So pick that one up and uh, keep the lights on here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. Now, talk about like comparing the Corbin to the Williamson. We've talked about this where it's like you you just have the advantage being alive now. So and, and like we've done it with like our grand designs and stuff where somebody already did a bunch of legwork on this thing and now you can make something really wonderful just like, you know, b building off of that. Yeah, so, that's that's culture. Yeah, that's culture, how it works. Yeah. I also think one one of the big differences you can see is the figure work sure. of Al Williamson, you know, Corbin great on color, so you do his story in color very smart. But you get to really see, like, Al Williamson is such a good figure artist. Yeah. This this format is the way to do it, too. Because, like, I read the the EC one in here. Mm -hmm. And it's just, like, with the, the colors, colors awful. and the shrinking. Yeah, it's bad. I, I couldn't find my uh, EC reprint of that story in time. Yeah, the coloring in this, the 90s version of EC coloring. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Um, man, this is a, a very different treatment, but both times Eccle just panics, and <laughs> I probably would too. Yeah, man, I, I ain't even hating, dude. So he you goes, got this face coming after you? Yeah. <laughs> he goes yeah, running away. Pretty great of everybody shooting uh, T-Rex. Got to aim for his eyeballs and then shoot into his brain. Right. <laughs> They're very detailed in both of these readings as to how you're going to take this thing down. Pretty good both times in terms of like a, a big scary T-Rex face coming at you. The you know... You mentioned earlier, Ed, like you can't really point at one of these and say, hey, one, sure. one's better than the other. But you see that like the stuff that makes sense, the page turn for a T-Rex, the scary T-Rex head, they're both nailing these things. Yeah, these absolutely. are the big moments of the story that you've got to hit. Yeah, be because Corbin can be less brief, the way that he gets the guy off the platform is more satisfying than the way it happens here. It's very random here. The guy just jumps off or something. Yes. Yeah, let's see if we can find that piece. Because he yells at him not that way. And I don't know if we even see him step off, which may be a little bit of a, uh, a misstep on the part of the EC version, because that's important. Like, they were warned over and over not to go off of that trail, and uh, we don't actually see Echoes step off. I think they just see, like, a muddy boot, and that's how they figure it out. Here, we actually see the guy rolling around in the in the vegetation. And here's here's a storytelling piece where, that they handle better in the Williamson flip, flip It. The idea is, and I don't know if they even explore it in this thing, um that a tree is going to come down yeah. and fall upon it. Okay. Okay, yeah, there it is. Never mind. It's it's in both. Yeah, they're very careful that the way they're going to... The reason you can kill this T-Rex is because it was going to die anyway, so you're not going to mess up, you know, future. Uh, now, now, another thing with this EC stuff, when uh, Williamson gets this page... When Williamson gets this page... When Williamson gets this page to draw... It's already got the text on it, right? All right? Let's try this one more time. Hey, you know what? I gotta, yeah, I gotta restart the record. Okay. Good. Yeah. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. When Williamson gets this page to draw, these words are already here. Like, so he doesn't have a lot of wiggle room in terms of pacing. The pacing's already been That's set true. down. You know what's interesting is like, you say that, and and you're right. But also, like, you can see where he does take some liberties, mm -hmm. you know, like, like probably the default is that this would be the width of the 
caption. Panel, yeah. But we need to show a little bit more of that tree, that uprooted tree that fell on him. Well, you have Krigstein where he would just cut the pages up that he got and like repaste them down. And a lot of, uh, man, they're pissed at Eccles. Same thing uh-huh. here. And in this case, they, well, in both cases, they make him go back and cut the bullets out of the T-Rex. Yeah, so I guess, like, the guys who run this service would have to do, that's one of the shitty parts of the job, but now they're so mad at this guy, they can make him do it. And you kind of see him slumbering back there, all uh, dejected and scared and worried about it. In this case, you get a close-up of the face, showing that kind of anguish. (laughs) And from there, it's just a matter of heading back to the uh, regular time. Got the previously established sign for the time safari, and that is your immediate indicator that we're not in Kansas anymore. Is it the same language? It is, which again has to go back to the Bradbury text originally, Yeah. but that misspelling is your first indicator that something is not the way we left it. What's fun is like, if you think about that in the filter of idiocracy, Mm-hmm. Like how you yeah. can, like, you can even see like uh, in this case, our our guy, the receptionist or whoever's programming this, different a different look, different uniform there mm-hmm. as well. So things are different, and uh, Echo starts looking at what exactly did I do? And there's your butterfly, pretty small, pretty subtle there, a little bit more focus on the Corbin. I'm guessing that in the EC, you know, in the original, that's colored in a way that you can't miss that there's a butterfly wing crushed up there on his boot heel. Yeah, yeah, you would hope. And uh, these guys are real unhappy with him, but that's about it. Right. Oh, yeah. Too There's bad. no ramification. No They're, sound of thunder. That's, that's right. No titular uh, sound of thunder. In this case, Travis is not going to let that happen. Echoes has to pay a price for what he's done. And uh, there's your second sound of thunder. Yeah, and it's just real pun- punitive punishment. Just like, dude, you're such a fucking drip. You're so whack. Look what you did. We gotta off you because these guys are hip, you know. Like, like they knew what timeline was like beforehand. Yeah, a little earlier, he's like, "I'm so mad at that guy. I could fucking kill him." And then now it's like, I love that this exists. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it does feel very, very similar. Like it's kind of surprising that you would commission a new version of the story because the Al Williamson story is really strong. Yeah, yes, yeah, one they of them. Reprint it in this volume. They do. Yep, there it is. Oh, that's crazy color. It's yeah. ugly. Not not ideal. But you already have this story. So this is a, this is one that I've pulled out of like quarter bins and stuff mm-hmm. in the past. Um, you know, early 90s. So there's a big print, healthy print run. If anybody out there watching this is interested, this is a book you can certainly track down and, you know, do your own comparisons. But man, two really beautiful artists yeah. Yeah, working yeah. on the same source material. And that solidifies... That's a litifies like a you know a culturally significant little story you know mm-hmm. it, it 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 sells it to a new generation. Kind of interesting because you have fifties, you have uh, like late eighties, early nineties. About time for another version of this story. Yeah. It's true. Like eventually, you know, Bradbury stuff will be public domain, and and you know, go ahead and do it. Fanographics just they've been collecting the EC comics in different formats. Just released an oversized collection of all the Ray Bradbury stories. Yeah, uh, in black and white, really nice reproduction. So lots of ways to get hold of this material. And Bradbury, he's a guy from fandom, man. He was a part of like the earliest sci-fi fandom and fanzines and stuff. Uh, in the Ray Bradbury comics, the intro, he talks about his high school chum Ray Harryhausen, and they would do stuff and, and decided to, you know, have have creative careers together and, and inspired one another. And the Bradbury show, as it came out, uh, got bootleg adaptations from EC. And he happened upon them because he is a comic head. You know, you could find interviews where he's talking about his love of comics and Captain Marvel and junk like that, man. And instead of being a bitch and just trying to be perfectly American and, like, suing their asses off, he just sent them basically an invoice. Yeah, right. You know, I charge 50 bucks for adaptation, you, but you forgot to send me the, my checks. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Um, you know, the last note that I that I have on the comparison part is Williamson and company, they're black and white artists. Yes. And what you see here is like that attention to all these different screen tones that are put on here. You know, it's not just literally black or white line art. It's kind of like creating this whole full spectrum, this full value range in black and white. And I think that's one of the areas that you can compare. And again, there's no winner there, 
But Corbin doing that in color mm -hmm. versus, you know, Williamson, who, who works in black and white, really bringing all his black and white tools to the game, too. So you've got these amazing craftsmen. They just specialize in slightly different areas, and they're both on display in these two versions. Yeah, man. We're going to have to get off cam and, and decide on who would be the uh, 2020 person to pick up the mantle. Yeah, I was wondering if anybody had a suggestion. <laughs> who do you we, think? We, we could all do one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what it made me want to do. Like, seeing Corbin's version of this, I want to do my version of Corbin and Williamson. Yeah. You know, what's funny is, like, I don't have this comic, and I was, uh, I was looking online to, to read it, and y you could find, like, comments associated with, like, the, the bootleg shits, man. And... Uh, it reminds me of the channel in certain ways where the makers kind of see the value and like the, the, the smart marks see the value. But uh, then you had voluminous amount of just like, what a piece of shit. Why would I read two story, the same story in the same comic two times? That's nonsense. Blah, 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 blah. And just like a whole lot of people on that tip. You know what? I'd like to ask all those people how many of the reboot, how many of the Batman movies have you seen? <laughs> Yeah, totally, man. Guys, good to go? Yeah. Okay, favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Street Angel Deadly Scroll Live is back in print after almost a year from Image Comics. Eight complete full color stories of my homeless ninja on a skateboard. Perfect for any comic or superhero fan out there, and perfect with Christmas coming up. Uh, Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness. These two comic books are available now in comic book shops while supplies last, and an oversized treasury-sized edition will be out in January. Pre-order that one now. Get those numbers up so that uh, Marvel knows they should do more grand design. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug. Tom, what do you have, man? Uh, check out Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the Penguin Comics, a perfect gift for the comics lover in your life, and also uh, Fantastic Four Grand Design, the whole story of the Fantastic Four in one volume. Check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show, and uh, do the uh, Jacktober... Uh, drawing prompts for the month of October. Red Room Trigger Warnings, a Red Room Antisocial Network trade paperback are in the stores as we speak. Each book completely self-contained. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Uh, both of these volumes are serialized completely on my Patreon for three bucks. You get the archive, and I'm serializing new stuff that won't see the light of day till 2023. Once again, three bucks for the archive there, and you can order current and future Red Room comics at my uh, link tree in the description below this video. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise and fanny packs and more at our spread shop at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, given those marching orders will be on our wait. Read more comics. Boom. And that's a week. Wow. That's a marathon, man. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, that. Um, but it always is. Mm -hmm. That Sandman was maybe the most epic, like longest one I've been part of. But it, it I don't think it was that long. No, I think it was an. It just felt that I way. think it was an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> just me, like a lot of a lot of ground cover. Like that's a lot of comics, you know. Like the yeah, definitely a lot of stuff happens. Yeah, I think it's about the same length as uh, uh, our our uh, Sunday videos go about between an hour and an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Good amount of stuff, K Fabers. We're gonna go chop these videos up, do some editing, and present those uh, things the way you're used to seeing them. But just wanted to give you guys a little glimpse at the the uh, behind the scenes recording session. The Tom's um, mustache. Yeah, got right. some positive comments on there. Oh, okay, I don't know if you cool. Saw well, that no, I haven't, not, I haven't but... checked out the comments. Yeah, who's Jack Nance? I don't know who that is. I hope it's a compliment. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. I thought maybe you guys would know. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for yeah, joining we'll us. You.